Okay, and we are live for a little bit of pregame. Jen, you there? Hey guys, it's Jen Shahabi. Uh, very exciting. We have the players sitting and focused and ready. Um, the, uh, they're both comfortable, and the games will be starting in probably less than 30 seconds. So for those of you who are, who are just getting here, let me remind you what you are about to watch. Uh, you're about to watch our second match of this year's Speed Chess Championship. Right now in front of you, you can see the info about these players, their ratings, peak ratings. But really, more than that, these guys have matched up against each other and had an even score. So regardless of where they come in on paper, I'm expecting a tough fight today. Um, and Jen, I know that uh, there's a lot on the line here, right? Absolutely. I mean, to me, this is going to be one of the most exciting matches because you do have a clear underdog in Meyer, and I think that always creates almost the most excitement because Sergey is going to try to get a big score, but as we know, Meyer um, can pull off some really unexpected victories. Yeah, and you know, from their styles, uh, from the perspective of their styles, uh, we know that they're both um, similar in their chess games, I guess, and as, as Jord kind of said himself at one point, um, Karyakin just does it a little better than him at a little higher level as far as having a really super solid Super, tra super traditional and technical approach to chess. Um, both players very well prepared. Uh, will that play in Georg's favor as he felt like he was able to put a lot of preparation into the match and, and maybe anticipate well what, what the world champion challenger was going to be able to do? Or will it, um, will it go against him that he's uh, going up against somebody who's very similar to him, just, just that much stronger? Uh, we'll find out. I'm... Um, I'm ready to get this party started. There's $1,000 to the winner, then $1,000 split by win percentage. But even more than any of that, remind everybody, the real prize is moving on to the next round as every round just greatly increases the prizes that these players can win in the Speed Chess Championship. And we are ready to go. The game should be starting momentarily, and it looks like they have. And so, Jen, we're ready. Uh, are you are ready? Our first big surprise of the match. I thought we were going to get the ready game. Um, but Sergey um, popping off immediately with this Sicilian. This is good stuff. Yeah, this is. Uh, so what? I'm. I am a little. I am a little surprised already. I mean, are we expecting Sicilians to continue from Sergey? Um. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Although, of course, uh, Meyer here is playing the um, Bishop B5 check line, Knight D7. That's the most dynamic way to play against Bishop B5 check if you want to win for Black. Um, it really keeps more tension in the position. Uh, and now we're going to see, is, is Sergei going to follow up his development by fan kettling his bishop, or is he going to yeah. play e6 and bishop e7? I, I think he's, he's going to tell us pretty soon. Notice that he's avoided the trade here in the center, everybody. Normally black, of course, capturing in an open Sicilian. Uh, but by, by having this knight on d7, he's not really worried about white making a capture because the knight capturing back is certainly solid and... Uh, and a good center. And he answered your question, Jen. He played e6, maybe get a Shevonin type of Sicilian structure rather than a dragon with the bishop coming to the center, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I always love it when the bishop gets fianchettoed. Um, it adds even more dynamism to me, but this makes right. sense. He's going to get castled faster. Um, what's interesting here is that you don't see a c takes d4 yet. Um, that's usually kind of unusual in a Sicilian, but in this particular situation, Sergei is not afraid of d takes d5 because the knight just hops to c5, and that's going to right. be a good square. Yeah, that's what uh, I was just talking about. And I think probably the reason we didn't see c takes d4, Jen, maybe a move 7, is because perhaps Georg would have taken with the queen. Normally something you always have to be careful about, right? Bringing your queen out early in the game, even for beginners, they know that that can be a no-no. But in this case, a queen on d4 would have been really solid, right? Because she controls a lot of the board, and there's no knight on b8 to come out and attack her. So I think part of the reason we didn't see c takes d4 is is because of, of that right there. And now the position has evolved to the point that we see on the board um, a closed center happening, and it's going to be right up these guys' alley. I think we might see a lot of closed centers today. What do you think? I agree. And now what happens for White in this position is that they've got to worry about this plan of playing F5. You know, F5, that's a weakening move when you move your F pawn, but when the diagonal is closed because of that B pawn on D5, right. it's less dangerous. So I think we're going to see Sergei play for F5, and that's going to be a very dynamic contest. 
Already surprised he breaks a Russian schoolboy rule, putting a knight in front of the B pawn, but uh, he had good reason to do it. He was chasing away Georg's knight there and gaining a tempo. So uh, we'll see if Sergei changes his mind. But no, okay, so he's kind of almost, it feels like a Sveshnikov almost for black, even though it's a closed center in terms of how he's using his minor pieces. With and the, now, with the, go ahead. Yeah, this move bishop g5, do you think he's going to take on e3 and try to get his knight on c4? Well, that's exactly why Meyer played the move queen e2 over protecting the c4 square so that bishop b3, bishop b3, there's still no knight c4, and that knight on b6 is still woeful. Yeah, agreed totally. And uh, I think one of the interesting questions will be, um, will white have a clear plan before black is kind of able to prepare this f5 idea? Jan, you touched on that being a goal for black in this structure, and I agree. So what's white's plan here? How, what can we tell the viewers um, about about what uh, what White would want to do here to maintain an edge. White has a small space advantage, having a more f a further extended pawn in the center. I think of a couple ideas. Maybe you can risk sometimes ideas of things like g3 and f4, and uh, and try to try to advance on the on the king side. Uh, but but maybe that's risky. What it, with the light square bishop not being there, whenever you push the g pawn, there's always risks of something like this. So so what do you see as White's best plan being here? Well, I think he should play B3. <laughs> and then, okay, uh, and, and he did. <laughs> no, I. that's an interesting question. I mean, I wonder if with the move B3, he's thinking about somehow playing for a reef configuration of this knight on C3, and then maybe yeah. C3 and B4. Like, he moved, uh, maybe something like bishop, B2, bishop D2, C3, B4. Um, instead, he played knight B5 right away, and now the queen's coming to B5. And honestly, I... It feels like I gotta like white here. I mean, he's got the b5 yeah. square, and the knight on b6 is—it's just not a good spot. I agree, and in fact, it seems sort of dysfunctional for black. I, I joked about the Russian schoolboy, um, you know, passage that you never put the knight in front of the b pawn, and and Sergey, of course, he's the model Russian schoolboy these days, so he's allowed to break that rule. But the truth is, it is a little awkward, right? I mean, uh, you can't move the rook without the a pawn falling. You wish that you had time to move this knight and maybe play b6 with the pawn. That's probably what he'll do here. When he played queen c7, he's probably going to try to relocate this knight, maybe play b6 to, to make this queen feel a little useless over here on b5, and maybe eventually come back to your plan, Jen, of trying to play on the king side with something like f5 if you're black. Well, and now c3, this idea is very strong. He's going to be trying mm -hmm. to play b4, and mm -hmm. that's going to make the knight on b6 look even worse. And that's why um, Sergei quickly reconfiguring that knight. He needed to get out of the way with knight d7. But I think that white's going to play for b4 anyway, maybe starting with rook on A to B1. And um, if he can get his rook on F to C1 too, the B4 is gonna come with even more punch. Um, but meanwhile, Sergei finally getting some counterplay. You know, that knight's headed to F6 where it's gonna hit E4. Yeah, and if the if the center stayed closed, you would you would certainly would have favored the knight for everybody who sometimes wonders about general rules like that. Um, you know, black would like to have the time to remaneuver that knight, hopping in and out of different colors and and poking at weaknesses. But that's why Jorg's plan of playing for b4 is so strong. He's he's really going to force his way through here on the queen side and open up opportunities for the queen and bishop to attack together. Now, a big question here is what's going on if we get to an end game? And I think what's going to happen is white's going to be better. So a move like b6, you actually even have to consider what happens if white just plays queen to c6. If you were to play queen to c6 and there's a queen trade, um, that looks uh, very dangerous for, for white because we're going to be able to put our rook on d1. Well, that's and, a great point. Let's and let's talk about that. Can can White play Queen to C six now, Jen? What do you think? Is it was it too early? Well, he just did it. So he just I, did. Yeah, he agrees that the Queen trade's going to be good for White because you know with that F pawn, you're you're going for traditional kingside attack, but you have no right. kingside attack when the queens are traded. And for everyone wondering, what would have happened if Black had traded queens here uh, after takes and takes? The the knight wouldn't have an easy time going to attack the pawn as it is it is easily defended white white could anchor in this is a protected pass pawn which is about as good of an endgame advantage you can have short of just being up material such a very very strong asset to have a pawn that's so close to becoming a queen and protected so that's kind of the idea as far as why sergey had to play the move uh, that he did with rook to c8 but look at meyer jenny punishes him he takes on f5 this is because that rook left f8 this is getting this is getting uh interesting here that's right. So he's allowing the move queen takes c6, pawn takes c6, rook c6, because what he figures is that there's always this move b5. And then when the rook retreats, rook d1 is just going to scoop up the d pawn. 
Yeah, Georg is. Uh, Georg seems to be in the driver's seat, right? Yeah, although, I mean, now with Sergey continuing to hold the tension, he's not trading the queens and allowing that pawn to c6. Now, what does Sergey do? I mean, sorry, what, is, what does White do? Because uh, queen takes c6 actually was a threat there. So now Meyer's actually backing up with queen b5, and now rook c1 is in the air as well. And now mm -hmm. he's going to try to put the rook on c6, and that's going to be the real um, bone cruncher. So I think that uh, Sergey wants to avoid that idea of rook on f to c1 followed by rook c6. Yeah, fantastic point. I guess one way he can avoid that is if the rook up to c1 comes, he can put the pony on c5, right, and block the file. But the truth is that may not be ideal for black. And so Sergey is trying to find a way to aggressively get out of this. Is he really going to risk taking the d5 pawn? Well, we're going to find out. He just did. It Whoa, seems dangerous to open this up, but maybe he can get away with it. Well, because I guess queen b3 immediately is met by queen c4, and that's all mm -hmm. good, right? Mm -hmm. So we start Looks with like it. And now after after knight c5, what happens on if we play takes in queen c4, there's always queen f7. Yeah, so, I was just highlighting, I think you're right. I think that's the key point that, uh, that Sergei calculated is the queen can come to f7. So... So he found a way to get that deep on. I got to admit, that was a really aggressive, dynamic way to defend that position, right? That you got to give Sergey credit because he was under the gun. We were talking about ideas of white, you know, bringing the heat on the C file, everybody. If you remember, we were talking about the C6 square, and, and Sergey got aggressive, right, with rook A5 and went after the D5 pawn. Yeah, brutal. I mean, there are so many tactics here that Sergey has to calculate, and that's why they call him the Minister of Defense because he's doing it. I mean, he's he's calculating all these little moves, queen c4, queen f7 only move. And now the rook coming in to take b6. Um, yeah, is, this is... Uh... Rook one, so rook e one check here, we're, we're, we're chilling with king f2, right? No, there's knight d3 check. Yeah, you have to be careful about the... The deflection, right? The 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 pieces are are getting overloaded. Everybody, the key to an overloading tactic is that this rook can't just gobble up the the free rook because the queen hangs. And whenever you recognize that there's a piece doing more than one job, there's an opportunity for a tactic like this. And you don't need to tell Sergey that he plays rook d1 check, overloading the rook and attacking the king. And what Jen just highlighted is that if the king comes up, here comes this fork, and that's exactly what we're seeing on the board, Jen. So I I think that Sergey has turned the tables in this game. Yikes, indeed. And I, why couldn't we have played King E2 instead? Would that have hung on? I don't know, but it's a blitz game and it wasn't played. Instead, uh, George trying to get some counterplay with this move, Queen C6, hitting the Rook on A8. He's only got 16 seconds left. Well, I think the key on King E2 was that the Knight could actually remove the Rook with check and then and then uh, Georg would have lost the Queen on C4 anyway. Right, but, because um, King B1, just Queen C4, you got it. That's right. Um, but here so, it looks like the king is going to go down. Uh, Meyer desperately searching for some counterplay with his A pawn, but this king on G3 does not look like likely to live long. Agreed, totally. And this has uh, really been an impressive defensive effort here, as we said, the minister of of such defense, and that is Sergei Karyakin. And uh, really impressive the way he turned the tables there because I loved Yorick's position to start. It turned, the wheels came off quickly. Uh, one thing we didn't really highlight, Jen, that was kind of, uh, kind of clear in regards to um, what was happening is that Meyer was down on time pretty much the whole time. Um, and uh, so that, you know, that, that was sort of telling, right? Absolutely. That was the problem for Meyer. He had a good position, but Sergei at the defense got it done. Now we see in game two, Sergei Karyakin is playing against Meyer's trademark French, and I love this line. I was hoping we get some Rubenstein's because we often see actually pretty aggressive contests with uh, castling queenside, but Sergey decided to play the more solid lines with castling short. Oh, apologies for the uh, for the quick the quick issues here in the uh, in the stream. I'm having having a, a small thing. Jen, go ahead and keep analyzing. I'm I'm trying to pull pull up the. Uh, oh yeah, the, absolutely. The main line. So, it looks like in this um, in this Rubenstein French, um, George Meyer is now going quickly after that B pawn. Um, this is this is quite unusual. Um, Rook to D1 saying take the pawn. That's going to be really dangerous with um, still needing uh, two pawns, to, two moves to go to get yourself castled. So I, I don't anticipate that Meyer is going to go for that pawn. Um, instead, he uh, seems to be uh, considering playing the move. Well. 
the, the idea of playing e5 is never going to be that dangerous because we can always play knight takes d4 as Sergei because there is a pawn um, pinned there on e5. So I think here with the pawns now equal after knight takes d4, um, we're going to see Meyer just try to castle, but how? Is he going to play bishop c5? In the attempt to get into a bishop of opposite colored middle game. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm wondering if Black can afford to get e5 in some of these positions and and try to defend the pawn. But I guess as long as the king is on e8, e5 doesn't do very much since that pawn would be pinned. Exactly. Um, e5 we can take on d4 anyway. I mean, I actually I actually feel that like maybe it is a good idea to play bishop c5 and uh, go for that because. At least when we play bishop d7 and bishop c6, we'll be getting some counterplay. I don't know. After bishop e7, knight takes d4, it looks like a good initiative for white. Because I'd rather have a bishops of opposite color situation here as right. George Meyer than get into something like bishop b7, knight takes d4, e5, knight f5, and then bishop takes f5, queen f5. Then it looks like uh, white's going to be really be on top. So I'm predicting here Meyer going in for a long think. Obviously, he thinks this is a really critical position because in a blitz game, he's been thinking for for over a minute, I believe. And uh, it's crucial here. Are you going to play bishop c5, bishop b7? How are you going to try to um, gain equality here? This move bishop c1. In a, in a weird way, um, prevents some of uh, Black's counterplay. We're protecting that B-pawn. And so I'm checking out the chat here. It looks like uh, people are very excited about that first victory by Sergei Karyakin. I mean, that was a heck of a blitz game. If Karyakin keeps playing like that, um, we're going to see him uh, doing quite well in the speed chess championships indeed. And, George Meyer has gone for this bishop c5. I like the decision because I think that in those other variations with two minor pieces, um, it was a, it was too strong for Sergey. And now um, we're going to see Meyer, I think, take this take this knight off. Is there another option now? I, well, I think we're going to get the obstacle bishop ending that you sort of have been talking about. Oh, no, there's not. Maybe not. He plays e5 instead and wants to avoid heading into that obstacle bishop ending. Yeah, that's interesting. He had a long think, so we must have some idea here. I was thinking that knight f5 would be a strong move, but maybe that ca that would just be met well met by castles instead of playing bishop f5, queen f5, um, which would have given me a huge edge. But now, is there any way for white to try to stop castling? Like play, I guess if we play queen a4 check, you just have queen c6, right? Yeah, and if the queens are traded, probably black is better in the endgame with the bishop pair anyway. Unless we could play queen c6, b c6, and immediately knight a5. And the question is, are we getting enough quick counterplay on that pawn to give us an advantage? Because if you're stuck playing bishop d7, uh, it could be a bit annoying. You know, I, maybe I can even play something like knight b7 and just kind of uh, get in there. But that's exactly what Meyer's thinking about now. Is he going to play queen c6? Yeah, and he, he goes for it. He, here comes the end game. But you're right, though. I mean, if White can target the weak c6 pawn uh, and uh, develop a plan here, he's got a three on two majority, then White will have some positional advantages to compensate for Black's bishop pair, which, of course, everyone knows the bishops usually work even better together. When you have the pair of them, open positions are even easier to control. But, but here it seems like Sergei is continuing to have the initiative. And if we look at the clock gen, that's kind of telling in regards to who feels more in control, right? I mean, Meyer really down on time here. Absolutely. And instead of the passive bishop d7, um, Meyer trying c5. But now knight c6 looks pretty juicy. You know, hopping right in there and threatening knight takes c7 and bishop c5. I mean, is Meyer busted here? No, he played this move c4 and uh, hanging on there because now um, you are obviously removing the pawn from capture, so that's good. Yeah, but here comes f4, and this is this seems like a real problem for black because the op I mean, normally with queens off the board, you're not thinking about an open center being a problem for a king, but 
Um, in this case, if, if, if black was to capture and this e-file was to become open, I mean, black could get in real trouble now that his king is stuck in the center. Maybe we can play bishop b7 and hang on. The idea being there's no time for taking on e5 because c6 is hanging. Um, instead, right. George trying to keep it slow, just like you said, Danny, he doesn't want the open position to show how weak his king is. So he's playing e4, trying to keep it close. But now it's going to cost him a pawn, right? Saves the king for a pawn and the pawn, kind of the story of a pawn's life, sacrificing himself for his leader. Well, but, right now uh, you can't play rook c4 because at least for the moment we have this bishop right. e6. Right. But even, I'm, I'm already calculating tactics. I mean, is there a way to take on e7 first and then maybe capture with things like rook c7? Or if not, I guess Meyer, I mean, Karakin might just double rooks and that's exactly what he did. He just brings the rooks to the center and... But isn't there, okay, so there's no no tactics quite yet. We need to get that bishop on e3 into the game. Um, g4, I wonder what that move's about. Just takes on g4, rook takes e4 would have been crushing, opening up the position again. So Meyer is forced to play g6, and he played it quickly. He needs to play quickly. Yeah. So um, now, how does Sergei continue? I, I feel like somehow I need to get that bishop in a better place. I could always try hopping back with the knight to e5 at some moment and pressure the c4 pawn. But is, there, is the big edge gone, Danny? I don't see a way for him to expose anymore the king being in the center here. And so as much as this, you know, this looks kind of nice for white, white is gripping the dark squares, which makes these holes that uh, for the future white could try to control. But but it doesn't look like there's anything concrete here, right? Georg seems to have gotten out of the worst of it. He kept the center closed, keeping the king safe. He got his light square bishop develop and held on to this pawn by the hair on his chinny chin chin. Um, and I, uh, so I, I, I agree with you. I'm not seeing anything anything super concrete for for white but it's just a blitz game so sergey doesn't need something super he needs something just a little something something and right here he's just, <laughs> he's just chilling trying to see if uh meyer will make a mistake uh because you know at some point he's always got this option of playing knight to c7 right for instance maybe if uh george moves his rook to c8 then he'll play knight e7 and rook d6 and that um, looks like he's about to go for something like that and uh, the question will be, can black just simplify everything, though, right? If the rook comes to d6, can you get away with a move like rook d8 and just trade off everything? That'll be, uh, you know, at this point, I think if you're in Georg's shoes from a match perspective, obviously having fallen down one game, uh, you've got, uh, you know, you've, you've, uh, you, you're have you've looking to just strike back and maybe even get a draw in this game with black uh, and, and kind of get on the board. Make sure you stop the bleeding, as Uncle Yermo would say. Don't don't lose too many games in a row. You just got to stop from that happening. That's right. And and Sergey is trying to to keep some juice in the position with his king. His king position is what gives him uh, an edge here. Um, that's why Meyer had to play rook d8 because if Sergey had gotten king d4 and king e5 in, it would have been curtains. Totally. So now trying to come around with the king the other way, getting that king into c5, that's going to be pretty juicy as well. Or a5. I mean... Yeah. This may prove to be one of those obstacle bishop endings where a lot of people have that, you know, the, the phrase, op, all obstacle bishop endings are drawn, right? But here we're going to see an active king for white and more pawn weaknesses for black, including keep an eye on this h7 pawn. One of the biggest issues for black's position might be if this king could make a devastating run over here and somehow find a way to get that guy. Um, so this is interesting. And I think if you add add sort of these ideas where, where Karyakin is playing for two results, Jen, with the fact that he's up two minutes on time, I, I, I don't think that Meyer's out of the woods here at all. This is this is really going to be tough. And he's played h4 because when he does get that king to g7, sometimes there's going to be ideas of playing h5. Um, and it, he also needs to make something happen on the queen side if he's going to win this because it's not going to be enough, this idea of playing... Uh, King G7. We're going to need to combine it with something in order to, to win the game. Agreed totally. And uh, we've now um, switched over here to our, our match score view just to remind everybody who may be just joining us now that the match has really only begun. You only missed one game. We have uh, we have uh, an hour and seven, eight minutes left roughly right now in the total clock. Um, uh, in terms of five minute, once the 90 minute portion is over, we will have a quick break and then you get an hour of three minute and then a half an hour bullet. I don't need to remind everybody, you all watch this, you know the drill. So um, 
Okay, but still, if Meyer can hold, right now, Meyer seems to be holding. Jen, I mean, uh, where's where's uh, Sergey's progress? That's a good question. I thought he was going to find a way to get his king um, king through, but I think the problem there is what was what is the problem with that? Well, I think he has to keep an eye on the e pawn, right? And so the question is, can he run? Okay, now he's going to try. Can he run? And here we go. We're going to find out, right? Uh, if if Georg reaches e2, one of the funny things, Jen, is that this bishop maybe just comes into f3 and h5 and just kind of yeah. holds on. You got it. You got it. That was the idea that I missed. Very good. Yeah. Um, but now, now I'm wondering if Georg played it too quickly. A very, very heads up. No, okay, I guess they both decide that enough is enough. Uh, Sergei doesn't think he has any more winning chances with his king uh, retreating there, everybody. I think the main thing was that White could no longer really get to that h7 pawn, so he threw in the towel, and, and we have a draw, right? We have a, we have a, we've stopped the bleeding if you're rooting for the underdog here, right? He's on the board, and, um, and we have another game coming now, a complete change of the, changing of the gear of the guards, Jen. We had e4 in the first game. Now we've got a ready English Catalan, which is right up Meyer's uh, expertise. In fact, he has an awesome video series on chess.com where he teaches the Catalan. And, uh, okay, this isn't officially a Catalan, but um, anyway, this is, this is more what I think you and I would admit that we were kind of expecting. Is that fair from Georg to say that we were expecting this kind of opening? Exactly. I was definitely expecting some kind of a ready or English opening for um, Meyer, but then we also should learn to uh, expect the unexpected in, in Blitz and Bullet, especially with uh, Meyer uh, admitting that he did, uh, of course, prepare for this match. It's very important for him to try to make this uh, groundbreaking upset in the Speed Chess Championships. Great defense from uh, George last round. I really thought he was going to go down two in a row. Shows yep. that he has some psychological fortitude because he lost a tough game and he was in a kind of icky position, but one was able to hold the draw anyway. And he doesn't see he hasn't moved from that position. I'm looking at the players now. One of the fun and and really kind of unique things about our format is we get to see the players' facial expressions up close and personal, right? In ways that we really don't even get to see in, in over the board tournaments, Jen. But here you can see Meyer hasn't Meyer hasn't moved. Uh, an inch, really. Besides the tw oh, there we go. Right as I say that, he uh, he pops up and maybe maybe is a little nervous. Maybe um, needs to take care of something and and figures that Karyakin might be thinking. But he miscalculated because as soon as he moved, Sergey 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 made his move, and now Georg is losing his time advantage. That is the risk of getting up from the board, isn't it, Danny? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, especially in online chess. I mean, I don't you know you don't think of that very often in online chess that people would get up from the board. Um, in that scenario, right? But uh, but apparently, apparently they do, and uh, so he's back now, and uh, we are we are seeing both of both of these guys. Meyer goes right back to his to his regular position. So old school mentality. This is just good for White, right? I mean, you've got a better pawn structure, so Sergey's got to be uh, really. I'm jumping at chances for a counterplay to show that uh, he has something here. He has played rook b8, but b2 is well defended. Um, rook b4 is not a threat at the moment. So, what do you think, Danny? Do you like uh, do you like white, or do you think that the idea of perhaps knight b4 uh, brings enough counterplay for black? Well, um, I, I agree with you. I think I look at these these double pawns and, and I see white having a long term positional edge. And one of the key things to knight d4 being strong in a lot of these in a lot of these structures, as you and I actually analyzed together in the preview show, Jen, is that white usually has to take that knight. But in this case, I'm not sure that white has to capture that knight, at least not right away, and probably doesn't want to, because if white is if white is capturing this knight, black is undoubling the pawns and, and, and improving the structure. So I look at this position as a long-term problem for Black Gen, mainly because unlike other Meroxy bind positions that you and I, again, were looking at in the preview show, this knight is sort of ignorable. White can, white can start plans like this, like he's doing with knight e4. Maybe he even has threats of queen a5 here, Jen, where they start doubling up on this weak pawn on c5. And I think that the key to White's edge is that White can sort of focus in on these weaknesses without having to deal with this strong knight issue in the center. Interesting. Very, very interesting plan indeed, Danny. And it's so key that White decided to keep his king in the center. That's usually something we don't recommend. Um, but uh, his idea is now we don't have to worry about e2. But guess what? Sergey's saying, I'm going to get some counterplay because you're always going to have to watch. Knight takes e2. 
and knight takes f3 now. Your king's in the center. Are you sure those sacrifices are going to be okay for you? At the moment, knight e2, king e2, queen d3 check. I guess it's okay. But in a blitz game, you're going to have to recheck and check that every move. Yeah, I agree. Um, and um, in fact, is there a way, is black going to consider some ideas of maybe trying to bust open things? Is there tactics like knight takes e2 here? He decides against it, but I'm wondering if there were some crazy tactics where he could try to force his way over in the d-file. Yeah, I was thinking that maybe there's just not, he needs like to bring one more piece into the game for that to be effective. Because right now, knight e2, king e2, queen d3 check, and all the action squares are well covered by white's minor. It feels like somehow it almost works, but we need to like get the light one of the bishops into the game in order to make it um, feasible. Yeah, I agree. He, he brings the rook back to b5 to guard the uh, the c5 pawn, and and that's gonna allow that's gonna allow him to to maybe free up. Or I guess it kind of asks the question: Why is the queen sitting here if she's not not serving a purpose? And that's why Meyer moves her. But are we about to see some sort of repetition, or is he gonna trick the rook to coming back and bring the queen over here? I'm anticipating that Meyer continues to play for a win here and doesn't doesn't repeat. I think but, that he will because um, the fact that his opponent is trying to get the repetition suggests that Sergey thinks that white is better. So right. that's a good sign that you shouldn't take a draw against a higher rated player if they offer you one. <laughs> he comes to d2 instead of c3, Jen. Is that a sign that maybe he has aggressive intentions over here on the king side? Does he want to play things like g5 and h5 and, and, uh, and maybe try for an attack? Well, I don't know. I think that White's hoping to capitalize on his strategic advantage more than trying to set up a ta tactical um, advantage because G5 could backfire um, and allow, like, F5. But totally. In fact, I wanted to highlight that for the fans. Exactly. If G5 is played, here comes F5. But my thought was maybe the queen also didn't come to C3 with the purposes of using that C3 square for the knight to go and attack the rook. But, okay, Meyer is... He's not going for that. He plays h5. He's sort of constricting the king's side. He may still look to use this c3 square for a knight retreat at some point, but again, the Minister of Defense is showing why he earned that nickname. I mean, at this point, he's been worse, I think, for at least a dozen moves, but White hasn't really improved any of his chances against the, the weak c-pawns. And now we've got uh, these. What do you think about the idea for White to play h6? Um, I guess just g6 would happen, indeed. Yeah, but I guess we shouldn't we shouldn't totally forget about an idea of something happening on the king side. Obviously, I don't think king f2 has those intentions totally, but I wonder if at some point the rooks being connected might allow something over here on the uh, on the king side to come into play. Now this this move this this position is like so. Uh, tactically, it's strategically rich. This uh, maneuver here, bishop e6 to d5, I really love yeah. it. It's like all the black pieces are in kind of like unusual squares, this configuration. And one of the things White has to be careful of everybody, the reason Karyakin played this with bishop d5, is let's say we make some sort of random move. Now now black might be looking to capture on e4 because taking with the d-pawn isn't an option due to the fact that the rook is eyeing down that queen. There'd be some sort of really nasty discovered attack. And so if black, if white had to take with the f pawn then that would be an open king on f2 and kind of a mess so so bishop to d5 has some interesting intentions now now look at that meyer doesn't doesn't prevent it he doesn't stop it and but but sergey has even more more things in mind he's not going to take he wants to start to open up this side of the board and maybe create some chances against against white's king that's right as soon as white retreated um sergey trying to get some active play uh, still a big strategic edge for White if he if he can consolidate here. Um, trying. But I'm to... I'm getting more and more nervous about the king there. I'm still looking. Yeah, here it comes. I was just going to say I'm still looking at this idea, and now now with the f file being open, I feel like um, the one piece yeah. that's really out of play for Black would be this rook on b5. But it's not far from maybe swinging back over to the king side and launching an attack against this. Uh, the the emperor has no clothes over here, Jen. It is a bit dangerous. I'm going to have to admit it. If we move our king, then you've got a uh, bishop g5, um, queen g5, and knight e2. So it looks like Meyer's going to try to hide his king on e1 because it's actually safer over on e the e and d files than it is on g. If we look at the player's facial expressions, they're similar to how they've been. These two guys are, let's say they're not Hikaru Nakamura, right? Not super animated uh, with their emotions. Um, Sergey also doesn't really look like he's moved. Any any thoughts on the the level of focus we see here from these guys, Jen? 
Oh yeah, totally stone phase. George Meyer um, getting uh, more intensity into the game by putting his fingers on his forehead. But look at what happened here with Sergey. The knight was good on d4, but Sergey said it's even better on f4 because it serves as an outpost. E3 is going to be hard to arrange with that pawn on d3. Um, meanwhile, um, Meyer hustling back with his knight to c4 because it was really doing nothing on b2. So question, if uh, white just plays king, okay, he played rook g3, he's going to try to play rook g1 to get some counterplay and eventually hide his king on e1. The problem is we can't really play rook g1 that easily because that knight h5 um, is in the air. So that's actually pretty irritating because I'd love to get counterplay as white with rook g1, but I don't want to just hang my h pawn. Yeah, I agree. And, and I think that, again, I look at this position as I would I would like black for not for one thing. His weak pawns are still, you know, there's still a long-term strategical issue. We now have a new weakness here where if, if Georg had time to focus in on it, he he will. Um, and this rook is still not ideally placed. So, you know, we, we talked about the emperor having no clothes. And I think, uh, you know, Karyakin sort of started to prepare for an attack with the knight coming in and the queen sliding over. But I like how Georg is defending this, other than his time on the clock. Um, well, the important yeah. The, uh, one important thing also here is that knight e3 um, allows rook take c4. So that's the good thing about the rook on b4. But, um, here, but, but after queen to c3, not, that was a double threat. It guarded e5 and freed the knight from that tactic you pointed out. And, and here comes the pony into f5. I mean, Georg is under time pressure or not, he's kind of turning the tables here. That's right. We got to figure out for black here, how do we maintain counterplay? Because this knight f5 idea certainly does seem very strong. Um, and Sergei has played the move C4, just busting everything open. Um, yep. Knight F5 had to be checked, but instead it just looks like uh, George, only with 19 seconds left, snapped that pawn on C4. Now Queen C5 uh, getting some counterplay. Knight G2 check could be played. It's interesting. I think if, if Georg has the time, he, there's, there's still things to consider. You wish you could take this pawn if you were... Uh, on e5 if you were Georg. Um, you'd love to be able to take it and at the end kind of undermine the defense of this knight here. So so now Karyakin has to worry about some tactics with the moves like knight takes e5 coming and he retreats the queen but that doesn't stop the threat. I wonder if, if Georg can get away with it. He's calculating it. You see he's he zooms in, he zones in there and here he goes everybody. No time on the clock but he uh, you could tell by the way his hand shifted I think that he saw that opportunity and really wanted to take e5. That's right, and uh, Karyakin snapped the pawn on a3, but here's rook a1, um, and a5 is under capture, uh -huh. but queen g5 gets lots of counterplay. That's a big problem. e3 met by queen g2. So um, Meyer decided not to take the pawn for that very reason. He wants to be able to meet queen g5 perhaps with queen g e3. So um, Sergei playing rook takes h5. Uh, just got to keep that king safe. And what's our pawn count now, Danny? It's, it's even Steven. Yep. But king h7 doesn't hang a rook f7. I guess there's always queen g5 at the end. So that would have been, that, that looked good at first, but uh, nothing special. And uh, Sergei with his uh, incredible defense, in fact, using the rook on g5 to protect against these rook f7 ideas. And now getting, getting nasty threats of his own with rook g2. Yeah. I, uh... Now what about rook f2, rook f2, rook b5? Well, here he plays a4, which is another way to open up the king. And the question is, yeah, I was going to say, will g7 be just as much of an issue for black as this open king is? And I think that's what Georg has in mind, is try to keep an eye on this on this checkmate threat over here to, to keep Karyakin distracted with defense. That's right, but, because actually this e3 square for the king is pretty safe. Mm-hmm. Lots of pawns in the center. Look at those center pawns paying off, keeping that king pretty well shielded. Uh, you know, the time is sort of slowly gotten back to even here. Not quite, but you have to give your credit because, the, you know, for those who've been watching the whole game, you know, he's been, he's been living off the increment here for, for the last several minutes. Um, so Georg is, Georg is playing some accurate chess despite being under time pressure. And I love this idea where he just plays e5. He's not afraid of the discovered check with c I love it. Because just d4. Yep, if c4 check comes in, everybody, he's just going to play d4, and the queen's going to slide back. So uh, here comes rook f5, but now the queen comes to e4. I, uh, 
Well, there's g6 at least in the position. And there's also queen a3 check now. And I was just going to say, is that going to be enough for serious counterplay? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Rook f1 is made. No, it's not. It's pinned. <laughs> it's pinned, but now there's oh. a main threat. There's a main threat, but there may be... No, there's no draw. The queen on b2 guards the square on b7, everybody. Oh, no. Rook g1 And Georg has no time. But now there's just oh, a queen and... check. With that, he he's probably going down. The, I doubt there's a perpetual. Does he have e6? No. But he does have queen d5. And then e6. He's got some... Oh, and the queen falls. And whoa. Sergei takes a deep sigh of relief. Georg has got to be frustrated. That one stings, Jen. I mean, you're talking about a game that was Georg's to, was Georg's to hold. But, you know, when you play a king in the center... For that many moves in a row, I mean, you're you're bound to get a little bit in trouble, right? I mean, his king was in the middle of the of the fire zone. When things get that murky, the uh, more experienced and higher rated player often wins in those time scrambles. Um, and you know, it's it was... just a, it's a blitz rule. It's funny because in, in longer games, I mean, we both kind of liked white there, right? And I'm sure that king was going to be safe, but in blitz. The, 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 when your king is under fire, it's just a matter of time before human beings make blunders in blitz, right? And when your king is in the middle of the fire zone, your chances of blundering just goes up. And, and that's kind of what happened there for Georg. And here we have a different line of the French. So instead of going for those um, takes on e4 lines that we saw in the first game, he's played uh, this c5, queen takes d5, trash variation, uh, yep. which is uh, a little bit more imbalanced in general. So this is going to be an exciting one as well. From a match score perspective, that was a big win. We have our first sort of separation, however small it is now, with the uh, two and a half to a half game lead for Sergei Karyakin. So, um, you know, Meyer, Meyer has played well so far, Jen. I think you would agree with that. I, I think he's played pretty well. It's just, um, you know, under time pressure, he hasn't been able to hold in some of those games. Exactly. I mean, I think the last Blitz game was an absolute delight. Um, both players with really creative ideas. I mean, it would have been fun to watch that at, at a 30-minute time control because it was so right. rich. Um, but they played fantastic. And you can understand now why Sergei Kuryakin could actually end up being one of the most dangerous and impressive players in this bracket. Yep. So, as you said, we have a Tarash now and, um, you know, a position that Georg knows well. For anybody who knows his repertoire, he plays the French, and I'm sure he's been in positions like this, if not this exact one before. Uh, small time advantage again. That's the first thing I observed for, uh, for the higher-rated player. Um, but, okay, how do we evaluate positions like this? You know, from a structural level, it's very equal, right? You've got, you've got you know, no real weaknesses, but a four-on-three for one player on the king side and then a three-on-two for white on the queen side. So if you look at the pawns, you know, but really the open center nature here and whatever tactics happen right now, we see a bishop under fire. That's kind of going to decide who has a better middle game because there really aren't any, any, any permanent or positional weaknesses in either player's camp. That's right, and it looks like uh, Meyer played bishop takes d4 because the problem was that knight was going to get really um, dangerous yeah. on the square f5, uh, and yeah. he managed to play bishop c6. That's a dangerous diagonal. Well, that so, was key that you highlighted that because I think that that's I think that's a critical point was that if this bishop had gone somewhere else, everybody there was threats of knight f5, and that's because this pawn is pinned to the king. You're not legally allowed to put yourself in check, right? And that means that that means Georg had to part with the bishop pair, but now we're in the position we are where where Sergei's dark square dominance could tell the tale for the rest of the game here. I really like White's bishop pair here. Yeah, we've got a, a bishop, uh, two bishops versus a bishop and a knight. I, I actually thought that, that Sergei might try bishop d6, um, but uh, this also looks compelling, of course. Uh, queenside castles by uh, by Meyer. There's no e5 yet in the game, but it's still Karyakin's decided to relocate that bishop because we didn't want to um, mm -hmm. fall to any e5 ideas later. Right. Always good to play Karpovian chess, everybody. Don't leave your pieces in potential areas where tactics could happen. Keep them safe. Classic. Classic Sergei Karyakin there. F3 Enter. with the idea of king F2, getting uh, the king into the game. Notice that Sergei is not trying to play bishop F6. Sure, mm -hmm. it would weaken... George Meyer's king, but uh, Sergei assesses his chances are a lot better with two bishops, never exactly. mind uh, that structural advantage you could create if, after bishop f6. And I think that's very important because the stronger the player, the more likely they are to hold the tension even in a blitz contest. 
Agreed totally. And again, the way we've seen Karyakin play for the first three games just reminds me of, of why he's such a great player. You know, he just doesn't make he, – he gives his opponents opportunities to make mistakes, doesn't make a lot of mistakes himself, not going to change the position if he doesn't have to, as you said. He's not going to go take on F6. He's just going to kind of sit here and, and, and have a, a time advantage. He's now up again about a minute and a half on time. And, um, you know, it's one of the things we saw him do super well in the World Championship match against Magnus Carlsen, just play – solid chess and let the game come to him so to speak and and uh i i i just i already feel even though i have no right to say it yet based on the position but i just feel really confident he's going to win this game too because he's got a small edge and i don't think he's going to make mistakes and if this if this pattern continues where Georg is going to get under time pressure uh, i would agree with you but i gotta i gotta remember that game too where karyakin had a big edge in the in the end game and meyer was able to hold that's so. true, and it was it was also a French. So certainly the history of, of what they've played so far. But I guess I look at this one one is even easier for White to play. Um, okay, B five is played. It makes sense. Maybe he wants to prevent the move C four. Everybody kind of kicking this knight out of a strong post. So so B five is a good move by Georg. So the question is, will Sergey play B three and and C four and maybe try to open up the light squares, or just or A four, maybe or even A four. Um, B three, the slower option. Um, that's a strong idea indeed. He needs to create a weakness, and he's playing rookie. But he may still go for your plan. I mean, if a4 comes in, we may get some lines where if the, you know, if the queen side opened up here, moves like the other rook coming to b1 quickly, we see the two bishops and the open b file against the black king could really be devastating for Georg. So, so I think your idea of a4 may still come in here. Yeah, perhaps we're going to see something like rook to a1. So the question is, f6, does it really threaten e5? It might, right? If you can get this bishop to move, this c3 pawn falls. So now, everybody, the point of f6 was that if, if white makes some sort of random move, e5 would have come in and then and then removed the defender of the c3 pawn. So uh, Sergei says, not happening. I'm going to stop e5 right now. And now knight c7, because bishop f3 was a strong idea. Um, if with a knight still on d5, that would have uh, been a, been a decent move. So instead, and now this move king e1. Okay, so Sergey's saying let's trade off the rocks. Because... Yeah, he assesses his chances better with the major pieces off the board. That might be because he sees that he'll have easier access to the pawns on the king's side. Right? There's this idea of bishop f8 coming in. So if all if all the rooks came off, black would have to worry about ideas of this bishop coming around and targeting these weaknesses here. Bishop f8 is going to become an issue anyway. That's why rook d5 was played, um, because now at least bishop f8, we can take it. But uh, that that is a big idea if we can ever get that in. And, and Ooh, C4, what I a like move. that move. What a, move. what a great move by Sergey. Rook c5. Points out, everybody. Yeah, rook, rook takes c5 is not a threat because the rook would hang, and, and now he's going to get exactly what Jen and I said he wanted. He's going to force these rooks off the board and renew the threat of the bishop coming to f8. Yikes, that's a really good idea. So somehow I think Meyer's gonna have to deal with that by fixing his pawns so that we can play um, G6. I mean, what else can we do? So maybe we're gonna have to take on D2 and then after um, King takes D2, play something like H5 so that at least we can meet uh, Bishop F8 with uh, G6 or G5. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But instead of- makes sense. Uh, he thinks that the, uh, the, the pure bishop end game is, is too bad, so he plays... Well, what, one of the key things that makes rook e8 work to everybody is that I was just going to say rook d7, you would love to put a rook on the 7th rank and start targeting pawns, but the move king to c6 would have been a fork of the, of the rook and bishop. And so I think that that was probably the reason that Sergei went for rook to d6 instead. Uh, oh, and look at that. Now, he, now he's switching gears. He's going over to the queen side. And now there's, is bishop g4 doing anything? Doesn't look like it. f5 seems fine. So he just calmly gets his king out of the way. Yeah, I agree. And uh, as we take a look at the players here and Sergey doing a small shuffle, he's hardly breathing. I mean, I'm not even, he's such a, he's such a machine there. <laughs> Sergey, Sergey's very focused. Jorg is... Jorg is leaning in, and again, he having to make tough decisions under time pressure, Jen. I mean, this is one of the th ways you see the stronger players be better, is that the games are equal, equal for a while, but the time isn't. And then when we get to the end game, the time is what makes the lower-rated player blunder. 
Yikes. So knight e8, I'm wondering about the move c5 in some position because uh, that pawn on a6 can be taken as an in-between move. So... Yeah, agreed. Or rook b8 check played by, by Sergei. And he, he finally gets this plan of bishop of fate. The knight is defending for the moment, but the problem is it's some kind of bishop h5 can come in as well. Um, just rook back to b4 for now. We had no way to stay on that file. I'm still waiting for the move c5 to come in. Okay, now he plays it. And I like this move because in this case it actually opens up the rook along the fourth rank. Uh, but it also maybe opens up this bishop on e2 to be hitting the pawn on a6 momentarily. That could be critical. Okay, so the bishop comes to a6. Uh, well, rook c6. Looks black like... is defending, but black doesn't have a lot of options. Jen, what if white just starts a plan like king e3 and, and king up to d4 and just, you know, and here he goes. He's, he's on the path to just improving his position. Yeah, it's uh, obviously a very uh, a very da dangerous place for your rook on c6. Rook b6, and now we're going to be cornering this pawn on a6, so king b7 forced. Now, decision yeah. for Sergei to take that pawn. That was a little surprising to me that, that Sergei transitioned the way he did, but I guess likely this h-pawn will be enough. Look at that bishop dominate the knight. That is an example of why bishops can be better than knights in the endgame with such a beautiful square on e5. How's he um, going to stop the ace pawn? That's the, that's the danger. Yeah, I mean, stop. the knight now has to leave and watch, here we go, right? The ace pawn is on the pursuit of happiness and he's going to find it on h8. Um, okay, king to d4. I assume white doesn't want to go to the obstacle bishop ending just yet, so I'm, I'm anticipating a move like king to d4 to come in. Oh, whoa, he retreats the king. Why, why that, I wonder? Yeah, that's... Uh... That's a, that's a good question. I I think that at some point, Black's going to have to play this move at F4 to stop the pawn from just running all the way down the board, right? Yeah. And he has to he has to give that light square bishop, yeah, a chance to help defend. And, uh... Uh, and that's why, so Sergei's blockading the pawn on F4. So now after knight F4, king F4, um, the pawn is, is just racing down the board and there's no stopping it. What a, what a conception. So king C6... H5, how are we stopping that pawn? After H, we can just play H6 here, right? H6 is one, and, and he also just calculated that I think he can just take. I was going to say, I think he can just take, and I don't see a clear path for this. I mean, the knight, the knight needed to get to F6 before the pawn was on H7, and, and Georg knows it, and so he throws in the towel, and uh, Sergei shuffles in his seat one more. He's feeling super confident right now. He's got to be with a three-game lead. Um... I feel like I only I only see Karyakin take a breath once the game is over. <laughs> That's how focused he is. Don't try that, guys. <laughs> Don't try that. We recommend, Jen and I both recommend that you breathe during your chess games. Pro Unless tip. That's for David Blaine, right? Right. <laughs> Pro tip, always breathe during your chess games. All right, Jen, well, where are we at now? In terms of the score, uh, you know, we have a three-game lead for for the uh, the the top seed here, and he's... He's on a roll. I mean, there's no other way to describe it, right? So at this point, it's it's not looking like the challenger who I, I was on record as saying would have as good a chance to upset the, the top seed as anybody. I'm looking like a fool right now. Karyakin is in control of this match. And it just looks like um, Sergei is playing fantastic, too. I mean, I can't even say... I mean, can you believe that he has this big of a lead in a blitz match and, and Meyer has not, not played one blunder, really? I, mean, I know. Just, like like obvious blunder in the middle game, you know, maybe in the the game three with like the craziness at the end, there were some blunders. But I mean, there hasn't been any real huge mistakes, and Sergey is still just winning every game. It's crazy. No, I mean, fascinating and great point by you because you're right. I think the style of these two players is going to see a very accurate level of chess, a, a type of chess that that doesn't see a lot of wild swings. They're both very solid, not not making blunders, but. But what ends up happening, as we said, right, the games seem to be equal, and then slowly Meyer is under time pressure and then has to make some decisions a little a little too quickly and then ends up kind of getting outplayed in these endgames. This is just fantastic. I mean, such a joy to watch Karyakin play, um, play Blitz. And it's going to be fun uh, to see the bullet. I see uh, uh, Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura, the only uh, leader, so the only winner so far in the Speed Chess Championships because he played the first round. Yep. And, uh, you you commented on last week with Anna, and uh, he's saying that he's going to have to get something in the bullet to come back in the match. 
Yeah, I mean, at this point, uh, the goal would be to keep it within three or four games when it gets to the bullet, because mathematically at that point it becomes hard to to swing. I mean, we, we see the bullet portion sometimes won or even dominated by guys like Hikaru, but it's, it's very difficult to turn around a four or five game deficit even when you get a bunch of bullet games. But um, the... Now, this uh, game looks super solid for, yep. for Black. Um, we've seen Sergey get some positions that weren't as enviable in this match and come away from them because of the dynamism in the position, even when he was a little bit worse, like games yep. one and three. But this game, I actually kind of like black. What do you think? It's, it's, I guess it's pretty well, equal, but it seems like uh, our pieces are a little bit more harmonious right now. Yeah, well, Black's Knight obviously seems to be the most actively placed minor on the board. I think the question will be, can White get pressure against the light square pawns in a way that... Uh, that compensates for that active active knight. Maybe now White tries to grab the C file, uh, brings a rook to C1, and and maybe maybe just hope to the bishop pair to do some damage later on. I mean, if the position changes, you like this bishop's chances of targeting some weaknesses like on D5, the light square bishop. But but okay, so the only thing we've seen as far as body language from these players is Meyer after losing his uh, his third game, he decides to. To invite the music, a quick update on the rules, since we've had so many dedicated fans to the Speech Chess Championship. They noticed that in the rules, it did say that we were not permitting that. However, due to very, very popular requests from Magnus to Hikaru on down, pretty much everybody has requested the right to listen to music. And so the rules have now changed that as long as the players before the match starts do not have an issue with their opponent, if neither player has an issue, then we don't have an issue with it. And... Um, so the, uh, the, the players agreed before the match started in our pregame interviews that neither really had an issue with the other listening to music. So just to clarify, no issues with Jorg and his headphones on. Um, all right, Jen, back to the chess. What do we see here? So he brings the rook to c1. Karyakin played the king to h8 with the purpose of getting f5, I assume, but maybe he, maybe he doesn't even want to do that now. He's just going to try to go simplify on the c file. Yeah, that that was a, that was a kind of curious move. Um, trying to play f five so that he has the option to take with either pawn. Uh, interesting indeed. Uh, and I guess we got to like white a little bit here now with the two bishops. But uh, this move h four um, makes f five look a little bit nicer because with the pawn on h three, we would always have that option of playing g four in some certain positions. Yeah, well, and especially after h4, there may be even immediate tactic. Can black just play f4 here? And after a move like bishop takes f4, gobble up the h-pawn, exposing the uh, the overworked g-pawn. So I'm wondering if he can play f4. Karyakin says, no, that's not my idea. I don't want f4. Okay, he plays bishop f6 to, to return the favor, put some pressure on white's isolated pawn. Similar ideas here, though, Danny, because after now, after bishop f6, perhaps the idea is to play something like rook c1, and then after rook c1, right. now f4, bishop f4 would let the, the big guy go with bishop takes d4. Yeah, I, I still, I'm still i still just looking at this tactic with f4, and one of the things that I think will be curious, obviously we, we notice things like this throughout the match, and we sort of build up questions for the players, is I wonder how many of the moves Georg has played, Jen, that he probably thought of playing instantly, but then maybe took 7, 8, even 15 seconds. One of the things I'm noticing about Georg's time is, he's okay, there were a couple of games earlier where he spent a minute or so, but overall... He's not spending deep things, but he's averaging, you know, between 7 and 8 to 15 seconds a move. And, and if, if you're playing moves in 15 seconds that maybe you thought of in one or two, that adds up over time. And before you know it, you don't have any time left. That, that comes into confidence. You know, when you've lost right. the games, when Sergei is playing this good, it, it's tough. You know, it's easy to say, just play the first move you see. But, um, right. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons we've seen this arc in this match with... Um, Meyer not making too many blunders because he's playing fantastic. But then, unfortunately, when the game gets really murky, Sergey has more time and outplays him. Yeah, agree totally. And I think that that you know difference between taking ten seconds versus two seconds, fifteen seconds instead of four or five seconds, that is confidence. It's like when you watch somebody in golf or something go to the go to the putting green after doing all the work to read it, and then they sit there for twenty seconds and hesitate or something. I mean it just it adds up when you're not confident and um that I wonder if I wonder if Jorg will will say that that was part of what he was doing was just you know wasn't uh, wasn't always sure of his plan. So it's okay so I was really liking some of those ideas that you had with F4, but Sergey instead putting his rook on E8 um, with uh, some tactical ideas in the air of like perhaps knight takes g3 at a certain moment. But of course, that's that's held pretty well right now because the queen is on b3, uh, protecting e3 as well. 
And it's interesting because we, 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 we talked about not playing bishop takes f6 in the last game where he was white and now not playing f4. I think, I think Sergei just has this, like, he's playing quickly, he's playing super solid, he's not going to go out of his way to change the nature of the position unless he has to because that's playing in his favor. I mean, he's, he's, his time advantage is increasing and nothing has really changed over the last six, seven moves other than about a minute and a half on the clock. But bishop f4, doesn't this just allow rook c1 and uh, bishop d4 or is there counterplay after rook c7? Well, if rook c1, I guess white can still take with the bishop on c1, right? Um, true, true. We if, could if, just if take he... with the bishop because uh, although the rook c1 coming to c7 is another thing that he can calculate. That's true. Yeah, you make a great point. I guess white would white would maybe have the have the choice of something like this, which does look kind of dangerous. So, so uh, Karyakin thinking about it, and and uh, as much as I've been critical of the time management, I guess this game is a little closer than some of the others we've seen. Only about a ten second difference right now between the players. So what's Sergey Cal? Okay, he just goes right back to e8, and we've seen this sort of rook shuffle for for several moves, right? That's right. Well, he wants to stop perhaps the idea of bishop e5, even though normally we like to keep the bishops on the board. That could be um, an exception. Probably not, actually, because there's also ideas of like rook c1 and knight d2 that could be pretty annoying if the bishop right. leaves the f4 square. Mm -hmm. So instead, yeah. uh, Meyer just plays a5. That's important because the pawn was loose in some variations. And it also reminds me, though, of the game you and I again covered in the preview show yesterday where uh, Sergei showed a very impressive remaneuvering of his pieces and ganged up on a pawn on a5, and maybe that's why bishop d8 popped in my head so quickly. But I, I immediately notice on a5 that that might be a target for the black player uh, later on in this game. Now black has two pawns on dark squares. But, but for the first time, Jen, as we head to the minute marker, we have a time advantage for the challenger. Yeah, that is really surprising. Um, Sergey, I, I think in a way it makes sense because Black's the one who's kind of trying to do something here, <laughs> in a way. There's all these ideas. And he's played Rook C6. Um, not a move you would think of. Uh, uh, it's a very non-obvious move because you would think that that uh, helps White, right? Yeah, I mean, the first thought is, isn't that just weakening the a6 pawn? But what's his idea here? Does he have something on the king side that he sees? Because I like, I like taking pawns, and Yasser does too. So we all should just take pawns when we have a chance. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. He's trying to go for something on the king side, but what is it? Is there a g5? Is there a bishop takes h4 in some situations? Maybe in this position, if queen takes a6 gem, we have a funny tactic like bishop takes d4, rook takes d4, and c5, getting a discovery on the queen on a6 and winning Ooh, the rook. That's a nice that's, one. Good stuff. That, that could be a trick that Sergei has in mind. Maybe Georg is seeing this. Again, I just see that one of the things that makes Sergei such a great blitz player, and for those who don't know, Mr. Karyakin is the reigning World Blitz champion. He didn't beat Magnus Carlsen in Classical, but he won the World Blitz championship. And I think one thing that makes a great blitz player in general, Jen, is they... You know, they, 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 again, I use this phrase, he doesn't make any blunders and he just kind of lets the game come to him. I mean, he's just like playing very simple moves here. I don't see, you know, he didn't make any efforts to change the position drastically. And uh, again, we're going to get a scenario where, where uh, Georg is down on time and, and Sergei has more time on the clock um, when, it, when it really matters. And C5, that was a dangerous idea. And so uh, George, after a deep think, perhaps also considering the queen trade with queen C7, um, play queen B8. But uh, that time advantage now is totally gone. And Sergey has to figure out what to do here. Hmm. Is, there any, is there any threat I with this move queen B8? I wonder if he's thinking about G5 now. We've been talking about not changing the position. Maybe now he's calculating something if he can afford it. Of course, it's super dangerous to open up your king when there's a queen popping there. But, okay, no, again, he's not playing Danny Chess. He's playing Sergei Chess. He's not going to be aggressive. He's just going to sit on the position and make make Georg do something. But if I was Georg, I probably would have taken the draw. He's played, he's played queen C7. Um, note that also queen C7 guards the E5 square as well. So bishop E5 mm -hmm. is a possibility too. Does he does he see his chances of being better in the end game? If you're if you're Mr. Meyer here, maybe he sees the queens coming off the board, making it easier for this bishop to slide around and put pressure on the a6 pawn. Uh, if the light square bishop could manage that, that would that would change the nature of the end game. Here comes bishop e2. I think why not why not go put pressure on the a6 pawn? Okay, maybe, no, not yet. Maybe he was thinking of something like c5 for black, um, getting mm. those uh, brutal center pawns in and takes on c5. Knight c5 would have protected. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, 
We're going to get a trade here. We've got B pawn for C pawn, uh, but oop, tactics. Knight comes and takes F2, which is renewing the threat of bishop takes D4, everybody. If bishop takes F2, bishop takes D4, and the F2 bishop is pinned. That was some nasty business by Karyakin. Yeah, and we didn't, and, but now this move, bishop to C1, and uh, rook A2 uh, can be mapped by bishop takes D5. Whoa, and that means that rook E2 would be met by king F3. Is this going to backfire? So Karyakin... Kayakin took this shot, but but Meyer, cool and calm under pressure with only a few seconds, finds bishop to c1. Look at that move again. I really like that. Bishop c1, and then bishop takes d5. I think that he is in the driver's seat here. Look at that. He's got a mating net coming. And he's down a pawn, but he had the Whoa. mating event, which forced this move g5. I, I thought I thought Meyer might en passant and, and go with the protective pass g-pawn, but this is probably even better. Um to keep the king in a mating net, but okay, who's going to get mated here? Look at black flipping the script. Uh, here comes knight g3 check and bishop f2 check, but there's no follow-up, is there? There's no follow-up for, for Karyakin. Who's better here, Jen, and why? Tell me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on in this endgame anymore. Well, that a-pawn nail is running um, pretty fast, although there's rook h6 as well. But you got to look, this g4 now, we're threatening to move rook a1, yep, after which yep. we'll be able to play rook c1 and fork. So that's why Meyer had to play rook g6. Ooh, but I, I actually like that transition there for Meyer. I wonder if that was a mistake by Sergei to allow him to keep this h-pawn, because now I think h6 makes his pawn better than the a-pawn. Uh, but, oh. okay, note that this bishop guards a7. Oh, Meyer misses it! He just blunders the rook, and no, and you saw Sergei shake his head sort of... Uh, sort of, uh, you know, feeling bad for his opponent there, and Georg is clearly frustrated. I I saw this bishop guarding a7, Jen, and it was almost like I saw the writing on the wall. I was like, note that the bishop guards a7. No, Meyer didn't see it, and he played rook a7 check. Man, I really jinxed them by saying that there were no really obvious horrible blunders, Danny. Oh my gosh, you did. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, Okay, well, disappointing for Jorg. I think that we also jinxed him by saying he was down a few games but hadn't blundered yet. That's probably really the first significant blunder he's made in the match. And, you know, it's disappointing when you see a four-game lead for one player and you don't feel like the games have been that lopsided. That's right, but, you know, the issue was the time in those early games. Um, Meyer was getting into time pressure, so even though he was getting great positions, it was uh, really tough for him to hold the balance against such a super, super player um, with uh, just a few moves. Agreed. One of the things that I think will pay off for Jorg in this match is um, because he does play a lot of online chess. Normally here we'd be talking about, you know, kind of the, you know, the, 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 the slippery slope of when you're down this many games, it just gets worse. But I feel like if Jorg keeps himself together, he will get some victories here in, in a few moments and, um, and keep this one close. You know, Jen, the thing we talked about with the style of these players, would it pay? does it pay off sometimes? Is it better to play somebody who's better than you but plays a totally different style chess than you so that you might have a chance of winning that dynamic sort of preparation battle and get the kind of positions you like? Or is it better to play someone who's very similar to you but just, but just better at it? And in this case, I feel like they're so similar. These games have been so solid, but Karyakin is just slightly faster and makes, uh, makes better moves than Georg and... and and so, you know, it's um, right now it's just not helping Georg that he's going up against somebody who plays very similar to him, but is just a little bit better at it. I totally agree with that, Danny. And uh, I think that Meyer is going to learn so much from this match. Um, right. That is the benefit of playing somebody who plays similarly to you. He can really learn from this, how to be an even better version of myself, because uh, Karyakin's really putting on a clinic, how to play a great blitz chess. And question, in this game is white, it, there's been a lot of trades. Um, how much does Sergei have here? He's got a little bit of a better structure, and he's got a, a much nicer knight on e5. Mm -hmm. But uh, is it anything? Well, um, I don't know. Good question. Now, I, now of course, we're, we're looking at the tactics on the e5. There's really nothing there for white, but queen f4 opens up potential shots of a knight g6 check, so keep that in mind if you're, uh, right. if you're playing yeah. the black pieces. Always be aware of and uh, Georg is aware of it and says, I want no part of that, and brings the king back to g8. And uh, we get a little bit of a back and forth here. Faster moves being made by Georg, and he's making an effort to speed up, which um, maybe, it's, maybe it's a conscious effort. He just knows that that's been the problem so far. has been time pressure. 
So H4, um, what do you think the point of this move is? Do you think he's ever going to try this move G4? Or is that just way too dangerous? I think that seems way too dangerous. It's kind of a safe sort of uh, checking checking the position, seeing what his opponent's goals are here. Um, it's difficult for Black to make moves that kind of untangle the queen side here, Jen, because if the you know there's the C5 pawn that's under fire, even the A5 pawn is isolated and weak. Maybe this queen on E3 slides over to C3. So I think for I think for Karyakin, he's again doing what he does best, which is you know put the question to, to his opponent: What are you going to do here? I play H4 and I did it quickly. And guess who just took 30 seconds on the clock? Yorick. I think that. Karyakin is, is one of the best players in the world at playing moves that just sort of check in with his opponent and say, what exactly are your goals here? And now he's going for a lot of trades here. That's why he that's why he took that long think, Daddy. He came up with this idea of bishop e4, trade the bishop, bishop e4, there's queen takes e5. And now we see some of the reason for having this king on f8. Um, he wants to make sure that in that line, there's no bishop h7 check, which would mm -hmm. uh, win a queen. But I'd say one of the ideas here is whether uh, whether Karyakin could play knight to d7 check. I highlighted it before he did it, and he went for it. He'll now take on e4. I think with the, I guess he could take with the queen and threaten queen h7, but it's not going to do anything. So yeah, he just takes with the bishop. And, and so what's going on here? I think we have a slight edge for white because the bishop is going to be a little better than the knight in terms of the minor piece dynamic in this endgame with pawns on both sides of the board, everybody. And also I like white because uh, black has a couple of pawn weaknesses that, that white doesn't really have in this c5 and a5 pawn. So not a huge advantage, Jen, but I think we agree that Karyakin seems to be a little better here. Yeah, and you just played this move b3. I was thinking he might play rook d2. Um, king e7, assessing that the king's safer over on that side of the board. We're going to just see Karyakin make some little moves like g3, king g2, rook d3. Not changing much. Um, but just kind of testing George. Um, Queen d2 can get into the position at some point, um, hitting that weak pawn on a5, which is another part of our, our uh, small but lingering advantage here is why. Agreed. And uh, we have uh, about 20 minutes left here in the five-minute portion. I think for Georg, he feels like this portion can't end fast enough. Maybe with faster time controls, he can prevent Karyakin from grinding him out the way he has. But uh, We'll keep an eye on the game clock here. Of course, everyone can see it's a four-game lead currently for the uh, for the seeded player. The two-seed overall in the match. A lot of people don't know that. I think you assume when you look at the bracket, Jen, everyone always thinks it's Carlson and Nakamura, right? But actually, Karyakin is the two-seed because of blitz ratings. After winning the World Blitz Championship, he he leapfrogged at Kar Nakamura in terms of being uh, the second-highest-rated blitz player in the world, right behind Magnus Carlson. And that's we a, are certainly a, understanding why, right? Yeah, with uh, just a fun fact for the fans that Karyakin is actually the two seed. Um, now, what do you think about White's plans here? Because we've got that weakness on a5, and we've got the bishop on f3, but there are no weaknesses except for a5 and c5 in Black's camp. And of course, with those being on dark squares, we can't attack them with the bishop. So hey, it's a great point. Yeah, the bishop is 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 open, but here we we like to call this bishop kind of an empty bishop, right, everybody? Because it's an open bishop, but where's the targets? Where's its purpose in life? And it can't find purpose tack attacking the pawns on the queen side. So it's a great point, Jen. I think that's kind of key as to why Meyer, you know, has pretty decent chances here if he can if he can um, continue to make sure that these dark square pawns don't become an issue. Now, the idea that I mentioned earlier really seems like the only opportunity here for me, like to play g4 and g5, but it is, of course, double-edged. Um, less double-edged than it was before when there were more pieces on the board, like the bishop on c6. So I, I think yeah. we might try that because I don't yeah, see so any other ideas. I, I think it's a great point. Like if the black king comes back to e7, white might start to uh, to go with, with moves like g4 and... Uh, and uh, and threats of g5 can open up the king side. So, principle of two weaknesses. White will probably need targets on both sides of the board if he has a chance to win this endgame. Meyer plays knight to d7. He's not really interested in, in letting letting Karyakin do that plan. He'll probably just bring the knight right back to f6 um, pretty quickly. Although, that would have allowed, perhaps, yeah, I guess that would have been okay. So, uh, he's playing king e7 instead, and now g4 is on the board. Um, Sergey taking his shot. He does have an extra minute, um, and this is his winning winning chance. Yeah, here he goes for it. As you said, uh, it was a, uh, a good thing for everyone to remember that opening up your king when there's still a lot of pieces on the board usually ill advised. But as Jen said, pieces have been traded, so now this h4 that was played earlier in g4 seems to make sense for White to be aggressive over here and. Um, 
again, it, it's it's good here now, Jan, because even if he doesn't have super aggressive intentions, it's just a move that makes a little bit of progress. Again, puts pressure on his opponent. That's what Karyakin does, and the pressure means Meyer's, Meyer's gone into the think tank a little bit. Now, this move f6, I was thinking about it. Now White has a couple choices. You know, he can stick his bishop on d5 in some lines, and that can yeah. be annoying because it might force a knight back to f8. Um, he can play g5 anyway here. Yeah, bishop d5 would... Uh would take advantage of the pin pawn, but he did, as you said. He went for g5, and so we're getting some trades. Now, immediately this king isn't under fire, but I really like the center position of this knight on e4, right? It's held by the pawn on f6, and if this queen can find some way to get over involved in the king's side, maybe, maybe black does have some chances to expose that open king. This move, bishop e4, just trying to hold the tension. Queen d6, looking for some counterplay. With uh, the move back to g4 being possible now. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, uh, okay, f5, I was just wondering, is he worried about diagonal checks? Not really. The knight does such a good job defending the king, everybody. If, if the queen had come to g7 check, black would have just played knight f7. Queen g5 check, I think black will, will run to the queen side. King to d7, is that what he's going to do? Why not? It's so frustrating here for white. It seems like we should have an edge, but that bishop on, on e4 is not working, and that is really the problem. Whereas the coordination of the queen on d6 and the knight e5 is really solidified now. He goes to f7. I assume he'll intend to eliminate this bishop on f3. If white plays bishop f3, I'm pretty sure that he's going to have to take it, and it looks like that's what's happening. Um, Karyakin is going to recapture the, the knight in a, in a swindle way. He's going to do it with the queen to avoid this king coming under too many checks. Uh, but okay, Bjorg has played well here, I think. I, I don't see him losing or having real losing chances here, although he really shouldn't have lost the last one before the one-move blunder of the rook. So uh, we'll see if, he can, see if he can do it differently here. That's right, because now he's got these two pawns on e6 and f5, and those pawns uh, could get a... Could get very dangerous, you know. If we start going after the a pawn, um, first of all, Black is going to always have these checking ideas on Queen G four, and yep. uh, secondly, you might even have to worry about them starting to play for a win by uh, playing e five and e four. So it is looks a, like um, Meyer's done a good the, job. Does that just give up the pawn on a three? Can Meyer just check and take a three? What's I guess I guess he's just going to Karyakin might just bail out for a draw, right? If if Black goes for this king. The queen will maybe find ways to go after the black king and get a perpetual. But if I'm Meyer, I'm considering just running after that ape pawn here. Again, maybe that's the Yasser Sarah one in me that just always wants to grab the pawn. But, you know, you work with Yaz a lot, so you, you must be used to that. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I, lo I love mentality. But I, it does seem like it was going to be hard. Your queen on a3 would be in the middle of nowhere. So right. I don't see how you're going to stop the checks. And Meyer's in a tough position, everybody, right? Because he knows he's kind of in control of this, just like the last game where, you know, it's sort of whether he wants to play for a win or not. Last game he did, but lost, so now he's in a tough position. I mean, if he allows a draw, that's just one more game off the clock and 10 more minutes gone that, that limits his chances of making a comeback. He's going to settle on it in this one, and so that's going to bring our that's going to bring our score to... I guess to be five to one as they simply repeat moves and, and come to a draw. But um, frustrating if you're if you're in a position like that, Jen. Right when you're down in a match, you have to win to get back in the match. But but uh, sometimes pushing for a win may mean losing. Right. Exactly. And we saw a glimpse, though, I think, of some hope for Meyer. I, I saw him at a final perpetual. He was playing so quickly. His his king moved to f7 before I, before you, you could blink. So maybe yeah. he's going to be faster in the bullet and he'll have a chance to come back there. Yeah, maybe that's what he sees now. I mean, obviously you don't want to risk losing and play play too long. And so he takes the draw, going to try for another five-minute game. It's possible, everybody, because of the time control to remind you, there's a two-second increment, which means if the games go the distance, uh, they could actually be longer than 10 minutes. So it's possible this is going to be our last five-minute game. More probable they'll probably get one more five-minute game after this gen before the first Chess 960 battle. Well, I'm so excited about Chess 960. That's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, me too. I can't. I can't wait to see if uh, see if something interesting happens there. So we have a a, a return again um, by by Georg to the 
to the more traditional ways he, he's used to playing chess, knight f3 or c4 on move one and not the e4 one we saw to start the match. I wonder if he should go back to that. I wonder if he should keep, keep mixing it up or if he wants to stick with his bread and butter. And what do you think what do you think about this opening, Danny? Uh, I think White's a little better, and and you know Jorg was was kind of in, in questioning himself how how did he want to deal with how did he want to deal with the threat on c six he decided it was worth parting with the bishop pair but uh, but okay I mean I, I think I think White's a little better now White has the bishop pair the e pawn is weak but but you know maybe Jorg goes all in here I mean does he does he say I don't care about the e pawn and start playing moves like h four and h five and go for an attack on the king side again that's what I would do but we know that that doesn't work out for everybody including me. Maybe you start with bishop h6, then uh, force the rook to e8, gain that tempo, and uh, then start thinking about playing uh, very aggressively in this position. Right. You, you, you're, a, you're, a, you're an aggressive attacker too, right? So you can relate to that, wanting oh. to play, of course, right? Yeah, I mean, especially considering the match situation. Um, right. The only thing I wouldn't recommend here for White is queenside castling. I mean, yeah, exactly. that was a bit too dangerous. And indeed, he played rook to d1, just attacking the pawn with the uh, the rook rather than uh, queenside castles, which was also legal, but not recommended. Right. And he, but he keeps his options open, right? So he plays rook to d1. He, he, of course, is still in a position where he could easily castle short. And I guess most likely he probably will. He does have the bishop pair, so... He's not required to be all in with this attack here in order for White to still have an edge, everybody. You know, White has the bishop pair, and I, and I think I think the dark squares will be a lingering issue for Black even without um, even without the all in approach, I guess you would say, to make our make our first poker terminology of the day with a professional poker player with us. But he doesn't have to go all in, Jen. I think White still has an edge even if he doesn't launch the H four attack. And now, what? How do you think uh, Black's going to meet Rook takes D five here? There's so many different tactical possibilities. That's I was assuming he'd play just bishop e6 and develop, because does that rook really want to go to c5? And or, uh, Excuse me there. Does that rook really want to go to c5 to try to hold the e-pawn? I don't think so. That rook looks very precarious on that spot. That is that is true. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to see how quickly something like this could uh, backfire with black actually getting um, more counterplay. Yeah. No. Fortunately what? for uh, Meyer, knight takes e5, not in the position because the queen takes e8. So he's taken on e5 with the queen instead. Yeah, indeed. Takes on c5 with the queen. I think now will really be the question for Meyer. I'm guessing he's going to castle short. and uh, But, you know, if, if, if that's met quickly with moves like, you know, castle short, black and now gets bishop h3 and gains a little bit of time himself, brings the other rook to d8. Suddenly, the development lead and, and the initiative White had is, is maybe kind of disappearing. So, Meyer's having to think here of, of exactly what he wants to do. So, you're thinking, are you saying that after castles, queen takes c3, you just have some, you, that's very dangerous for black, that pawn. So, you're just going to castle here and not worry about that. But instead, it, queen b3 has been played. I guess I just assumed that taking c3 would be super risky given the dark squares that are already available maybe on this diagonal. But I guess Meyer agreed with you that he. He uh, decides he that pawn is worth saving. Yeah, because in this position, f7 is under attack, and um, e6 uh, kind of further weakens the dark square. So I'm not sure he really wants to get play that move if he doesn't have to, and uh, that's why he's played the move um, bishop e6 instead. Because after e6, we, when we retreat the bishop uh, again, those dark squares and the bishop on c8 would have been really killed. Yeah, I agree, uh, and, and I really, but I really do like Bishop E six. I think again, it's Sergey uh, earning his nickname as the Minister of Defense. He's getting his way out of this little tricky spot he was in with the Dark Swords and the Bishop pair. And if we head to an endgame, Jen, I think this C pawn may prove to be one of the weakest on the board, which will really will really uh, favor favor Karyakin's chances in the endgame. Well, he has an option here to play something different. I mean, queen takes b7 looks very dangerous, but we, we certainly yeah. have to check it. Yeah, I guess it's it's it seems really risky to me. I mean, my first thinking is black can even just ignore everything else and play the moves like rook to b8 and bring the rook into the second rank. Um, but but okay, I guess I guess he kind of answered the question for us. He decides it's too dangerous. Meyer does and trades on e6. 
Okay, he's gotten these doubled E pawns as compensation for his isolated C pawn gem, but I still feel like I've like I've liked the direction of this game for Black as far as how the opening transitioned into the middle game. You mean considering that you didn't like it for Black, you like how considering Black I did exactly considering I didn't really like it for Black. I was I was um, you know I guess I was really hoping for that H four plan we talked about and the all in the all in checkmate attack, but that didn't happen. And now I feel like these E pawns though doubled everybody. Center double pawns can be useful in terms of square control, and they're not on an open file, which makes it, you know, it's not the easiest pawns to attack. When, when double pawns are isolated and on open file, that's when you see the rooks double up and things get really tough. But, um, and Georg kind of invites that, right? He says, well, do you want to trade on d3 and open up the e file? And I'm going to guess that Sergei doesn't want to do that. Knight a5 here, maybe? Maybe rook to d5? Ooh, e5. He wants to bring the king out to e6. I like that. Whoa, yeah, that's a really active king. Um, white king can also go to e3, but it's not as shielded. That's the difference. The king on e6 is totally shielded, whereas the king on e3, now guess what? The knight on a5 is going to come, the knight on c6 is going to come to a5, and c4 is a, a lovely outpost. Agreed. So, yeah, this is, this is the future for that knight right there. That's why, um, in order to get some counterplay, Maiar played h4 instead. Of course, this is not the swashbuckling attack that you were hoping for in the middle <laughs> game. But he is going after some weakness of his own. He does make the trade and, and says, I'm not so worried about the e-file anymore. And that's probably because it came with a forcing combination, right? Makes the positional exception because those last moves, everybody, were completely forced. He trades, gains one tempo, and then immediately implies the rook lift, a la Larry Christensen. He's going to bring that rook to the a-file and gang up on that weak a2 pawn. So I, um, I, again, I still like the way that this endgame is transitioning for Karyakin. And again, the time tells me that if this becomes a scramble, one player will have a little bit of an easier time making those critical decisions. And it's not going to be Georg Meyer. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is tough. And, and again, from a score perspective, as we are reminding everybody, there's only six minutes left here in the five-minute portion. Uh, we have... A big deficit, you know, for the for the challengers. Down four games, not insurmountable. Uh, we have seen four game leads overcome, by the way, in these matches, which is kind of cool to note for his historical reasons. But we've never seen a five game deficit overcome, Jen. I'm just loving Karyakin's uh, end game play, play. It's just such a such a joy to watch. This move rook a four can be coming into the position, and suddenly the rook is going after you um, from all angles. It's not just A3, but it's also G4 and H4 that's going to be pressured. Um, he's played a B5. I, I think that he's going to try to bolster that with a A6 and then play Rook A4. But he just played Rook A4 immediately because Bishop B2 um, prevented the attack anyway. And now the Rook, uh, the rook and the Bishop both forfeit in passivity in order to stop um, Surrey, who's really hammering on Meyer's weaknesses here. Yeah, agreed. And uh, from a facial expression perspective, we nothing nothing really changing. Uh, we uh, if anything, Karyakin is still uh, making me question whether he has to breathe. Maybe he learned from Navy SEALs to hold his breath for ten minutes at a time, right? And here uh, comes the knight. <laughs> yeah, the knight's coming into f4. That's going to be uh, beautiful, right? The knight gets to f4. That's going to be a real problem. And now he can take a breath because that knight on c6. Um, wasn't doing anything. The d4 and the b4 squares were covered. e5 was covered by my knight, by my own pawn. So that's the Ooh. principle of the worst piece in action. Look at that combination by Georg. I think he caught uh, Karyakin unaware of what his trick was. He actually sacrifices the pawn just to open up the rook and bishop to, to, to come together for some pressure on e5. Um, I think that's a saving idea. It, I mean, maybe, maybe it doesn't save the game totally, but you oh, can't is take his, on H5 oh his rook is trapped. And Georg leaned in on that and took his hand away from his mouth. I think he just saw that, everybody. Uh, for, those, for those of you wondering, the, the key there was that black, black, couldn't, black couldn't take, or sorry, white couldn't take on H5. Because if he did, the king would come to G6 and the rook would be trapped. With I love that. That's a very unusual tactic. You got to love it. Absolutely. But that means he's down on time again and now down a pawn. Super tough position to be in. He's going to try one more chance to go remove this rook from guarding a6, but uh, the knight on f7, almost like it was meant to be, already guarding the h8 square. Georg has no chance to swing the rook back, and uh, and wow. 
Wow, wow. Right? Mm. Tough games for Jorg right now as he shakes his head. We uh, <laughs> Tough to see Jorg in this position. So many, He has so many fans. He probably has as many fans as Sergey Karyakin does on Chess.com. I mean, he plays on our site every month in the title Tuesdays, Jen. Um, Jorg Meyer is obviously, that's one of the reasons he qualified for the for the chance to be here, so he is he is a well known super grandmaster on our site. But in this in this match so far, he is just simply he is just simply being outdone. I mean, he's he's up against one of the best chess players on the planet. Yeah, just a fabulous chess by Sergey Karyakin, though. I mean, I can't even believe it's a blitz game, and he's teaching us so many positional lessons. Really uh, yeah. beautiful, like this move, Bishop B six, Bishop takes E six, Queen E six. Um, in the last really game, buckled. yeah. No, I agree. It was uh, in a, a super resourceful way. Again, you know, he's just it's not like he's ever been under a huge attack, but when uh, but he's been a little worse in some openings and continued kind of worked his way out of it. I think it's pretty official for us to make the call that this will be the last five minute game. And I will uh, officially inform the players via our, our private conversation here that um, not to rematch each other, that we will start the chess 960 match. So don't go anywhere, everybody. Right after this, we have Chess 960 going down, and uh, and that's going to be a blast. Oh, yeah. Love Chess 960. Um, it's just so fun to look at that uh, initial position and think, hey, E4, D4, C4, none of the above. Right. <laughs> exactly. The uh, We will let the players know officially, as they are thinking now, about Position that's okay. This is a new one. Um, it's not not an opening we've seen before. The queen's gambit uh, declined here. That eventually leads to this sort of traditionally open position on the C in the D files. So, Danny, why do you, why does White have a little something here? Well. Um, it's about that king activity, isn't it? No, I mean it's not not the king activity. I think the biggest issue is that uh, slightly slightly more active pieces means that if whenever we have an open position, there's there's more potential for trades to happen. And if you have the slightly more active pieces in a situation like that, you can usually be the first one to get tactics. So like if the rooks are traded, white has threats like knight to b5 coming in in a lot of scenarios, and the a7 pawn's under fire, maybe there's access to the dark squares in the center, things like c7 and d6 can be weak. Um, okay, so Meyer trying to get rid of that dark square bishop, and he's going to go out of his way to trade the minor to do that. And um, I think white's edge is minimal, though it's there. And, and again, it's it's one of those edges that... Karyakin and Magnus Carlsen love grinding out, right? Very small, not a lot of losing chances, opportunities for him to pose little tricks that his opponent might miss. And here we see, with that trade happening, White does pop into the, the, the B5 square, which is really just kind of an irritating thing to deal with. You don't want to play A6 in a lot of these positions, Jen, because then the pawns just become weaker, right? If you play A6, now if that knight comes into D6, well, that bishop on B7 is now having to guard the A6 pawn, and that's a problem, right? So, so you know, these positions are tough for black when, when white starts getting a the first one to get access to these. Okay, he goes for it, but I'm looking at A6, knight to D6, and, and thinking white's definitely going to have a little bit of an edge. That's right. I mean, you can play bishop C6. Uh, luckily, well, knight C7 played instead. Because now, you know, rook C8 fails. Does rook C8 fail to, yeah, you can't play, you, knight A6 would fall to rook takes C4. But you can play bishop takes A6. So is that, no, you can't do that either because of rook C7, right? Um, no, I, we got to check the tactics here. So a lot going on here. Maybe we have to interpolate the move rook takes d1. Here is black. He well, he goes. He goes for the skewer, but am I not just trading on d8 and then playing bishop takes a6, or or going for it first because we have a back rank problem? Everybody, one of the biggest issues here is that, you know, if uh, if white if black tries to take on d1 and then win a piece, well, not so fast. Back rank checkmate happens. So. Um, so I, I don't know what Georg was calculating there, but that was exactly the kind of line we were looking at, and he is indeed just going down a pawn. And that's what I was kind of saying about the knight to b5 idea to begin with, is black kind of wants to play a6 to kick that knight, but look what ended up happening to that a6 pawn, right? No longer on the board. 
Um, Here the back rank comes up again as yep. uh, Sergey brings his knight back into the battle. Again, everybody, if knight takes c7, there would have been a fun choice between rook takes c7 or rook takes d8. And black's pieces are just overworked here, having to worry about back rank checkmate threats. And now knight e5 is a lovely move that we're trying to get that knight into c6 at the right moment. This is just so tough right now to be Jorg Meyer. I mean, he is just playing against himself, except 150 points higher rated. <laughs> I mean, that's who he's playing, right? I mean, he's playing such a super solid, just like so fundamentally sound player. And Karyakin is, I, I mean, has he made has he made a mistake yet? <laughs> I mean, seriously, right? I mean, I, he has he has he made a move that was an obvious mistake. This might be the longest run of games we've had where someone doesn't blunder. Um, in, in a blitz match. I mean, uh, I know it sounds like I'm exaggerating for the drama, and I do tend to do that sometimes, Jen, but seriously, right? I mean, Sergey has I mean, played some accurate, accurate chess. He's really playing just beautiful chess, and this idea of playing g3 to stop the knight from coming to f4 and then play e4, whereas a lot of, you know, players are just like, oh, let me just play e4 and win right away, or is this, mm -hmm. Sergey's no low, no, first we'll chill. And now it's going to be even worse for him. Um, I guess we're going to have to play king f7, I thought, but no, just e5. But this lets uh, knight b5 into the position, threatening knight d6. He did breathe. We caught it on camera, everybody. You saw it. Sergey Karyakin breathes. It's real. And, uh, and so he does take a breath, but it's, it's a breath of, of confidence, really. And, um, and yeah, I loved your point about G3, just so disciplined, not going to allow any weird tricks, even if the check didn't do much, right? I mean, as we saw in the analysis, maybe it didn't do much, but he stopped the knight from going into this square before expanding and now improving his space advantage. Black is once again in a tough position, and once again, Jen, down two minutes on the clock. And knight C7 was a big threat because uh, if you moved your... Your rook, we had knight E6 check, rook D8, mm -hmm. knight E6 check, so that's why knight C6 was played. And now king e3 stopping knight d4 check and renewing the threat of knight d6. Uh, knight d6 is not a threat here, everybody, because black can trade and then deal with the rook. Now, now he may go for that anyway. He may play knight to d6 anyway. He actually did because he's going to get the c file. But, uh, but it didn't fork them. It didn't fork the rooks. Not immediately okay, winning, um, but also very strong. you got to even worry about... Um, things coming to the C8 square. Yeah. Um, but so I was just they, wondering. I mean, just did super you, solid. Yeah. Okay, and so now, what's the threat? Now the threat is maybe B4, right? With this knight being on A5. And um, Meyer is probably calculating ideas like knight B3, maybe, Jen, to try to bring this knight around to D4. Uh, um, but decides against it. Decides with the, with the retreat of the knight instead. Um, but I'm but I'm in love with rook to c7. Yeah, um, I mean any both pieces to c7 look pretty compelling. <laughs> rook yeah. c6. Um, is, uh, we're aiming to pick up another pawn here. Sergey calculating very quickly his opponent's threat on rook to d3 check. He knew he could get away with b4, and the grind is on. I mean this is just this is just tough, right? This is a position where one player is up a pawn in an endgame again, playing for two results, which is even harder when you're down on time to try to find accurate defensive moves. I think accurate aggressive moves are sometimes a little easier to find under time pressure, but um, accurate defensive moves are just tough. And uh, the knight's coming to c4, right? This pawn is under fire, and, and how do we defend this position if we're black? That's right. Another breath, as you mentioned, Danny, um, Sergei Karyakin um, has got to be proud of his performance so far. And g6, though, that leaves the pawn on f6 hanging as well. So knight c4 is going to come with even more bite. Yeah, I wonder what his idea was. He must have something. Georg probably has something tricky up his sleeve. Try to get some last ditch counterplay before it's too late. Um, but not exactly sure what it is. He brings uh, Sergey brings the knight to c8, which is kind of the same as the idea we were talking about with c4. It makes a double attack of these two pawns and it doesn't even allow knight e7 in variation. So probably even stronger. Yeah. And if knight takes b6, what's the threat? Sergey takes a deep breath before he decides to take it. Obviously, he's going to sort of double check whether um, there's uh, some variations to worry about here. I don't see what the worry is after knight takes b6. Um, I don't either. Maybe, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe, what knight b, maybe he's looking at knight b2. There's some little bit of counterplay there um, with the knight coming into the game. And, and so he played king to e2. 
I guess yeah. he was worried about that. Yeah, and he's also, again, showing patience because one of the biggest issues for Black is, okay, now what, right? You've defended the B-pawn with some sort of trick that Sergei saw, but uh, but now what? How do we how do we guard the B-pawn yet again? Um, I still don't see the real issue behind just... I, oh, I guess the issue, Jen, actually, is if Take Knight takes... He's, exactly, he's just going to trade and then play Rook A7. Okay, so that's what we weren't seeing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I just saw that at the same time, too. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right, so that's the idea. Georg is trying to put himself in position, everybody, to swindle his way into a drawn rook ending. But Karyakin is having none of that. He's just going to continue to to grind this thing out and, um, and make Black's life tough. Yeah, he'd love to get, uh, if he could get a knight to d5, that would be pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. Then, this knight. then you'd really block out all your counterplay. If this knight can completes a journey to d5, everybody, that's really going to be a problem for the Black King. It's pretty funny where we, we've, we've had so many great squares for that knight, and uh, Sergei just keeps trying all of them. Yeah, I mean, again, that just shows the, uh, the style of chess. Super patient. He knows that chess is a game. You know, you don't always have to play the most... Uh, you know, if you don't like the square, retry it. If you have an edge, be patient and try different things and make your opponent's life, defending a bad position, difficult. Now there's a knight f5 check in the position that could be annoying, but instead he, just but he's f5. just going to go for he's just going to go for two pass pawns and deliver something something crazy. I think he plays e5, and here comes rook c7 check, and and that seems like a bit of a problem for Georg. Rook c7 check is going to happen, and maybe he just goes for f7. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. And here comes e6, and it's uh, it's going to be over pretty quickly. These moves are sort of playing themselves. Don't go anywhere, everybody. Right after this, we have Chess 960, which is just going to be an absolute blast. Uh, a fun break in the action, regardless of the match score, which we know is is favoring Mr. Karyakin big time, especially because he's about to win this and take a six-game lead. Um, but, um, but Chess 960 will be fun. Yeah, I can't wait for Chess 960. We're going to have even more trouble guessing the moves, Danny. Meyer gets white, right? He's black here. So if he gets white in the Chess 960 game, Jen, normally white. I don't have those stats on me. Maybe a teammate could help me with that. I'd love to know what the lifetime record is in Chess 960 for the white pieces. As I said yesterday when you and I were doing our preview show, I'm pretty sure white scores really well in Chess 960 in these matches. Yeah, I've noticed that as well, too, because, uh, uh, you know, the whole thing about... Um, the regular chess position, we've had so much time to study it. So some of those like really aggressive ideas for white in the opening have been stymied and white has to try something um, more chill, like the right. Roy Lopez being the most popular opening as opposed to the fried liver attack. Right. Right. Exactly. The, uh, yeah, the King's Gambit isn't, isn't as popular anymore. Although don't tell Richard Rapport that who, by the way, will be playing against Sasha Grishuk in our speech chess championship. <laughs> but no, you're right. I mean, yeah, the people have, have tried more chill approaches and what's going on here. Meyer is making this look at Sergey kind of shuffling in his seat there. Jen Meyer is making this can we a just, little tricky. Can we play 93 check now? And it 90 seems, it seems like 93 check and you but have then he's, I guess you can play king b3 so that um, after knight g2, you're taking off all of our pawns. And breaking breaking um, a little bit of advice here from a teammate who's following all games with an engine at all times. We do that for lots of reasons. But he says that the computer is now claiming that this position should be a draw, a brilliant resourceful defense by Meyer, that if all moves are played accurately, the computer is announcing that this is equal. Wow. So the, the whole big idea here is that knight e3 check would allow just king b3 and all the pawns yep. would be going. Yep. So we would reach an end game with a uh, rook versus knight, but uh, no, no winning chances. And that's going to happen here anyway. Fascinating. We have to show that line for everybody that you were just talking about. The key, everybody, is knight e3 check looking to be simple. Let's just go get all the pawns, and certainly the rook is better than the knight, right? Well, not so fast, because this king gets these pawns in time, and as Karyakin sort of shakes his head there he acknowledges it's a draw and wow what a resourceful res look at meyer he gets his first smile of the match jen we have to have, be happy about that right first yeah. smile of the match it's yeah. wonderful in a way for those of us watching this uh speech as battle that meyer um gets to end this on a good note because the absolutely the match now will start to to uh rebound 
Yeah, for sure. And you can see Sergey having the opposite feeling. Obviously, you got to feel good about a six-game lead, and I was claiming it would be seven. But Georg, that might be the game of the match so far, despite the, the, the score of the match, right, Jen? I mean, Black really showed some interesting defensive ideas there. Yeah, really cool. And it looks like in this game, there is a chess 960 position already set up. Yep. That's why Meyer has been thinking for 45 seconds. That's the only problem with being white in chess 960, yeah. Danny, that you have to think and black gets to think on your time. And the reason they do that, everybody, is because take a look at the position. Have you ever seen this position before, right? I mean, this is not so simple to quickly assess, especially at the level of chess that they hold themselves to, the standard by which they play. He's like, I don't want to develop a bad plan in the opening, right? So Meyer has to think about how he wants to coordinate his pieces. And when you're playing chess 960, you know, they haven't... And again, remember, the match format here is that they don't know these positions ahead of time. We keep it secret. It is random. In fact, we already have the other two positions ready for the three-minute and bullet chess 960. And so uh, that makes it really fun to see how the players react in real time. So let's take a look at this position. One thing about chess 960 is it's hard to coordinate your pieces as easily as it is in our regular chess position by a combination of the fact that the piece configurations are often more awkward and then also the fact that we're not comfortable with that. So it's a lot difficult to a lot more difficult to actually develop all your minor pieces. Um, and yeah, agreed. We're, yeah, we're seeing both players develop their knights to this uh, strong e3 square and e6 square to start. But then what about the bishop on e8 and the bishop on e1? Well, I uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess the middle game will tell us what those bishops are supposed to do. I mean, I think that I'm kind of curious with the approach Meyer took here. I was I was wondering if uh, if something with the queen's pawn, which was the f pawn in this in this game, was a little more aggressive to start something like one f4. Um, but again, as I just added that Chess 960 logo there for everybody, remind you, if you don't know the rules to Chess 960, it's called that because the positions have 960 possible configurations. It's also referred to as Fisher Random Chess. Uh, we have a lot of audience that may be looking at this like, what the, what the bleep just happened here, right? And this is chess, but it's also a... A, in many ways, a really show of, of quick talent, of strategic plans, and how quickly these guys can develop it. Chess 960, for a while, people were kind of claiming it as the future of chess, right? Because it avoids all of that really deep opening preparation that can kind of make chess a little boring. And these are positions that are totally wild, and um, but still, all the other rules of chess apply, other than the fact that the starting position is different. Knight f5, threatening the subtle 97 check. Uh, so... I love that. This is a uh, bishop takes d5. I thought might happen to him. Instead, he just played rookie eight. Um, what about the move h4 now, trying to remove that knight on g6 from the attack? But g3 yeah, came he, first because he's trying to. First, right, exactly. He guards this. And I, I think Meyer's in the driver's seat here. He is down on time again. But as we know, he took about 45 seconds to start. So if you take that away, I mean, I think he's, I think he's played decently quickly in this game. Um, Jen, the. This game reminds me a little bit. I play chess rivals matches with Grandmaster Simon Williams where we kind of go at it and stuff. We play chess 960. And in, in one game recently, I got myself in a position like that where there was a threat of a fork of a, of a win of a king and a queen, and I didn't even have any moves to stop it. That's how weird my pieces were placed, right? It was just, and I ended up, like, I think losing a rook on h8. So sometimes funny things like that happen where you see tactics that don't normally exist, you know, before move 10 in a chess game. That's why I, I actually love the format. And for everybody watching, if you want to give it a try, you can play Chess 960 on chess.com. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a fun way to avoid opening theory and just test your positional chess. Yep. So now we're going to see Cackle Long, I think, everybody. This king, by the way, the way you do that is you pick up your king and drop it on A1. And uh, that, makes the, that makes the castles happen. You are legally allowed to castle in chess 960, just like chess, as long as you have not moved the king or rook, or as long as you're not passing through an illegal move, a, a check of some sort. Um, so I, I think Meyer should consider casting long here and, and, and bring that rook to the D file, but maybe he wants something else. Maybe he's not sold yet that he should change the position of the king and the rook here. But one thing's for sure, he should play quickly. Um, because he doesn't want to get in too big of a time deficit, but he started with the move bishop c4. Mm -hmm. He's improving the position of his minor. I mean, all of his minors here are better than all of Sergei's minors. So um, it should be an advantage for him, but he's got to watch that clock. Yeah, I agree. It, again, that might be the one thing that holds him back here. I do think he's got a very comfortable edge. White has a big space advantage here, everybody. Nice pieces. This knight on f5 is good. Um, and he can, he can kind of 
fix this problem here of the king and rook with just one move of castles. Um, now, now doing a little dance with the knight. Uh, I think we might see uh, George Meyer play bishop d5, trying to gain that uh, that strong square on d5 for the knight. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, are we going to see f5? That's an aggressive move by Karyakin, but is he... Is he feeling like maybe he can get away with? I mean, it's such a it's such a risky move. I look at these light squares, all of them, Jen, and think, can White get some sort of attack going on these squares, like a move like Queen E2 now, uh, sort of shift the Queen to be behind the Bishop and maybe organize a bit of a battery, or okay, look at that, he's sort of inching, inchworming his way into the C6 square and and also opening up the C4 square for the Knight, I uh, love which it. could could be kind of irritating for Black. Because we're not worried about takes on e4. If you play takes on e4, you're only exacerbating your issues. Pawn takes e4, and um, that endgame is going to be really great for us as our major paces are going to be coming into the game quicker than yours. So Sergey said yeah, no thank you to that. And it, I still want to see Castle's long. Come on, somebody Castle here. This Rook isn't doing anything. But no, he, he doesn't want to sacrifice his potential for the initiative over here. Okay, now we got to see it. No. Knight, yeah, now we got to see it because this knight might come into c5, Jen, the d7 knight, and into the d3 square. So white has to be a little careful. I still expect to see the castles long happen. Maybe bishop um, c6 is uh, bishop c6 is also under the radar here for uh, for my. Whoa! Look at that highlight reel. He castles he castles short, Jen. I forgot I forgot that was possible, and that's like my thing. I always try to remember castles. Look at that, everybody. He he hasn't moved the king or the rook to start. I guess I forgot that the rook on f1 hadn't moved, Jen. But isn't the, isn't that castling long in a way? <laughs> in, in a way, that was castling long, exactly. I was expecting castles queenside, but that was a, by the way, I think that was a huge move, by the way. Now look at how awkward this king on c8 looks. Black doesn't have the ability to do the same. And I think white is about to launch some serious attacking chances on the queenside. I, I think Meyer's going to get his first win in the match here, Jen. I really I love do. it. I mean, look at this queen. This queen is going to creep into the c6 square. Or the c4 square. Um, I was hoping for, for for c6 so that I could bring my knight to c4, but right. maybe he'll start with c4 just so that the um, pawn on c3 remains protected. I don't even think the c pawn is really capturable here. That's I mean, if true. he, if he takes that pawn, that's a, that is asking for it on the c file. Uh, Meyer, Meyer says, I don't want to give it up anyway because I think a straightforward positional plan of c4 and c5 looks pretty irritating. But, but Karyakin's not going to sit around and wait, right? He puts the king, king puts his running shoes on, and he's going to try to switch sides here. That's right. He's trying to switch sides because that queen b5, queen c4 ideas, it was just too brutal here. Um, and, of course, the minister of defense is never going to make it easy. The minister of defense is back at it again. He's, uh, I love that nickname, by the way. I wish I was the minister of anything, you know? I mean... <laughs> The Minister of Diamond Memberships. The Minister right? of Diamond Memberships, right? The Minister of Awkward 80s References. Oh, um, right. That's me. Um, anyway, no, that's, uh, that's awesome. He's, uh, he's going to defend this position, and that's, again, the, the thing that we've been talking about that might come back to Herb Meyer is the time. Um, where's he headed? What? 94 is the last move that was played, so he's going after um, a weakness on A5. Uh, I was just wondering, is that the goal? I feel like he doesn't want to take here, because if he does, he gives that c5 square for the knight. But you boy. might be right. What, what's his... I'm kind of... I'm liking Karyakin's plan here. I like that he's running, and I feel like Meyer is... Meyer is running out of ideas to continue to press the edge. Was there a chance earlier to, to be more aggressive on the queen side? I, we'd have to back up and see, but... I, um, I really respect Karyakin's heads-up play to put the king on the other side of the board here. Yeah, just, uh, you know, it looked so good for white because I didn't see the idea of king d8, king e8, king f8, king d7. Yeah, no, I, d I didn't see this idea either. Look where that king is now. But that at least changes before, things. We got a little cheapo. Knight takes f5 check is threatened. Mm -hmm. and That's right, course, everybody. Queen takes queen d4 pinned. would actually be a bad move because after pawn takes d4, that pawn on c7 um, is going to give a white a huge edge. So I think instead Karyakin's going to like do something, like, I don't know, king g6 maybe? But what is that? What is that other movie's going to do here? I mean, if he's if he trades, he opens up the C. Okay, he play. Uh, you're right. He plays king g6. That's how to guard that pawn. And you know, the king can do. The king can defend his own problems sometimes, right? And that's that's what he's doing here. Uh, look out for ideas of this knight coming around from g2 to h4. 
Yeah, that's an interesting idea. And D, knight g2, I still think queen takes d4 is not good. But uh, right. Meyer just played this move rook a2. I'm not really sure where he's going to go with the rook. But you know what? He has to make moves quickly. That's for sure. Yep. And uh, Sergei is struggling with a plan himself. Again, everybody, as we just highlighted on our analysis board here, trading would be something you'd want to do, especially if you could just take this pawn if you were Karyakin. But the c7 pawn is a little more valuable, and that's going to lead to some serious problems here. So... So Sergey is kind of kind of stuck here, right? Doesn't quite know what he wants to do. Having a hard time untangling the king side if he's not going to trade. On okay, he goes for it. We're going to find out if what he. Oh, here we go. I just said he couldn't do this. Uh, Meyer, you see Meyer lean in right there and kind of be like, "What?" Because he he felt the same way. He's like, "Black can't do this." Yeah, he wasn't expecting this because we just thought like after Rick takes c seven, this just looks like. Uh, oh, you know what he has? Look knight at this. Knight e5 idea? Yeah, exactly. No, you, yeah, you saw it right as I did. Knight e5. He defends the rook with the knight, everybody, so the trade gets black out of the woods. And look at Meyer. He's so frustrated by missing that tactic that he gives up on the idea of rook takes c7 and just settles on, on re-grabbing his pawn on b4. Wow, yeah, because I guess he felt like getting that, letting that knight on d7, which is now basically checkmate, and the knight can't go to e5 to c5. He did not want to let that knight into the game with the knight e5, rook, C7, rook f7, knight d3 in between move that we were anticipating. Yeah, that was that was a super tricky find, and that's what it takes to play high level defense sometimes, is seeing those resourceful little tricks uh, that your opponent might have overlooked. Especially when your opponent only has 10 seconds left on the Right, map. exactly. A little bit unfair, but. Uh... But it, it still seems like this should be better for white because I agree. of the knight. The yeah, knight I agree. No, and, and other than time. The knight on d7 is still really searching for a stable square, right? Whereas the knight on mm -hmm. e3 is doing work. It's blockading and it's putting pressure on f5. Uh, so that's why those doubled pawns here for Meyer, d4 and d5, are good double pawns. Yeah, these double pawns are kind of what we were talking about earlier. Center double pawns tend to sometimes guard really cool and critical squares. So, um, oopsie. Uh oh. The oh well, no. F four isn't hanging because of F five. And okay. now he's trying to switch places here. Play king e three, perhaps. For the first time, we're going to see what Karyakin's made of with only a few seconds on the clock. I, maybe we have, but I feel like we've always seen Jorg in this position. This is the first time we've seen Sergey with so little time on the clock, Jen. That's right, the knight coming back to e3, and now um, c7's about to hang. Yep, and with it, the d5 square may be a mating net. Black has to be, oh, he goes for it, but is knight d5 check a, a problem? I guess not. What is going on here? Uh, Sergey is putting, the, look at that, four seconds. Jorg doesn't have a win. He wanted to play knight d5 check and then, and then take on g7, but he didn't have anything. Oh, no. Oh, no, but he missed... He misses the, after rook h1 check, rook g1, rook a1 check, Jenny has knight d1 blocking the skewer, and Georg is going to win. Yes, finally we're going to get a victory for, for Meyer. I think it's, I think it's official. I think Sergey with that kind of upper lip, sort of, uh, not too happy with how that one went. Uh, you know, given, given how well Sergey defended a worse middle game, you thought he might once again swindle his way to a victory, but, but Georg held on. And I think, you know, short of a massive blunder here, we are about to see the first victory. It was chess 960 that Georg needed to get it done. That's right. And this is a huge confidence boost going into the next wow. stage. I love that. That was, that was fantastic there. You know, that the, the, the key for Sergey was he started to go down when he pian kettled his knight. So the lesson from this game is don't pian kettle the knight. Absolutely, and uh, Sergey is a little a little frustrated with himself. Um, he knows that he has a he has a break, a few minutes. Um, but uh, Jorg Jorg using his break a little more ambitiously immediately gets up, Jen, and, and kind of runs away. So, all right, with that with that win, we now you know the match is closer than we thought it would be. In fact, if you count the last two games, Jen, if we if we go to the score here, right, the last two games were ones that we thought Georg was going to lose as Black, right, where he was down a rook, and then the Chess 960 game. So if you if you give if you give those two games to Georg, like suddenly you know he's got to be feeling a lot better, despite the fact that he's still down by four games. Well, I'm just thrilled that. Meyer's back on the scoreboard here because he deserves it. He's actually played really good in this match, and it was pretty sad to see him with zero victories. Um, maybe he could have won one of the other games, but he won this one, and it's nice to see.
Agreed. Agreed totally. And, and maybe if he doesn't hang that rook on a7 and wins that game, you know, we only have a three-game match. So the point is, you know, it's, it's, it, it, if you're just joining us, the four-game lead does not tell the full story in regards to what's happened here. These two have been very closely matched. Certainly, Karyakin has been the better player and, and been better in a way that is stylistically, I think, hard for Georg to overtake. But with a couple of games going the challenger's way, um, again, reminding you where these players are seated in the bracket to start, we've got uh, right down here in the lower right corner, the 15 seed for a two seed. It's kind of like March Madness, right, Jen? It would kind of be like a 15 seed upsetting a two seed in an NCAA tournament. You know, that's the that's the kind of that's the comparison, I think. But Georg is keeping it close, and with the faster time controls, who knows what could happen? I think it's really funny that the one game that Jorg wins is in the 960 because we've talked a little bit about how he was the one who was preparing for this match. Right. One thing you can't prepare for, he wins it. Right. Well, uh, on that note, the games are going to get to set to start here in just a couple of minutes. The official game clock being managed by uh, one of my awesome team members. So many people work so hard to make this happen. So if you're here and enjoying the show, make sure you thank the entire Chess.com staff, including our developers and everybody making this event happen. So hopefully you are having a good time with, uh, with the Speed Chess Championship. I'm All right, Jen. Time. I mean, I feel like I'm just getting um, an amazing chess lesson from Sergei Karyakin. Because, okay, last game was not his best, but the other Blitz games he played uh, so brilliantly from a strategic and uh, end game point of view. Agreed. We are getting something uh, from, from these guys for sure, from both of them. And uh, I, uh, well, and now we're about to get even more. Um, the, the match, the next game is starting. We have officially started the clock. The three-minute chess portion has begun, Jen. One hour of three-minute blitz before we go into the bullet is what we're about to see. A four-game lead. Here we go. And here we see another Rubenstein French. We have we had this earlier in the tournament, and then uh, Meyer chose the Tarash in the next game. And remember that game, um, Sergei made this move, Bishop C1, and uh, it was a really tough battle for, for Meyer. So this one has a completely different character in that uh, Sergei Karyakin has doubled his pawns and given Meyer the two bishop adva advantage um, with lots of space for Sergei. And this is, this is kind of a common imbalance um, in some of these positions. I wondered about f5 right there, if black could have played the move f5. I guess that's why white played c3. Um, but I was wondering if Black could have gotten away with it before Castles. Okay, obviously, obviously not, right? Because of discovered checks, for sure. Okay, yeah, sorry. So, sorry. Distracted by tactics, everybody. That happens. It's like when a chess player is talking and it's like a squirrel, like a dog sees a squirrel. Squirrel, I saw tactics. <laughs> and uh, so, but anyway, now we're in a position, as you said, the imbalance is that Black has the bishop pair, uh, but the double pawns and potentially open king to worry about, so we'll see how this one goes. This is a little more fun already. I already like the dynamics here. We got three minute chess, a little bit more of an unbalanced opening. That's right, so the key here though is if white wants to attack, we need to get maybe a rook into the game because any kind of queen h5 or, or queen d3 is gonna be met by f5 and then, okay, now what? So- I, I agree, rook d3, you think we were gonna see it? Uh, rook d3, yeah, it looks like a, a fun option. I wanna make sure there's no tactics with like, um, E5 and Bishop B5. Those, those that looks right. a bit too dangerous for Black. Yeah, it 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 does. It looks it, yeah, it looks like he can't quite get away with it. And, and uh, but here we go. Can, G4. Wow. G4 stopping ideas or trying to set ideas of F5 and mm -hmm. um, thereby uh, preparing to play Queen to D3. And so if we, but a very quick rookie eight by Meyer. So I think his plan is. Well, you might even just give up this pawn and tuck the king on f8, right? And just kind of protect itself on the dark squares. That's right. And that's why instead of queen d3, uh, Sergei is just playing a rook to d3 because he figures that if he can get his rook to take on h7, um, that would be really strong because then we can use the rook to sacrifice on g7 and mm -hmm. continue to mount problems. Not much has changed from these players in regards to facial expression and focus. Uh, Karyakin still really zoned in. Maybe looks a slightly more tired as he's blinking a little bit. It is much later, I think, for Sergei than it is for Georg. I mean, obviously, this is a global event, everybody. So these guys are often playing from their homes. And uh, Sergei in Moscow and Georg in, I believe, Sweden. Um, so uh, I think, I think uh, Georg is a couple hours earlier than, than Sergei, actually. Stockholm, right. And now, 
This position is interesting because what I'm envisioning for Sergey is I want him to get rook h3, queen e4, queen h7, and rook h6 then. But maybe the math wasn't working out because Sergey just decided to play more chill and uh, retreat the rook to d2. Still not going to go for anything crazy unless he needs to. Um, so, kind of sitting on his small positional edge here. Not as big of a time advantage here, right? Georg has obviously picked up the pace a little bit, um, being in the faster time. So look at that queen. She sets herself on h7, and I don't think she's there for a friendly visit. I, th <laughs> I, th I think I think he has some. Uh, I think he has some abrasive plans there for that queen. Um, it's actually very tough to find a defensive move for black here. You don't want to play a move like e5, everybody. That opens up squares on f5. Um, you know, certainly the queen doesn't have any concrete threats right away, but but it's hard for black to make defensive moves. That's right, and you've got to be constantly vigilant about any kind of capture here. you always got to be looking at the knight f5s in the positions. Even here, right. knight f5. Even, I was just going to say, yeah, just going to say, you're right. For rook d2, because queen d7 is just mate. Yeah, and that that's the this is the line that Jen is calculating everybody. That would be checkmate, and if Black takes it, are we just gobbling up the exchange? Takes, takes, and takes. I guess at the end of it, Meyer would have some idea of his own to maybe check the king, and maybe he has queen c6 check, forking the king on g2 and the rook on d7. That might be the saving grace there. Uh, but but certainly Karyakin is calculating this right now, and that's why he is kind of zoned in here. Um, Nice idea there, Jim, with knight f5. We'll see if he finds some way to make something like that work. Knight takes e6 check is also kind of in the air uh, because queen takes e6 would allow maybe bishop f5. But but no, he plays a simple bishop c2. And look at Meyer. Meyer plays quickly. He, he's trying to reverse his fortunes here. Speeds up. But, yeah, this move bishop b3 certainly increases the tactical pressure. Mm -hmm. This move h3, man, if you gave me 30 minutes, I don't think I'd find that move. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me 30 minutes, I'd blunder for sure. Um, and, um, okay, well, the queen, the queen kind of gives up. Maybe she was there for a friendly visit. My bad. I, I accused her of things she didn't intend. She was just there to say hi. She comes back to the center. But, uh, but just a tough position. These guys are both, look at the way they play chess, right? Just very solid. A lot of back and forth. They're willing to sit on their positions and kind of wait. And if Meyer can speed up, you know, certainly he would have a better chance of of uh, holding these games and not be under time pressure against Karyakin as he's been throughout most of, of the games. But this position is so much more annoying for Black to play because you have to constantly ta check all these tactics, whereas right. uh, White doesn't. There's not really any tactics for White to check. Look at these. Look at these moves here. They're playing. They're like, all right, well, let's just get this thing under. Let's 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 uh, let's skip the formalities and just get down to business. Let's get down. Let's get into time pressure, and then we'll both both play a little faster. But this move h5, is it a good one? I mean, now you're going to be opening up uh, your own king, aren't you? Well, he's got the queen on this side, though. I mean, it, obviously, I think that if, if you're Meyer, you're certainly hoping Karyakin would take it. And even if he doesn't, you did get rid of kind of an irritating weakness on h6. The only question will be, would the h file come into play, right? If you got too aggressive, could white swing a rook over there? I like it. I like h5. And look at the time. I mean, that it certainly got, got Karyakin thinking, and we're going to have... A time scramble with the rolls reversed. Well, King F5 getting out of the way of a check, and... Meyer needs to smell blood here. He needs to recognize that he is up on time for one of the first times and try to keep playing fast, and he's going to do that, I think. He plays Queen A5. He needs to, he needs to sense his opportunity to keep playing fast. No queen trade. I mean, Sergei wants to keep those queens on the board. Queen E5, pawn E5 would be a, a disaster. For, for him, um, queen g5 now. And uh, I'm still, we're always still looking at these tactics with knight e6, right? I mean, what are you going to do after knight takes e6? Uh, mm. Didn't work for some reason. We'll find out later. Maybe there was like a queen takes d2 just picking up two rooks. Um, but uh, I, I'm. No, you're right. That was, that was a weird. I, I don't see the exact answer why the knight takes e6 wasn't. Maybe rook takes d3. Uh, no, I, I agree with you. Knight takes e6 looked looked like a bit of a shot there. Um, again, I guess we'll find out later. Maybe somebody will analyze it for us. No, um, it's it's kind of funny.
funny because the rook is on d2 and we okay so now after bishop d7 everything's hanging after knight f5 but the lucky thing is that after pawn takes f5 mm -hmm. we can't play rook d6 because our queen's in take yep if knight oh. f5 everybody the queen would be under fire so meyer is Meyer's surviving just by the hair and he's shaved he shaved so he doesn't have much hair on his face today so he's but he's surviving what about knight f5 now oh but there it goes five. yep There's now queen check. yep he misses the check if takes, queen e8 check, intermizzo, saving the queen, and he's going to win the exchange. Meyer doesn't have the time to get himself out of this on the clock. He needs something tricky. The bishop is also hanging on c8 now. Ah, rook to d1. But we're going to have a bunch of mating threats. Oh, I thought he would play bishop takes f7, but queen takes f7 also does the trick. Also good and just queen h5 now. Yeah, what? so why why isn't black being... Ah, mm. rook h1. Look at that move, king to g2. Sweet. That is um, that is nasty. A very subtle move. Karyakin knows it. He shuffles in his chair. Georg is frustrated. That was a tough loss there. He played well, and was, he was not down on time significantly, Jen. That was not the... That was not the, the recipe of how this match has gone there, right? I mean, Georg was in that game, and just... But Karyakin found a way to win it anyway. Yeah, but I mean, I feel like Black didn't have any counterplay in that game. Sergey was nursing that position, and you know, at some point you're going to mess up in time pressure. That's the problem, and it happened. You know, right. Sergey had almost nothing he had to worry about, and his opponent um, had like three tactics to check every single move. Right. Too and you called it. Yeah, you were right. I mean, earlier in the match, you were saying that the biggest issue with Black's position is he's one move away from blundering, whereas White isn't, right? Black has to constantly be on the edge of his seat, and eventually he did make that blunder. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a practice. It's kind of like that earlier game we saw in the match where Meyer had his king in the center, right? He was constantly in a position where he was one move away from blundering and his opponent wasn't, and in a practical sense, that's not the way you want to play chess. All right, well, now we have another. Uh, it's not a Tarash. It's a Sicilian. No, it's a it's a knight of three. What is it? It's a bat. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's it's not chess 960, that's for sure. Um, it's around as an English. It's um, an so, English. So kind of like some kind of weird uh, symmetrical English in which uh, now we're going to perhaps see another endgame. Great. Well... Meyer's still focused, and again, if you're just joining us for the three-minute portion, you have missed a lot of awesome high-quality chess, but the score is currently a five-game lead for Karyakin. Uh, it's been close than that, still been exciting, been super instructive, uh, but uh, yes, it is a big lead right now for the two-seed in the Speech Chess Championship, really showing why he is the reigning World Blitz champion. I like saying that because I feel like people don't appreciate uh, how good at Blitz Karyakin is, especially knowing the names that we have right there with Carlson and Nakamura in this format, right? I mean, Karyakin is, he is formidable. He is the number two rated player in the world at Blitz and the world Blitz champion as of December. Yeah, I mean, I've been impressed in this match. I mean, I knew, I knew Karyakin was a beast, but like, this has been absolutely instructional. I mean, that's why I love Blitz Chess, because when you watch players like Karyakin or Nakamura or Carlson um, play, you can kind of learn even more sometimes because their ideas are a little bit more human, right? Right. Totally. Um, this is, this is uh, I mean, we've had some blunders, but I feel like the overall quality of this match, Jen, I mean, this has been one of the, one of the highest highest levels of chess I've seen and, and I've hosted I mean if you go back years before we actually organized the format of the speech chess championship probably about 50 of these matches where two grand masters go at it in our in our blitz match format so this has been really impressive I agree with you Karyakin has, has put on a clinic uh, the match is not over but uh, but this is certainly Meyer has his work cut out for him he's up on time here that's good right yeah, up on time, and I mean, the, the question is now with the, the knight on g5, uh, is it doing there anything there anymore, or are we going to have to uh, retreat it and reconfigure? It doesn't seem to me like black should have any problems here. Yeah, I agree. Um, knight on g5 feels a little bit like it, like it kind of wandered and got lost, and now it needs to come back home. Um, not really doing much over there. Um, you know, I guess what what can we highlight from an instructional perspective? I think black is potentially a little better if you look at one weak pawn 
on C3 and C2 versus versus um, Black not really having those same weaknesses. So I from totally that perspective, agree. yeah. And I think that's why in this position, um, Meyer felt like he had to try to make something of this knight on g5. So he played bishop c4, trying to threaten rook d8 and taking on f7. Mm -hmm. um, and now it looks like uh, Karyakin's just wanting to trade off all the miners mm -hmm. and make use of the fact that he's got uh, the better pawn structure. Right. And again, you know, this is not a hugely concrete advantage, everybody, but I feel like we get a lot of questions, so we might as well highlight the opportunity to provide some instruction. When, when players feel like if there are no tactics and there's not some sort of obviously weak king or something that they know to do on the basics of chess, attack the king, tactics, what do you think about? Well, you know, you got to think about the long-term weaknesses in a position and pawn weaknesses because they're the one set of pieces that can't undo themselves. That's why we notice those things, and I think Karyakin knows that he has decent chances, maybe not great winning chances, but if he can kind of remaneuver his pieces to to poke it at White's weak pawns, he'll be doing okay. But look at this move, knight d6. Suddenly, Meyer is saying, "I yes, my pawns are weaker, but I'm the one who's getting the threat first on b7, and, and maybe maybe that'll help him save this one. I agree, because um, Suri might be forced to play bishop d6 in this position, which is not what he wants, right. not at all. But um, yeah. my concern is that if you play b6, knight c8 is a, a really strong response. So if uh, b6, knight c8, then you might be forced to play bishop d6, bishop d6, king e8. Yeah, um, and, he, and that is what happened. And he goes for it. But now we have Meyer possessing the bishop pair, everybody. And and they're well placed, right? This isn't a bishop pair that really needs a lot of improvement. They, they're certainly going to want to poke at pawns on both sides of the board. But... But uh, these bishops are well placed. So, so the activity here, we, you and I were focused on the positional weaknesses for White, but White's activity in the center kind of has proved, proved Meyer's position a decent one. You know, that's often a pattern with these um, super grandmaster players that they are really um, so aware of dynamism. And uh, right. when we see a weak pawn structure, we get worried about it, but then they, they show us, well, look at this activity that I have, this idea I have. Um, right. It's very instructive. Yeah, this move yeah, f6, he was, he was trying to force the trade of the bishops with bishop f7. Um, and uh, Meyer says, no, I want to keep my two bishops. That's why he played bishop b3, so that he could play c4 in response to this idea. But this gives yep. a, a weakness for Karyakin to hammer yep. on. But, but, but I was just about to say, but it also gives the weakness here an opportunity to be to be uh, focused on. Meyer brings the bishop to f8. He'd like to continue to use the dark square bishop that he has and black doesn't. But how do you do that? You kind of want to, if you can, you'd like to fix a pawn on a color that allows you to gang up on it where it can't move. But right now there's nothing really preventing Karyakin from moving these pawns to safety. So Meyer's not wasting his breath by attacking the pawn. Yeah, now this, this move, king, e, king d8, now bishop g7, well met by king e7. Yeah, and also the c4 pawn is hanging, so Meyer may just have to go right back um, with the bishop to b3. I don't really, yeah, I don't really see another good way to deal with that pawn. That's He's right. Getting down on time. That's right, because bishop b5 met by a6. Yep, a6, and now that bishop has to move again, and and the pawn will fall. So I, I expect we'll see bishop b3 unless he's. Well, yeah, he goes for. I was going to say unless he's calculating something. Kind of nutty, but no, he goes for this, and we have an obstacle bishop position, and we are going to have a draw. Um, Georg Meyer has actually offered a draw, and Sergei Karyakin has accepted. Okay, so if you're Meyer, right, you, uh, again, every non loss is a good result from a rating perspective when we know that Meyer is sort of the underdog in the match. The problem is he's also down, he's also down five games in the match, right? So, so a draw is not ideal from that perspective. And so we've we've got a we've seen a lot of Frenches in this uh, in this match, but instead uh, Sergey mixing it up and playing d4 and move on. Yep, agreed. He's uh, having some fun with the repertoire now. This is a London system, kind of a strange, uh, strange or not not a strange line, but this move order maybe is a little strange here. The knight comes to h5 and. Black wants to go make a trade here and get the bishop pair. Probably white will play the move bishop to g3, which is usually the most solid way to, to make that exchange. 
But Sergey going into the tank, kind of surprising. Um, a three-minute game, you know. He's obviously shown great chess so far, but now mm. he's uh, giving uh, Meyer an early time lead. And he's I-, I was anticipating maybe he would wanted to play some sort of little uh, kind of, uh, you know, poke at these pawns and try to induce some weaknesses with bishop e5. But no, he just plays c3, and he's willing for this trade to happen on f4, Jim, partly because the pawns coming together really just kind of strengthens the control over the middle area of the board. So... Um, so he's willing for that. I think he's shouting out to uh, Larry Christensen, who we mentioned in our Prevo show yesterday, that a knight is better than a bishop in blitz. That's right. That's right. Well, but Larry goes a little too far. Larry mm-hmm. sometimes claims a knight is better than a queen, but okay. <laughs> well, uh, but yes, you're right. Yeah, the knight is knight is better. Sometimes you how many how many times do you make decisions like that when you play blitz, right? I think for the most part. I don't think like that until I'm in that instinctive time scramble where I'm trying to flag somebody, right? If I'm trying to do something really weird or tricky. But if I'm not in that it's instinctive time scramble, Jen, how often do you actually think, well, I'm actually not going to make this trade purely because I think knights will be trickier than bishops and blitz? Yeah, I think that's a that's a next level thing when you're not only trying to improve your chest, but you're specifically trying to improve your blitz chest. Right. And uh, it's it's really a great thing because now we're giving more and more respect to the blitz and the rapid portions of chess. So we should be thinking like that. We should be thinking it's, not about just making the best moves, but about making the moves that cause our opponents to err. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And I think uh, the um, practical... The practical factors like that always are more relevant with the shorter the time control, right? The longer the time control, the more someone can kind of think their way out of all those things. But in a short time control, those sort of swindle things come into play. And um, So what are we seeing here? Not much still changing about the player's facial expressions besides Meyer. Looks like he had a little snack in between, so I think he's kind of picking at something in his teeth. But other than that, I think we've got the same facial expressions. So a little bit of a, a tricky setup here for Sergey. He's dropped his bishop back back down to b1, and yep. um, it, at some point is uh, is Meyer going to eventually take this knight bishop on s on f4, or is he just going to leave it there forever? I, that's a good question, right? Is he? It's a, it's right now. It's a game of chicken, right? They're having a staring contest. Uh, but I actually like Karyakin's chances the longer that trade doesn't happen. I feel like now he's kind of bringing another piece over to the king's side. He's going to go for that battery you mentioned with the queen and bishop kind of lining up here. And, and that's one way to expose a lack of a knight on f6, right, Jen? That knight is normally here, not on h5. And therefore, on f6, the knight normally guards a checkmate threat, which white might now go for. So so keep an eye for Karyakin to maybe go quickly for a king's side attack in this game, everybody. That's right, because another thing is that pawn on h6 kind of hurts things, because when we play that queen c2, queen d3 idea, you don't have g6. So very, uh, could be very dangerous here. And now um, Meyer's going to try to trade some pieces, um, make that king side attacking ideas uh, less attractive. You know that Sergei can also try to drop back on positional ideas. So after knight d4, queen d4, we're also looking into the possibility of playing knight d6, which would highlight your backward pawn on d7. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, Sergey leaning more and more in here uh, the, from where he started, but uh, I think he's just focused. I think he's trying to keep himself awake. Again, I think the one thing we could think about as this goes on, I wonder if that fatigue factor being exhausted and then being late in Moscow, I'm not sure what Sergey's normal bedtime is. Uh, if that if that affects things, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, so calm and collected, queen c7, um, if queen d3, he can play, he does want to play the move queen f4, double question mark, knight f6, mm-hmm. um, followed by mate on h7, but he can play something like f5. So that's why yep. um, Sergei prefaced things with knight g3. Now if he plays queen d3, f5 can be met by knight takes f5, and the bishop on e7 is loose. Well, we're about to see that if queen to d3 f5 uh it doesn't happen anymore because we removed that bishop from e7 but i think we're probably still going to see the queen retreat to d3 feels like the most natural square um but but i guess after queen to d3 f5 now if there is no tactic here i guess georg is kind of liking the way he defended right you've got a couple of bishops that look pretty good on the diagonals and that's right that's why sergey instead played queen d2 and if he has the opportunity he'd love to play f5 himself and then um, here he goes. Meyer says, no, thank you. You're not getting F5. 
That's right. Now this move, bishop d3, uh, what's the idea there? Is he trying to um, stick his bishop? Maybe he's anticipating that he's worse. The bishop might be coming to f1 so that he can be defending the g2 pawn in case black tries to get a battery going on the diagonal. Um, he's moved the knight backwards just to protect the, uh, the pawn on on f4. I was just going to say, like, maybe that was, maybe he should have played bishop f1 first because now he has to play f3, which... I felt like the whole purpose of bishop d3, Jen, was so that he could play bishop f1. Uh, but no, you're, that's right, because the pawn f4. So Meyer playing just really accurate chess. The knight has to guard this pawn on f4. And that means that queen to c6 can induce the move f3. And Meyer's playing well, and he's up on time here. I mean, you have to like black's bishop pair, right? Is there some sort of fun checkmate? Jen, check this out. If bishop c5, check. King h1. Do we have queen takes cf3? Oh, that's a good one. I and love then it. Checkmate. Okay, yeah. so not going to happen, but always fun to dream, right? But it it is it is important to highlight those things, even if they don't happen, to everybody, because it just kind of makes you aware of the essence of the position, which is that Black does have the bishop here, and now like, yeah, look at that. Now the king had to go to f1 exactly because of that coming tactic. So you want to be aware of those things, even if they are sometimes just a dream. Because it helps you be aware of kind of the nature of why you know what, what's happening with the with the other moves that are being made. I like Meyer's position. Oh, why a six? Why not keep the a six square open for the bishop? Good Look at okay, he's still okay. But it, I really liked what was happening there. Karyakin's king was in trouble, right? We have this bishop pair for black, but um, now Meyer's just kind of living on the increment, so having to play really fast. Yeah, and he's played this move, rookie 8, hinting at the move e5, but that could also be very dangerous because the f5 pawn is then going to be tender. Okay, I like this move, bringing the bishop into this diagonal, but probably at some point White's just going to be willing to trade off light square bishops. Um, g3, another very solid move by Sergei. He's going to bring the king to g2, yep, and just kind of defend his way out of this. He's down on time. I mean... My, Meyer is too, but I mean, this is this is a real time scramble, people. So buckle up. We could have kind of a photo finish here. <clears throat> e5, e5 coming. Oh, not yet, but e5 might be coming here, and that's going to blow things open. <laughs> that sure will. The blow okay. things open because f5 is also untaken. All those variations. Here he goes. He guards the. I'm telling you, he want he wants e5. It's happening. He's, yeah. he's playing He's playing tickle, which is a good thing because he's gaining time on the clock, everybody. With a two-second increment, the repeating can help there because it, it, you notice he's gaining a little bit of time back to think in case something critical happens. And there it goes. goes. E5. Here we go. Meyer shuffles in his chair, everybody. Meyer is zoning in oh. for a big win. This would be his first win. Well, second, second win is first classical win. Exactly. Yeah. First win in classical chess. And uh, G5 with the idea of G4 looks brutal. They're, here, there comes but H6 king. is falling. Why can't he just take the pawn on H6? I guess he was thinking King G7 and then G4. Ah. Yeah, totally nutty. So he played H3 to stop the pawn coming from G4. Ah, but here comes G4. Meyer is really pressing. And look at the time. For the first time, we see Meyer up on the clock when it matters most. And I think he's going to deliver the goods and oh. get his first classical victory. Wowzers. Very nice. Those two raping bishops stopped um, Sergei from doing anything. Um, there was just a mate by force on h3 or h2. Beautiful victory there by Meyer, who uh, doesn't have a chance to enjoy and take a breath because he's right back in it. And here right. he goes with the Catalan. This was an opening I expected to see a lot of in this match. But it, it, it does bring us to the uh, to a score that is, I guess, back to that, that sort of striking distance we talk about, a magic number of four. I think if you're going to transition to the bullet portion, I've, I've said that five games is kind of too much. For, uh, we've seen, I believe, Irina crush, if I remember correctly, in her, in her death match. It was actually in a position where uh, she was down four games, headed into the bullet portion gen, and came back and won the match. Wow, that's amazing. So it is possible, okay? It can happen. Well, who's been playing quicker? I mean, obviously, obviously, Sergei's been playing faster in that he has time advantages. But when there's a real scramble, who's actually moving their mouse more quickly? And I think that's Meyer. I think you make a that's a great point, right? There's the difference between, you know, I guess so. Uh, there's there's fast uh, calculations and there's speed in terms of your approach, and then there's quickness, just straight up 
who can scramble better and think on their feet when mouse speed is a big factor. And I think that will be one thing that my, we don't know. And Gorg said that for anybody who joined me on Facebook Live before the match, uh, Georg was actually with us, which was fun, and he made some comments when he when we asked him what time control he was looking forward to. He didn't want to go too much into pregame strategy, right, Jen? But he did say that the one big factor will be just how good is Karyakin and Bullet, because nobody really knows. He doesn't play a lot of Bullet. Well, he's not going to be bad. <laughs> I he's certainly not going to be bad at Bullet. I think we can confirm that. <laughs> Although, you know, he... He has lost the only the only other loss was in chess 960, which actually kind of surprised me. I thought that his advantage was going to be even greater in that, just because uh, you know it brings out all that kind of raw chess talent and right. uh, positional skills. But he went down yeah. that game. But but remember, he was also black, right? And he was. I I really feel like the uh, the stats there, even though that game didn't really become a factor because I think Meyer had the first pieces, but uh, he did eventually, you know. He, he was defending most of the game, and maybe that kind of paid off on a practical factor. So we'll see how we'll see how Sergey does when he gets the white pieces in a chess nine sixty game. Okay, we got thirty minutes left here in the three minute portion, Jen. The another, uh, we got another queen trade on offer, and uh, Meyer says no, thank you. I guess he thought that that would be uh, too solid for Black. Knight h five, rinse and repeat. This time uh, we see the idea, but. But okay, just to just to kind of kick that bishop off the diagonal. Now he goes back. So positional point e five, pushing black back. That's a move we don't really want to play because it actually gives black um, access to all the important business squares on uh, d five. Mm -hmm. So I'm show that for the fans right here, as you said, great point. Yeah. So instead, Meyer actually wants to kind of keep the tension in the position. We're looking for opportunities maybe to get a knight e five in the game. And uh, just kind of like tickle our opponent. Yep. And and I think uh, I was just going to say I think we're going to see that because ninety five has some other great things that it does. In fact, opening up the queen on d one to come in. I don't know whether it would be f three or h five, but I start looking at that queen maybe getting getting uh, aggressive over there on the king side. Um, or g four. G4 can come into position as well um, with that h6 pawn kind of sticking out. Yes, it gave you some lift, but it also could give you some problems. Right. Now, uh, Meyer is is in a position where he can play a move like queen g4 now, which just very simply creates a threat of checkmate on g7, but black would stop that with bishop f8, and maybe maybe there's not an obvious follow-up. Uh, he goes for it. Oh, no, he goes. He goes queen f3. Um, doubles, I guess he's trying to put himself in a position where d5 might be possible, right? Exactly, that's right. Trying to trying to figure out a way. Yeah, so he and he always has queen g4 in reserve, right? Well, for instance, right now he can play queen g4, perhaps thinking about uh, the work on d7, perhaps being vulnerable at some point, although it is protected by the queen. Just trying to look for any kind of tactics, because yep. you know, if we're going to get anything in this position, we have to be super precise, because there's a it's it's kind of like a small advantage. What about knight e2 to f4 to h5? I was just going to say maybe we need more pieces on the king side. They know the knight and queen go well together, Batman and Robin. He didn't want to play knight e2, everybody, in that last moment, I believe, because there may be maybe shots with c5 and the king being on this diagonal. So. So perhaps he was just playing some taking some prophylactic measures, puts the king on a safe square. Oh, and f4. He wants the whole thing. He's going for it. He's played f4. Wow. He's going to play f5. That's yeah, aggressive nice, chess. One nice feature about the position for white is that f6 can't be played by black because we would, yep. we would play queen takes e6 with check. So that's one of the reasons we see king h8 here. Now, well, we also, five. if f6 was played, white could just take on f6, right? Because that g7 that pawn too. was pinned. That too, that's, yes. that's partly why I think Karyakin played king h8, but but Meyer goes full steam ahead with f5, and, and the attack is on. Queen f4 is a, a fun trick. I always always want to play for cheapos. It's my first instinct. Play queen play for queen takes h6 because the pawn is pinned, but okay. I don't think we'll see queen f4. I think likely we'll start to see the rooks relocate themselves to the f-file. Um, or, or your move you mentioned earlier. Is, G, is it time for g4, g5? Okay. Meyer says no, but... I'm keeping g4 and g5 in the uh, back pocket here. At, a, at the right moment, we, we still might want to try to play d5 at some moment. Um, okay, so g6, the idea is that the bishop's coming to g7. Uh, that's going to be a, a real great improvement for black in his position. So that's why 
we should be five quickly played. Mm. Um, we, we Maybe Sergey doesn't like that. You see, yeah, he we leans in and shakes his head. Oh. Yeah, he suddenly. Well, I think he suddenly realized that there was a, that was a real problem if he if he traded off the dark square bishops there. Yeah, there might have been an in between move also with queen f four, which would be kind of annoying. Right. So he gives up the exchange, and he was shaking his head in the process, which means he's. He was probably not happy. I don't think there's a lot of psychology that goes on with them thinking that if they do weird camera stuff for us, it's going to throw off their opponent. I mean, I think the fun thing about these webcams, Jen, is we're getting their authentic emotional reaction, right? I mean, we kind of know how they feel. Um, and I think Karyakin feels worse in this position. C5. Ooh. Maybe there's knight to e4 here and then knight f6. I was thinking that too, but I wondered if you go to e4, do you give up the d5 square for black's knight? I ah, right. That is a good point. Because so I, maybe, that, I do want to keep that e5 pawn. I don't want to give that up. Yeah, so he plays rook e2 to, to keep that. He also likes his e5 pawn. And now, uh, does g4 make even more sense? you got to pry open the king and get those rooks active against the, uh, the black king there, or no? No, he plays rook d6, which is also an interesting idea. It pokes at the b6 pawn, also pokes at the 6th rank. Interesting. Here we go. Meyer, is Meyer about to strike and win two games in a row? Jen, can you say comeback, right? Wow. Comeback. <laughs> Who knows, right? This is this is getting... And just in time for the bullet portion, too. That will be, like, really the right time to, to come back because um, no time to breathe. You just got to start yep. playing bullet. Now, this rook d7 move. Yeah, that was interesting. He's going to lose the pawn. Why, why did he? No. What? Oh, e7. I didn't see that. Okay, that's interesting. But he's, he's still losing the pawn. But perhaps the transition into the, into the end game makes it easier for the rook to flex its muscles over the minor pieces, which is often true. Um, okay, but Karyakin is going to do his best to show that he can hold a, a worse end game himself. That's right. I mean, it's annoying that we're losing that b2 pawn by force because if we tried b3, you could have played knight c1. Yep. So, and here I'm worried that from white's point of view, bishop c3, like at the right moment, if we tried to play knight b6, bishop c3, and we're not going to win the a pawn. And we don't well, win the Meyer, a pawn. Meyer is trying to, he's trying to anticipate that, right? Rookie four was yeah. a really accurate move. He's trying to anticipate the need to get rid of that because now if the bishop had come to b4, he would, I think... Does he have moves like knight d5? But maybe not. I guess he could gobble up the a pawn. This is tough. I mean, I mean, I, I would think if the computer, if a computer was defending black, it might be able to hold this end game. But from a human perspective, we'll see if Sergey can do it under time pressure. Well, he does have the time advantage. He's got uh, 26 seconds to about um, 10 seconds here for uh, for Meyer, and he also has the knight. So this move, rook c4, threatens rook c3. So that's why uh, Sergei had to play bishop d6. Mm -hmm. But uh, rook d6, how's that? We always have this. Uh, OK. OK. And now, yeah, I Probably I'm this is just a draw, yeah. Well. Oof. Is there a, the, the real question is, will there be an opportunity at some point for this king to get active enough without allowing the bishop to come back around and attack white's pawns that are stuck on dark squares? Because the issue for everyone is to see white can't just, white doesn't want to just go full steam ahead and play moves like g4 and start trading pawns because every pawn that comes off makes it harder to win the end game. And so, so white is kind of stuck. Oh, he goes g4 now, but, but I think that white's tough position is, do I trade off all my pawns, which is what he's about to do, and he's going to lose his winning chances, or, or would I try to activate the king? And if he activated the king, then his pawns that were stuck on dark squares would have become an issue. So, so I expect this to be a draw, Jen. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a miss by Meyer. But um, still, I mean, since the the terrible start, he's certainly uh, availing and making this match more interesting, not just from the chess perspective, but also from the competitive perspective. Agreed. Uh, still within the striking distance, and like we said. Anything can happen in that bullet contest. If somebody gets Ooh. on a roll. Did you see that trap right there? He played He played king e4. He was hoping Karyakin to blunder and play bishop b4, which would have allowed rook takes b4 and a5. And suddenly white queens the pawn. So that was a very, very sneaky little trick by Meyer that Karyakin did not fall for. 
and but that's kind of key, right? That might help Meyer go on to win. Look at this. He's creating a scenario where because of because of his ability, Jen, to dislodge that bishop's easy protection of the a5 pawn, now he's gonna go get that pawn and, and, and have some real chances. And look at look at Karyakin's time. He agrees based on his actions, which is he's thinking and he doesn't know what to do. Wow. That was a bit of a turnaround. I, we really needed to keep that A pawn. Yeah, that A pawn was key, and that little trick there by by Meyer to um to create that opportunity for a sacrifice is really resourceful and instructive for the fans to to see that. That's sometimes how you win these exchange up end games is you look for a chance to sack into the king and pawn ending at an opportune moment because because the rook himself has a hard time often beating the bishop. So now what though? Oh wait, yeah. Look at that. Look at Karyakin now returning King's coming the favor. Three. Meyer's trying to, to to keep pace by if by being able to meet King G two with King E two. He's gonna do it, but it what's is it enough? Because we can never play rook takes b6 because there's always f1 equals queen. Yeah, and Meyer just kind of shook his head and kind of wow. kind of took a deep breath and just agreed. So Meyer, so still still ends up being the draw we thought was coming, but an impressive and interesting way to reach it. That game definitely had a that was a roller coaster. I mean, uh, we thought that Meyer had the win, and then Sergey defended, and then he had the win again. Uh, but that's the kind of thing you see, and as the time control gets quicker, and we're going to see even more of it when we advance the bullet. So this is something like similar that we saw two games ago. Sergey was white and also played this kind of London um, type system um, with that knight on h5. Uh, this this one has a little bit of a different character with Meyer playing even more solidly. Yep. So now bishop takes f6 and bishop b5 check would be fun for Sergei Karyakin, which would force uh, Meyer's king into the center. So yep. instead, I think um, black is either going to take time to play a move like a6, or in, you played c4 just cutting off the bishop. That's not a move you see that often in these type of configuration because generally black wants to keep the pawn on c5 to keep tension in the position. But in this yep. case, there was a concrete reason for it. Yeah, great point. The, uh, the threat there, everybody, as Jim was saying, to destroy black's right to castle kind of forced Meyer's hand into c4. But, but I, I do like white in these structures once that extension has happened, Jim, because I think it's only a matter of time before white can kind of orchestrate e4, which is going to start to undermine this pawn chain. Um, you know, one of the ways that a pawn chain like this could work out if you were playing black for everybody at home would be if you could really, if you could get really aggressive in the direction of your river here and just kind of get the pawns flowing and, and really aggressive on the queen side. But if you don't have the time to do that, what ends up happening is your structure is so stuck that white can kind of undermine the center. I think Karyakin's going to play moves like bishop g2, try to get e4 in and kind of either open things up or create an undermining. Although h5, look at that. So Meyer, Meyer's trying to not make that, you know, just straightforward plan so easy. Hmm, h4, and this is almost like a bullet game. Is he going to play h3? <laughs> <laughs> Crazy stuff. Gosh, if you, had to pick, if you had to pick white or black in this position, who would you pick, Danny? I still like white because I'm I'm biased toward the opportunity to undermine the center, but I am realizing that bishop g2 not only would walk into h3, but it might also walk into bishop d3 by black. Ooh. You know, if you remove your bishop from this diagonal, so so maybe it's a little bit harder for Karyakin to have a straightforward way um, than we thought. Okay, bishop comes to d6. Is he going to trade and play f4? Yep, he is. He's going to play f4 and. Look at that space. This is like uh, Swiss cheese. A lot of holes in this cheese. Holes everywhere. Uh, Nobody's favorite type of cheese. No, sure. Swiss cheese. Thank you for saying that. I've always felt pressure to, to like Swiss cheese. But you were right. Swiss cheese is just not. By the way, one of the things I haven't been doing a very good job of is congratulating our guessers, Jen. We have so many people observing these games, not just on Chess TV and on Twitch, but on Chess.com, you can guess the move. Uh, and... We've had a, a consistent performer, Emperor L, uh, won the last game with 21 out of 57 correct guesses. Uh, but there's a ton of other people playing Guess the Move. If you log into chess.com and just follow this game, maybe one of our staff members can give a link directly to following this match. 
and you can guess the move, which is a lot of fun. And I also see that in uh, the chess.com chat, you, ha you have uh, Hikaru Nakamura chatting, giving some of his opinions on uh, the, the games in the end game and the last game. So that's a lot of fun Great. as well. Yep. Always a good reason to hang out in the chess TV chat because you never know who might show up. And uh, Hikaru is a pretty entertaining follow, so it's always fun to hear his thoughts. Um, bishop to e2. I, I still like White's position long term. But uh, but this is not a very orthodox position, right? This is kind of a this is kind of a weird little structure here. F six, I like it. Rook G one now. Maybe maybe just play Rook G one, and I'd like to play Knight F three if I'm white, but I don't want them to play Bishop B four and get rid of my Knight. Yeah. So I, I kind of like Rook G one to just hold on to the grip there. That's a very instructive point, that in this position, you really want to keep your knight, so you don't want to allow knight f3 and then bishop b4, indeed. I love that idea. What, what is his goal here? I don't understand Karyakin's... I, I like rook g1 a lot better. I feel like this this is an improvement for for Meyer to have the king on e7, and maybe now he can play rook a to g8. So something, I'm, something I don't understand there, which to Hikara will be a big surprise, right? Danny doesn't understand a chess concept, so... Um, but, uh, okay, so B6 now. I, I, I really do like the way this went for, for Meyer, actually. And now, now Karyakin castling. Interesting. Thinking that he can just put his king on H1 and that it would be perfectly safe there. And then maybe we can rest the G file with rook G1. Yeah, yeah, good point. Ooh, using a rook on A2 to defend B2 doesn't seem fun. But on the other hand, he's trying... Um, at some point, he might be, have, be able to take on a5 himself. So... Yeah. There we get one open file. Well, the g file's open. He does eventually get that rook to g1, just not as directly as I was thinking. But, but you're right. He does have this king now safe on h1, and... Meyer has 38 seconds, so that's not ideal. And speaking of which, that makes me think I should probably check in on the total time remaining in the three-minute portion, and that is indeed under 15 minutes now. So uh, that means we have this one, and probably we get two more three-minute games before we move into Chess 960, and then it is on, like Donkey Kong, in the bullet portion. Don't go anywhere, everybody. If you're just tuning in, shame on you. Where is that you your going? favorite part, Bullet? I mean, in, in a close match, yes. I mean, in, in some of the matches we've had, like obviously we saw Hikaru kind of running away with the last match versus Sergei Gregorians. Um, and, and sometimes in a lopsided match, the bullet is kind of just an opportunity to have a little fun, and it's, it's not as exciting. But in a close match, I mean, if the gloves are coming off and it's actually winnable for both players, then yeah, the bullet is just the best place to be. All right, uh, now I'm starting to feel like more anxious here about uh, about Black about King. And I was going to say, but White also, we're getting this double-edged scenario, right, where we've got two kings and uh, one on one diagonal and another on an awkward position on F7. So, you know, if White could just pull a bug house and plop this knight on D2 on E5 or G5, then White probably wins. But if White can't get an attack, I'd be worried about my king on H1 as well. So that's why we, it's funny, we really need to get that, uh, that knight on c4 so we can play knight e5 check. Mm -hmm. And rook a4 is a very nice way to do that, actually. I didn't see that coming, because now knight c4, I was thinking, can black play rook takes b2? But if he does, knight takes c4 comes in, and that just, yeah, so instead queen to d7 is played, and wowzers. Okay, so Meyer's going to try to hold the c-pawn and deny that knight access into e5, but something tells me that... The Karyakin is, uh, is, just, is about to strike back here. He hasn't won a game here in a few games, so I think Meyer is... Ooh, the queen trade. That could help. That could help Black hold this. That's big time. The knight comes into e5, but can Black get enough compensation? Wait yeah, a second. It's not as devastating can... as it would be in the middle game, having that knight on e5, right? Yeah, for sure. And now the f4 pawn is a problem. Karyakin is going to play a little tickle here, give a little check, but uh, wait, wait, he's going to go for, he's sacrificing e6 for b2, but he thinks he'll have an attack on the black king to justify that, and Meyer agrees, so he retreats the knight. Uh, interesting, rook g6, hitting c6, or hitting e6. 
Somebody's going to make a blunder here. We just don't know who. Ah, the Rooks. They flip the script and come together for a kingside mating net. And, and I think Meyer's going to lose one. And just like, yeah, I think, I think he just had no choice there. I mean, he was... Look at that. We had a thousand plus observers. That may be the most we've had all time in an instant game there. And we had more than, we had hundreds of people playing Guess the Move that time, Jen. I think my shout out maybe helped, but look at that. We have title players near the top of the list of Guess the Move. So everybody who's enjoying these games, um, wow. And I think, uh, I think Sergei Karyakin has a bit of a Russian following. What do you think? Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, <laughs> you got to love watching him play. And despite the time zone, uh, people up late watching chess. That's what we like to see, Danny. Well, speaking of the time zone, I do want to make a quick shout out. Obviously, we have a, a small breather here, given that um, they're just starting the opening. But I want to remind everybody that tomorrow, the time and place to be is right here once again, May 25th at 10 a.m. We have Wesley So, the uh, highest rated player in America making his speech as chess champion, championship debut, a 2,800 plus player against Anish Giri, who, uh, despite what you may have heard, is, is also one of the hottest players on the planet, winning a lot of games recently in Reykjavik. Um, so Anish Giri versus Wesley So, Jen and I kind of previewed this match yesterday, and I just want to remind everybody that tomorrow is where it's going down on Chess TV, May 25th. So we're doing back-to-back -back speech chess championship matches, Jen, for the first time ever with that match going down tomorrow. Well, I'll certainly be watching that one as well, Danny. I'll be looking forward to your uh, your commentary um, with Chespra. Mr. Amon Hamilton. But we'll be having you back soon. Um, I forget our schedule, but you will be back here uh, right alongside me for one of the next matches and, and probably in many more after that. This has been a lot of fun. And I Anyway, but yes, tune in tomorrow. Me and Amon Hamilton, the Chespra, will have the call. I think he hasn't shaved yet, so that's kind of weird, but we're hoping he makes his GM title so he can shave. Um, oh, he's wow. got a super. He's got a superstitious bet going on where he's not shaving until he makes GM. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's a that's a, that's a great one. And if he has a girlfriend who hates facial hair, then 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 it's really then there's really a lot of pressure, right? That's home life pressure, which is that's different than professional pressure. Super motivation. And we we've, we've got the the chat really popping on chess.com with uh, Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura saying that Swiss cheese is actually totally fine, and we are wrong about. Yet another thing in this match. Hey, Carl, I love you, buddy, but it's just no. No, Swiss cheese is not the best kind of cheese. I mean, I would prefer, I, I mean, I would prefer goat cheese over Swiss cheese. I mean, but I love Munster, um, provolone. Swiss is good on Rubens, and that's about it. Indeed. It, it, it's just kind of like fat with no taste. <laughs> I agree totally. So and luckily Robert for us. He, he points out that this match is closer than it looks. And I got to agree with Robert in that, in that uh, just both players playing fantastic. Um, Sergey usually getting the best of it. But I, I think against uh, some other opponents, uh, you know, Meyer really is going to learn from this and just get even better at this, these uh, quick formats. Agreed. It is a five-game lead, but I agree with Robert. And for those who haven't been here the whole time, you wouldn't know. But we've had a lot of close games very similar styles. These guys are kind of two heavyweight technicians going at it. Very solid pr approaches to chess. But uh, Bakaryakin's obviously he's been five games better. I mean, you know, the score does matter. And so if Meyer can keep it close, he's hoping to make a big comeback in the bullet. Um, I'm guessing we'll see one more three-minute game even before the chess 960 game, Jen. Um, I, I, I would imagine this game will end in time to get one more classical three-minute game with eight minutes on the clock before we head to the final half-hour bullet. So what do we have here? We've got eight minutes click, ticking away. We've got Karyakin with uh, a nice knight on d4. I gotta admit, I like that, right? That's a nice knight. And That's knight, a nice knight. And this move king h8, um, making it so that when we do play this this rook g1 move, just uh, uh, rook g8 is one way to defend mate, and we can also just play bishop h5. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which one he'll want to do, whether it's move the bishop or uh, be a little more solid and swing that rook to g8. Something tells me he'll play rook g8, um, worrying about maybe the precarious position of the bishop on h5. Yeah, he, he agrees, but but he, he took a few seconds to do it, and this is what Meyer needs. We know Meyer needs to stay close in terms of time, and speaking of staying close, Sergey keeps scooting closer to the camera. I always try to capture the camera area to be a little bit full picture, because I know these guys will scoot more and more in the more nervous and intense they get. But we are seeing an up-close-and-personal Sergei Karyakin. I don't think we've ever gotten a chance to see him this close. 
even in uh, even in over the board tournaments or in post game interviews. So knight d5, that that move, uh, trying. The problem is, I'm, I'm trying to make some kind of sacrifice in some position. Uh, I'm trying to think of some way, maybe. To well, I'm trying to make e3 work, and I was going to say you might be right, Jen, because if you can play e3, you might get your sacrifice on f6. That's right. I'm hoping to play e3 and knight takes f6, and uh, that could be really devastating. So maybe we're going to have to interpret. Do we have do we have time to interpolate bishop takes d5? No, because then. After bishop takes d5, the rook on g8 is hanging. Yeah, this is uh, this is nutty. I think Meyer might be uh, in a decent position here. Look at the time. Time tells us that that Meyer's Meyer's in the driver's seat as well. These people, the the players at this level, don't take this kind of time unless unless they need to think. Everybody, and so that kind of tells you that Karyakin doesn't quite know what to do here. His time is ticking away. Yeah, I mean, I guess he after knight d five, the move before he was forced to maybe take it and move the rook. I don't, I don't know yeah. because this this just looks devastating. Yeah, Meyer getting a little bit of a head bob going there. That's a that's almost a Hikaru head bob. Listen to some music, Hikaru head bob number thirteen. Hikaru knows that one. So now, um, so he he felt like that knight takes f six sacrifice was just too devastating. Yeah, so absolutely. That that would have been. Everybody, that would have been fun to see if the knight moves. Here comes knight takes f6, and the reason, everybody, is that this bishop on this diagonal is just nasty. So uh, so that is exactly why Karyakin has had to sacrifice the exchange. But here there's queen d5 check, mm -hmm. followed by, um, I guess, followed by bishop d4, but I guess, he, I guess you're going to play queen f7. So that's why he started with bishop d4. But if queen f7, can I just take d6? Yes, yeah, that's true. So that maybe... No, I think you're. I think you're right. I mean, queen d5 looks natural, and if and if the king has to move because, as we said, queen f7 would hang the bishop, then let's just go gobble, gobble, gobble on d4. Why? Why is Meyer thinking here? What's the? What's the? I guess he's considering queen a8 first, maybe. Yeah, maybe he sees a faster um, victory in some line. Mm. Maybe he sees. Uh, um, starting with rook c2, I, I don't know, but yeah, he did. He did finally play queen d5. Yeah, he goes for it. I'm wondering why he took so long. To me, that seemed a, a slight practical miscue, but I guess he's still in the driver's seat. Meyer, Meyer is. So he he did play rook c2. So rather than play queen d4, he's trying to win this game um, in an e even easier fashion with the threats of like rook c6. Um, that's why uh, Sergey hustled back with rook e7. And now suppose we play rook c1, increasing the pressure. No, instead uh, Meyer increased the pressure with rook c6. Note, okay, so bishop c5. Yeah, he's, he's going to trade, but... Uh... The bishop's not stable over there on c5, though. Eventually we, we can have an opportunity to cut it out yeah with a3 and b4 although although right now he's kind of holding them for it although you could probably play a3 right because if the bishop takes it you get the b6 pawn so it's a an eye for an eye as they say but uh i don't think meyer even wants that Meyer, meyer wants to keep bringing pressure and get that king active here comes king g4 king g4 he can't put it on e4 we'd like to but then rook e5 yeah. check would be kind of embarrassing right good point for everybody there always be aware of tactics there um but Okay, Karyakin plays h5. That is, that is a nice practical shot because it forces taking. If the if the king had gone to f4, everybody there would have been bishop to d6 check. Yikes. That would have been yikes. So so Karyakin is is holding, but he's also still down to 10 seconds. And one blunder gets him mated really because here come the two rooks getting active together. Am I gonna? In fact, why not? Why not just rook e8 and then h5? Keep that king in a mating net and try to mate him on the h8 square. In fact, he's going to go for it. I like this idea of rookie eight because White has h five coming. Hold the hold the phone. Somebody's going to be in a mating net here soon. Karyakin is really down on time. He's got five seconds um, to to Meyer six. He's living off the increment, but I, I I'm actually a little skeptical of Meyer's choice to go away from that net. I feel like that was the best chance to get the blunder to happen. And what's what's Meyer doing over there with the king? In fact, I think he agrees that it kind of shuffled there. I don't. I don't think he made the right decision there, Jen. That was, that was not right to leave the mating net and bring the king to the queen side. 
Yeah, because now Sergei is holding on to everything somehow. Yeah. The problem is that Bishop on c5 is just so solid now that the pawn on a3 is removed. We have no way to take advantage of it. Yeah, and back, back in this scenario here, I felt like we were, and, and there goes the draw by repetition, but, you know, didn't have time to back up, but I was going to show people it was just, it seemed pretty clear that that uh, Karyakin was going to have a really hard time defending those mating threats. I'm a little surprised Meyer didn't be more aggressive there, but okay. And apparently the, Meyer missed a win earlier also. I'm seeing in the chat that there was a rook takes f6 idea that would have won him the game. But let's go okay. on and move on to the next game. We've seen this opening before. We've got a French, we've got a Rubenstein, another castle short by... Um, Karyakin, and what often happens in these games is that White develops some attacking chances based on the fact that that Bishop on C2, uh, a little bit of faster development with um, Black uh, still yet to castle. Agreed, and we only have a minute left. The players are being informed by our official uh, events manager at chess.com, Mr. Pete. He's letting them know this is the last game, and after this, the Chess 960 will start automatically, which is exciting. Our second Chess 960 game looks like it will also pair Meyer with the white pieces, which will give Karyakin a guaranteed white. The rules are that if the if the timing of the games works out, Jen, where someone gets two whites in Chess 960, even if Meyer is black in the last bullet game, um, Karyakin is guaranteed to get at least one white in the Chess 960 portion. So that is a, a rules update. Um, Anyway, well, interesting, right? Yeah, so Meyer has been close, hasn't been able to convert on a couple of those. If he somehow won this game, Jen, and even struck in the chess 960, though, this is not over, right? We're talking about a match that is totally within striking distance, given that they're going to get about a dozen bullet games in. Oh, right. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And, and of course, Sergei Karyakin's using his mouse for the first time ever, so... <laughs> that's right, yeah. Uh, maybe using a, mou a mouse for the first time ever, not just this mouse, right? Who knows uh, with uh, Sergei... Playing, uh, he played. A, he tweeted a lot of pictures playing on Chess.com this week, um, and was always using a touchpad. So we gave him a word of advice that he may want to get a pick up a pick up a mouse. Set All right, your auto queen on, guys. Cause... Get your auto queen on. And uh, we, you and I talked in the preview show yesterday about how quickly we would see the first the first computer blunder, right? The mouse slip, or the uh, or the auto queen, and we haven't seen any yet. So these guys have been real pros in terms of being prepared to play online. Well, this is a very strange um, development. It looks like uh, uh, Meyer suddenly has a very good position. He's got the two bishops, and uh, I don't, I don't think that this is like some kind of a brilliant idea of uh, having the AF file and having IG five attacks because I think that um, George should be able to defend against those. Maybe he can even try. Dare I say? Um, I was thinking about it? trying to castle queen side here, but <laughs> oh, I, I thought you were going to say h5 because that's what I wanted to try because we, we were obsessed with pushing Harry the h pawn before and here he goes. Harry's coming. He's going to play uh, h4. Look at that. Just push it. Push the pawn. Wait, why does king g2 help? That move, I, I'm not quite it's under... Self, self pins the knight. I agree. Simon Williams would be having a party right now with, with Harry the h pawn's activity. Um I think you're right about Castles Long, Jen. I think there's a good chance we see an H3 check and a Castles Long. And Sergei, Sergei's not really happy with his position. You can tell with that little kind of shrug there. He's not really thrilled with his position here. Well, remember the other loss that uh, Karyakin had in this type of position where the bishop on b7 and the bishop on c5 coordinated so well. So I can see an h3, a queen side castles, and an f5 coming in right. um, and uh, some real pain points there for uh, Sergei Karyakin. But... You know, this is not a position you can solve. Meyer has to make a move quickly. and he So decided... he takes on G3. I, I, I was thinking that that might be interesting as well, just, just because of the fact that now at least there's an open H file. So he goes for this immediate threat on, on G3, but I think the H file, who knows whether that'll be better than the pawn on H3, but he decided that he wanted that activity rather than the potential light square kind of net. That's right, and uh, E5 is not ever possible because there's always this bishop takes E5. So yeah. that's kind of an irritation um, for Sergey. And officially, the 3-2 portion is over, as everyone can see here from the scoreboard. Uh, that means that right after this game, win, lose, or draw, we will have Chess 960. So get ready for the fun. Um, and uh, down on time, Meyer, Meyer needs to remember that, that that's, that's something he wants to avoid, even though he is definitely better in this position, as, as we both kind of like Black's Bishop pair and and the potential pressure that that's exerting over here on the king. 
Yeah, so what does White have going for him? I don't know. He's going to try to bail out, maybe play Rook H1 here and just get pieces off the board, but then he loses the G3 pawn. So, so that would have been... Uh, Knight e4 does attack e6, but now your diagonal is wide open. And uh, I, I'm looking at the move f5. Yep. And how do we get our, how do we rescue our king? You know, it seems like any square we put it on is kind of uh, giving us problems, right? Because we need to hold on to the g3 pawn. Right. And we can't really put it on h2 because that's on the open h file. Right. So f5 yep. in the air. Agree totally, and I think Sergey does as well. His time is sort of dwindling now because um, he, he, I think he doesn't quite know what his plan is in this scenario. Brings the queen to the diagonal, and Georg says, no more thinking about this F5 move that Jen has been suggesting. I'm just going for it. Uh, but look we at that. Tickling the, the, the rook on A28. But, but it leaves the G-pawn behind, so now the queen needs to fix that. And come back, and and the queen still has to deal with what what Georg's last move was, which was f five to open up the king. I mean, this feels like a game that Meyer is putting himself in in good position to win. So if he can do that and and strike in chess nine sixty, we will have a match headed into bullet. That is for sure. Now, at some at some point, you know, you always have to worry about the fact that in the end of the variation, the pawn on g three is hanging, right? So. Bishop e4, queen e4, um, bishop takes g3, is in the position. But then there's there's also, okay, he chose not to do that because I guess he thought that uh, all the tension would be released in the position then and white would well, be able to... Uh, well, Meyer fight. was shaking his head there. I don't know why. I think, he, I think he actually just missed this whole idea where white brought the bishop to e4 and forced the exchange. Meyer was not happy with the transition, and, and I can see why. Suddenly the tables are turning, and, and Sergei is... Sergey's bringing the heat. There's threats like queen e3 check, and and uh, and this king has problems. If only we have time to just play e5 and e4, we can rest back the initiative. Right. But right. In the Rook meantime, d6. Such an accurate move. That was so nice because now now queen e3 check is really devastating. That might force queen c5, but then even before you have Meyer shaking his head because if the queen moves anywhere, he goes queen c5, but. But now there's both rook d7. The knight is unpinned. Wow, Sergei recognizes quickly this opportunity to bring the knight to a stronger square. I think I think I think Meyer goes down and a huge win here for Karyakin if he can flip flip this one around just like he's about to. So knight d2, what a what a move. The idea being knight e4 and you're shut out of the a7 to g1 diagonal, and then we yep. get to play queen e3 check and a6 hands. So, so tough. Here he goes. Brings the knight in, and now Georg is sort of kicking himself for being impatient in the position and having played f5 and trade the light square bishops. Now he's, now he's under the gun, and Sergey still hasn't blinked. Well, he did blink, but, but uh, a tough, a tough one. Tough one. Looks like this is going to be here for Georg. Oh, that knight coming into c5 and resigns Sergey Karyakin, extending his lead as we go into the. Um, 960 portion, which was one of uh, the two wins. Well, wow. I mean, that's all I can say again. I mean, we see Karyakin under pressure, but it doesn't matter, Jen. He's, he gets out of it, right? Yeah. That was that was definitely an impressive one. I mean, yeah, I think there were like some, some tactics there where he was managed to play this bishop e4 idea, the queen h5 tickle, and somehow couldn't coordinate on the light squares um, to stave off the pressure that was mounting with f5 and, and bishop... Uh, B7, but let's take a look and see what kind of chess 960 we have. This one looks very aggressive. One of the things about chess 960 is that a lot of the time it's about the configuration of the bishops. And with these two bishops on uh, A1 and B1, they're kind of like already developed. Um, so I think that we might see some slashing attacks in this 960 battle. Yeah, I, it's it's weird when you get the two bishops like that. You feel like you spend so much time in real chess games, right, Jen? Trying to get your bishops lined up like that. Like, you know, and, and then in chess 960, it just happens sometimes. Um, but, right, like but, last game, um, Gorg spent a lot of time playing bishop, B7, bishop b7 and bishop c5, right? And right. those were beautiful. Yeah, you try to get those two bishops lined up, and, and, here, and here you have that. And now Gorg opens the center, which I think is correct. He's going to have a small space advantage having this pawn on c4 and, you know, maybe even has a Maroxy bind type structure he can try for with e4 at some point. Um, so again, I think white has an advantage here. I think that this is a, 
This is a a good position, a good starting position for White in a Chess 960 game, having this small lead in development. We'll see what they do with the Kings, right, Jen? We've got these Kings with the Rooks, right? That's just... Uh, Epaulette. Feels like a smothered mate waiting to happen over there, right? It's just <laughs> totally, totally weird to have the King and Rook so so close to each other. Yeah, that's why they call those mates with if you get if you mate the king like that, it's called an epaulette mate, and it's supposed to be like the king um, trapped by its own shields. Like the rooks, right. the rooks are basically the shield. Right. I love that bit. Here, here the uh, the d five strike shows that Karyakin is trying to return the favor and also have an open center, and suddenly it actually looks like Sergey is is in a decent position. He's got the lone center pawn, so hashtag make Aaron Nimzovich proud. You know, he's got the center pawn here, and uh, and Georg's, Georg's pawn on E2 isn't so happy. That's a long hashtag, Nanny. <laughs> you know, it's sometimes you go with the long hashtag just for irony. You know, <laughs> you don't you always expect... the words, though? You don't always expect it to catch on, right? You just you go with hashtag just to kind of get the emphasis. So. <laughs> Make Aaron Nimzovich proud. Not a hashtag I've used. I use lightly. Um, queen to d2 comes in. White is, don't forget, White could castle long here, Jen. He could he could he could play king to c1, rook to d1 on the next move. Ah, oh, very nice. So that's just a fun little. I mean, it'd be, it seems super dangerous, right? You wouldn't want to put your king over here on this open file, but it is, it is possible. So must be noted. Now you got to play f3. I assume there's just no other way to deal with that threat, and and then who castles long? Could be black. No, not quite. But, but okay, F3 comes, and uh, and my, my theory about white being so much better in the chess 960 will, will maybe be debunked in this game, because this just, currently I've, I've loved the, the transition Karyakin's gotten here with good control over the center. Yeah, it's really weird to see this position without any knights. Like, it feels like there should be knights on the board for some reason. Right. Well, it's because we're you know we're looking at a position where there really hasn't been uh, any any kingside development, and yet the knights are gone somehow. Exactly, oh, it, it feels kind of freaky, right? Like you look right. at it and you're like, something's wrong, but I don't know what it is. Right. <laughs> that's, well, he's, he's, that's what Chess Nine Sixty is all about, though, kind of challenging your strategic assumptions about chess. And both players are going to castle here. I think that Karyakin will probably do the same. Um, just saw a funny thing. Haggard, Haggard, CC in the Chess TV chat said the rook jumped. Uh, he was. Uh, it's just funny. Maybe he wasn't aware of, of that. I wonder. I wonder if Karyakin is also not aware of of how to get castled in Chess Nine Sixty because, um, because he hasn't done it and he didn't do it last game either. So that's a interesting query. I. I mean, I. I could be wrong. I mean, certainly E four makes a lot of sense. And uh, but I'm wondering. <clears throat> I think that I I think that you got to be wrong about that. Come on, he had to at least. I, I hope I'm wrong. Obviously, I just always get worried. You know that maybe maybe there's something that you know something non people, non. People do sometimes forget, but uh, it, I think maybe it's like the the fact that it's so weird they kind of forget. But wait a second, what's this move? Queen C two. Okay, so it it attacks um, C six. So we uh -huh. don't have time to take on F three um, because. Unfortunately, because Sergei is not castled, there's going to be some tactics on the back rank after we take the the bishop on e3. So, takes on f3, queen c6, queen c6, rook c6, rook e3. There's a mate. That doesn't change. So he decides to guard the bishop. Um, kind of agrees, but but maybe now, I mean, does York risk? Does he brave the adventure of double isolated e pawns and take? I, I, it feels weird to do that. More logical seems a move like rook to d1, and then we'll really find out if Sergey knows how to castle because <laughs> yes. that would be the only. Okay, he goes for it. We're gonna find out right now. Jorg might be playing the chess 960 rules gambit, and I'm wrong. It's good when Danny's wrong. It's a good world. Not um, the last time, right? It, it uh, certainly not the last, and, and far from the first. And uh, so there you go. Um, the they have united the rooks and. Uh, and game on. Black is better again, right, after that castles. I think the person who's saying that uh, the rook keeps jumping is actually joking. So I, I think he is too, but it's just uh, pretending to be shocked. 
I'll, I'll be curious to see Guess the Move in Chess 960. I wonder how many people play Guess the Move in that, although now, now we're looking at something that's much closer to a real chess position besides one highly illegal fact, which is that this bishop is on b1 and not f1, given that white has not moved any pawns. So other than that illegal illegal uh, thing, the, this, is, this is, looks like a normal chess game. So, when are we, so we, we can't take on f3 because of checkmate, <laughs> but otherwise right. it would be a really good move. <laughs> Maybe he's going to do it now. That's actually an opportunity now, right, Jen? Now, if he takes it, white takes the exchange, but the queen takes with tempo, and suddenly black is getting compensation. You know Karyakin is calculating that right now. Look at his eyes moving a mile a minute. That's falling true. Falling down the time. C C6 is hanging. I, I knew that. he was going for it. You could tell it was coming, right? Here he goes. There's a lot of tactics to consider here because C6 is also hanging, but um, bishop f2 played. And, no, and he quick. saw that he could get out of it with tempo. I think I think he was calculating a mile a minute and, and, and saw this opportunity. I think he'll take on G2 now. No, even better. He has a switch with the queen, and he gets a mating attack. So now white is going to be... Bishop G3 doesn't help. because you No, can... he's losing the exchange. And so, wow, and Meyer is frustrated. That is a tough one. What a... What a nice combination there by Karyakin, right? That was a highlight reel right there. I mean, that was amazing to see him calculate quickly, swindle his way to a uh, to an exchange sacrifice victory. And I wonder how deeply he had calculated that before he even took on F3, Jen. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, we, we saw the idea, but it was like to actually calculate that um, in such a quick time control, absolutely brilliant because there were so many different um, webs to that line. I, I got to love yep. it. And it, it came, and you guys, this is how you find good tactics. You say, man, I wish, I really wish I could play takes an F3, but there's made in one. And then right. as soon as they, they take the, uh, the lever off that made in one, you play your tactic. Right. No, great point. And that's why you always want to be aware of those things. And it's okay to dream, right? You, you become aware of this is what I would really like. And sometimes you can make it work. You can actually deflect a piece or do other things. And in this case, um, Karyakin saw the opportunity as soon as Meyer lifted, lifted up that threat of mate and, and did it. And, and Georg is frustrated. Obviously, if we head over to the, uh, to the score here, uh, Jen, we have a, uh, the end of the 3-2 portion, including Chess 960, brings us to a seven-game lead for Sergei Karyakin. Uh, so your thoughts. It's, this is a tough match, and I think it's been a really instructive and exciting chess. But right now, Georg is up against it heading into the bullet. I, I love it. I'm really enjoying the chess 960 and uh, the the bullet. We're going to have to fasten our seatbelts and see if uh, Meyer is able to tighten this match um, with very fast play. We'll know quickly. I think, uh, you know, the bullet will be a little revealing. As you said, I don't think, we don't know how good Sergey's going to be a bullet, but we don't think he's going to be bad, right? <laughs> and so we'll know quickly if Jorg can, can strike back and, and start getting some victories and... Uh, as the players are uh, taking a little bit of a break right now, we check in. Sergey has stepped away for the first time. Um, Georg, is, Georg is back, but uh, was just sort of taking a sip of water, as Jen is doing. And, uh, and Yeah, we well, I think that um, some beautiful chess here by Sergey Karyakin. I mean, I, I've been really spellbound by some of his technique and his tactics. I... I got to I got to really give him a lot of credit in this match. Totally. I've been very impressed with Sergey Karyakin's play. I mean, I guess we shouldn't be surprised reigning World Blitz champion, but it's uh it's it's just it was it's been so accurate. I think we've seen one blunder, you know, and I don't even know what the evaluations would be. I know that there's been some people in the chat telling us that Georg has missed some wins. We know he had some pressure. He was up the exchange in a couple games, couldn't quite convert. So, you know, I mean, obviously he's had some chances to keep it closer, but now a seven-game deficit, he better start converting, and yesterday if he's going to make this a match. So, and on that note, I think we are about to get started as soon as Sergey comes back. Uh, even if he doesn't, the games will start at the, at the three-minute ending. Right now, neither player is really even sitting down. Um, the games start in less than a minute, according to our official events manager. Beautiful. Jen? And we're getting like some great comments in here. People are all um, talking about um, how it, how exciting the match has been and analyzing some of these games. 
Um, well, good. I hope they found it instructive. I think that uh, you've done an awesome job, and we've tried to make sure we point out all the opportunities that were being taught lessons by these great players. And uh, I think that's what makes it really fun to see the level of quality chess they're able to play, even in short time controls. So, and, and the things we can learn from watching them play, right? Yeah, and I love to see people observing this from all over the world and uh, giving their insightful commentary. Um, it's it's really a, a pleasure. The Speed Chess Championships, um, it's a great idea, and uh, everyone's going to be joining us tomorrow as well. So and here as, we go. As, we got another as, French bullet. There it chat. goes. First bullet game has started. Did It was going to do a quick shout-out here, remind you, be here tomorrow for the next match. But no rest for the weary. Time to move right back to the scenario on the board, which is now one-minute chess. Uh, and uh, uh, Sergei Karyakin sitting in the initial seat that I actually captured him on. So you can see that. that. That was the camera view that we had Sergey in, and he's been very intense and leaned in and focused. So, uh, but there you go. So, and here he goes. He's, he's going to lean in again here. Um, Meyer, got to do something in bullet. This is his chance. Um, he is, and I am uh, a couple seconds late there on the clock. About looks like about 40 seconds late on the clock, but officially we have less than 30 minutes before this match is over. And it's it's another end game, which we've seen such a fine play from Sergey in other games. Uh, king King come to e2. Both kings are in the center. This one seems a little drier than a lot of the other end games we saw. Where I agree, there seemed to be a lot more to play for. Especially White was usually having the advantage in most of those end games. Um, this, though, I, I don't really see anything for White. And we answered our question about who's going to be the faster player in the bullet portion. It looks like Sergey's way behind time. Yeah. And we'll see if that pattern continues or if Sergey realizes, oh, wait, got to speed up. This is bullet now. But, okay, one thing we recognize, okay, White has this three-on-two pawn majority. That's one potentially long-term advantage for White, normally a faster majority than Black's. But, but Black really, that's really not going to be a factor here. Black is already fighting for equal control over the only open file. Um, I expect this one to be, really, this is probably just going to be a draw unless, unless uh, one player gets under time pressure and blunders. Yeah, um, surprising beginning. Uh, Meyer trying to get a bit active here with the king. Sergey leaning back, wondering um, what happened. Yeah, he's not sure how to make progress here. Is he really going to try for g4? I guess not. He's going to kind of shuffle and see who wants to play for a win. Maybe the players just say, well, that was a boring game. Let's do it again. Uh, but no, not yet. Okay, we get a trade. And who's going to be better than the king upon ending? That's always an instructive question to ask for the members, right? If we did get a king upon ending, what does that change about the scenario? And look at these mysterious rook moves, Danny. Rook yeah. H1 and rook G8. And speaking of uh, Nimzovich, these like quiet rook moves. Yep. Another one, rook C1. Well, this one makes a little bit more sense uh, to me. Uh, at least he's threatening C4. Yeah, he was anyway. And black, black said, no, thank you. And maybe now he'll bring the rook to C8 or D8. Both those moves, I think, prevent C4. But hey, is Black um, a little bit better now? No, I guess not after rookie one. I was thinking we might be able to get this E4 check in. in, in but no, but he is because of uh, what? He has King E5 check in Ermizzo. Look at that, everybody. Such a sweet idea of takes. Wow. He has King discovered check instead of taking back, and then he recaptures the pawn, and he's in a phenomenal scenario with the extra pawn. Quite the swindle by Meyer, and he's going to use it as a means to get his king active. Sergey's worse here, and his time tells us that he's worse because he's about to flag. Living yeah. off the increment, literally. It is now 1-1, one, one, everybody. No longer a two-second increment, but only a single second, um, which is, well, that's different, right? And, and look that he's gonna, coming to B3, yikes. Well, he's going to take A3, and then, and then I think that pass pawn should be enough for Meyer to get this win. I will be shocked, shocked here if Meyer doesn't get this win, given how low on... Oh, but time, look at that. Oh, oh no, Car... Oh no! How George. did that happen? No, did Meyer shaking no. his head. Did he have some kind no. of internet issue there? Because he's no, no, he didn't. He just, he just didn't realize he was flagging. He just shaking his head and kind of smiled, and there was no lag there. He just flagged. Wow. That that's always disappointing, and you can see both these guys have four bars in their connection. If you look right next to their little diamond membership. They've got that, that, that little, uh, like a little cell phone bar tells you. Usually if you see two or three, you know someone's on a slow connection. But these guys are crisp. They got four full bars there and really unfortunate for Georg. 
Wow, that was a big game right there, Jen. That was, I mean, that was a, okay, one last chance to go for this match, right? You win the first bullet game. He played a phenomenal game and then lost a winning position on time. Yeah, and of course, um, I mean, I like both of these players, but I think a lot of people were kind of rooting for, for Meyer there because you're rooting for the match to get closer, for there to be like some chance for him to come back. Right. Um, so yep. a, a little disappointing, I think, for everybody watching, um, except big Sergey fans, as uh, we like to see uh, George tighten this match a little bit because he deserves it. He's been playing some really good games. Yep. Well, right now it, uh, it is not meant to be currently with the score extending itself to an eight game advantage. For Sergey Karyakin, I I don't believe it's going to finish at eight games. I think that Meyer will will get a few victories here and maybe finish with a plus score and bullet. I'll be surprised, uh, but it, you know, he had a, he had a chance right there, right? Had a chance right there and didn't get it. So um, you got to take your opportunities when you have it. The best players in the world don't give many. Um, all right, so what's going that, on here? That, that game looks so drawish. I guess it just goes to show you, man. Uh, King at Tiffany in the end game. It, yep. It, it's so difficult to defend against, especially in blitz. I find that when you get that active king in blitz, it's really hard to find how to neutralize it. Yep. And if you're just joining us, only 24 minutes remaining in the match. As you can see right there, we have Grandmaster Sergey Karyakin and Grandmaster Georg Meyer going at it, the 2017 Speed Chess Championship. And uh, we have had quite the fun day today. Lots of instructive, exciting chess. Currently a bit of a runaway victory right now for Karyakin, unless Meyer can change things. But uh, thank you for being here and being involved, whether you're watching it from Twitch or chess.com TV. Another Thanks good position. Here. Another good position for Meyer, though. Doesn't he just have the advantage yeah, here? He's just got a big advantage. I mean, he's got these uh, these doubled rooks on the e-file, and that's an e-pawn, right? Um but how does he how does he use it? It's hard to analyze in in, in bullet and, and analyze the moves before the players play. So we just have to kind of do our best to guess and visualize it along with him. Uh, yeah. Does he does he find a way into the C five square? Maybe B four and oh, he was just threading ninety five, right? Because the rook had pinned the bishop. And I think here he needs to somehow get his knight on D three into the game because I mean I would even I wouldn't even mind getting it to A five or something. And or or this move h4 with the idea that if takes an f4 an h4 we have knight f4 check. And that's what he does. That is a very nice idea. He's going to win the e6 pawn. Sergey a little nervous there. Scoots in. Georg has got to convert. Got to convert on this game right here with only a few seconds for for Karyakin. Georg is really up against it. Can he not just? I was going to say. Can, oh, but bishop takes d4. Did he miss that shot? Ooh. Or he has he has just rookie two. Oh, he, now he misses that. No, he has bishop c7, so he's still winning material at the end of the line. Meyer is still in control of this one and uh, likely going to go on to win now up a piece and only one second for Karyakin. Very nice little combination there by Jorg. Yeah, especially in bullet chess. Like, wow. Yep. Look at that. Karyakin moved with 0.1 on the clock, 0.1 again. Ooh. Oh, look at that. Meyer tries to flag. No, he doesn't try to flag him. I thought it was a mouse slip to flag him. I was like, that's that's classy, but not so classy. <laughs> the, I mean, uh, frankly, it probably wasn't the best because, you know, we either way we're winning, though, so it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, no, I, it's what I that's what I thought. That's why I was kind of shocked. I was like, why would he go for that? And I was saying sarcastically that it was classy. But um, but OK, he should go on to win, as you said, just based on chess moves. Although these these seconds keep ticking down for Meyer, it, it seems like kind of a repeat of last game where all of a sudden he has less time. I don't know what's going on. Why what is, is he, he doing so slow? Sir, uh, with, his, with his mouse, Daniel. Meyer is Meyer is not playing fast enough. It's just not his day to day. Um, I think Sergey feels like he's getting a little bit of a gift there. He's I mean that, that just that just made no sense. I mean Meyer is up a piece. That game is over. Poor Meyer. I think he's very frustrated because there's something he's he's got a little bit of lag. He's playing a bit too slowly somehow, and mm -hmm. uh, he's very disappointing because he should have won both both bullet games, right? And yeah, so I mean, right now we're looking at a nine point lead that you know it it uh, it could be a five point lead, right? I mean, it started at seven, and if he wins those games, so it's a five game deficit rather than nine, and it's a four point swing really in terms of the match standings. This is very sad. You know, this is the last time you want your mouse to foul you. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. earlier in the match, it wouldn't even matter. And now his mouse is fouling him in the absolutely critical moments. Yep. 
Got to speed up, though, right? I mean, I think he, I think he was overthinking it a little bit, and uh, you know, time on the time on the clock there, unfortunately. And he, he's, you know, he's up on time again. Look at look at the time. So he's consistently been faster. He answered that question for us: who was going to be quicker in bullet? He's got more time than he started with. He's pulling a Nakamura right now. He's uh, got more time than he started the game with. Not anymore. But I'm not sure. I think there's actually, to me, it actually feels like there there was like some kind of like like Sergey was able to flag him at the end that uh, he just like got blitzed out and he was trying to move quickly, but that he somehow physically wasn't able to make the moves in time. Yeah, so, I don't know. I don't know. I'm I agree. I'm surprised. Um, so. So he has to collect himself now. He doesn't want to get positionally crunched with like a queen b5 type move. So he's playing the move knight c4. But where is that knight going after b3? Just back to d6? And then e4, I suppose. Yeah, looks like it. But this knight d2 prevents that for the moment, although the other knight can come. But the difference there is, well, I'm wondering if we are going to play for queen b5 at the right moment. Yeah, I think I think we will, or or even just put the knight on b5. Obviously, if something like knight e4 happened and they traded, I mean, he could he could play knight b5 to kind of guard the guard the square. But okay, uh, Karyakin is going to have to deal with the threat of Meyer doubling on the c file now. And and one interesting thing is he actually can't over he can't he can't bring more protection to the c1 square. That's a very nice move by Georg. This rook c5 move it's going to guarantee control over the c file. And again, I like Yorick's chess. I mean, again, he's in a position where I just I can't I can't say that he hasn't been the better player in bullet. For sure. Yeah, he's got good positions in every game with extra time. Yeah. And then somehow both games he he got flagged in like the last moments. Okay. Well, now he's gonna have to. Uh... Have to win it, win it again. It no longer seems to have a big advantage in this one. I think Karyakin has defended well, but but still better if anybody is. Um, is he going to try to bring the pieces over to the king side for some sort of mating net? No, he's going to trade and, and try to infiltrate to the second rank. A drawn rook ending we have on the horizon here. <laughs> but in bullet chess, um, anything can happen. Whoa, whoa! It was e two just winning? No. Both sides had just pre-moved that scenario. Did you see oh, that? Oh yeah! Wow. That, both that, sides that had. Was, I couldn't figure out what it was. Both sides had pre-moved and, and were anticipating different things, and then that seriously backfired for Georg because that he had an opportunity there with the pre-move, and it's unfortunate. Georg is a super awesome person and super classy guy. He's uh, he's he's carrying himself well. A little frustrated, uh, but um, but I can tell he's he's going to continue to fight for every game. Someone shouting in the chat, Karyakin now at 31-33 and bullet. Uh, that's wow. pretty good. That's oh pretty gosh. good. Wow, you just got to make all those numbers threes. Yeah, this is a bit of a statement victory right now. He's up 10 games, and we all know this has been a much closer match. Georg has really missed some opportunities. I think we could easily be looking at a five, four or five game match right now, not a 10 game match. But but it is what it is, and, uh, and we have... 15, uh, more than a little more than 15 minutes left before the players will join us. So don't go anywhere. We're going to get the players' thoughts after this match, regardless of what happens for these final 15 minutes or so. That's right. And we're going to find out the story with those uh, two bullet games in a row, which uh, seemed like they were totally in the back for Meyer, and something very strange happening in the end. Did he forget about the time? Did um, right. his mouse fail him? We'll, we'll find out. But now, does Kardashian have an attack, or is the king just tucking itself into A1? It seems like the white is um, able to tuck his king in so that a3 mm -hmm. check is, is actually no big deal. You just have to worry about knight b3, I think, in some positions, and maybe try to force open the a file. Right. Yeah, in fact, now, here it comes. For yeah. now, it's well covered, isn't it? Because we have knight b3, oh, pawn b3, queen b3, I thought we would have. But I, I thought think maybe, that... maybe he just didn't want to open the a file because maybe black just develops the bishop d6 and kind of didn't want the practical pressure. Right, or there's also a bishop f5 um, coming up in the position, which can, is really annoying because bishop Yeah, d3, that's actually... Uh, what does he do on bishop f5? Knight f6. Oh. Isn't there... I thought there was queen f6 here. Queen f6, and I guess it's just kind of a big fancy way to trade in the end. But uh, but a time advantage, again, exists for Georg, and, you know, if he can convert on that, he'd be happy. 
No, but he um, did not trade the queens. Instead, he played GF6, allowing wow. queen F5. But he's he's getting through as well. So both kings now in danger. Yeah. I guess the draw seems like a poetically justified result here, uh, given that it was a really weird back and forth game. That one. Uh, only wow. a few players still braving the guess the move challenge in bullet. It's kind of hard to keep up. Wow. Yeah. That, I, I for some reason I thought that was going to be good for Black Bear in the end, but uh, yeah. clearly Karyakov had it all calculated out, so he went for the perpet. And here we've got a, a great opening for bullet chess, the King's Indian attack. <laughs> you know, you love openings in bullet, you love kind of systems where you can just like play a bunch of moves in a row yep. and not have to think too much about the positional nuances. Yep. Well, interesting one here. Meyer, again, up a little bit on time, not too big. and But here comes an extension and probably D4 at some point. For white, if he can organize playing d4 and maybe maybe get the knight into c5, it's almost like a reverse uh, Alekhine's here, right? Al Yehin's defense. Okay, I thought we might see d4 there for white, but no. I guess he did really, did really didn't want to give away the e4 square in hindsight for the knight and bishop there. So this kid, this is pawn sacrifice. Bishop f6, queen f6, bishop d5, but the dark squares would be totally owned by Meyer, so. Practical decision there by Sergey. He wants nothing to do with that pawn. Yep. Instead, he's going to try to win the pawn in a more comfortable way by playing g5 and taking it off on d5 with a rook. Um, so h6 was played to prevent that. He plays c4, which gives away that d4 square for the knight. I was a little surprised by that. I like this knight on d4, but maybe it's hard to keep it there. He defends with the queen. Maybe at some point there's a plan to bring it into f5. If Meyer can get play on the c file, uh, that might uh, that might make these rooks feel a little out of place. f4, aggressive chess. f4 and g5. Karyakin is uh, he's doing what he didn't do all match, going all in on an attack like that. Oh, wow. Knight f5 for any 97 check. Look at that. If we get 97 check and then some sort of, uh, what is that, an Arabian mate or an Anastasius mate over there on the... Right, Anastasius, yes. So uh, how do we get our queen any, over there? I think he's going to try it. He's going to play queen f3 now and think about it. Queen uh, f3, pro white's probably going to be forced to, to, to sacrifice um, the exchange. Okay, he has other ideas, being very patient in the approach. But look for look for this knight, everybody, is guarding these squares, which makes this king trapped. So we have a potentially uh, beautiful finish here if Karyakin finds some sort of way to, to make that mating net happen. Only 12 seconds to do it, though. So after bishop takes e4 here, um, mm -hmm. you can't play, if you play bishop e4, I can play rook e4. He just transitions. I guess he's just going to gobble the bishop, and suddenly the pony is pinned. The pony is pinned. Uh oh, that is a that is a shake your head worthy situation there, which is what Meyer is doing. And now it's just over. He's going to lose the knight, and really doesn't have a mating net to show for it. Um, and in fact, if anything, he's going to get mated over here on the light squares. Yikes, yeah, so, uh, Sergey won again. So despite despite that like ominous beginning for Karyakin and the bullet, it looks like he's won four in a row. Yeah, I mean honestly we were uh feeling the comeback and Meyer was in control of a couple of games, and I think now probably psychologically maybe he feels a little bit on tilt and kind of fell apart right when he hasn't converted there and um you know, so maybe maybe right now he just feels a little frustrated and down on himself. It's hard to Hard to say in those situations, right? Wow. Sergey Karyakin is very good. I mean, some of these ideas that he's coming up in bullet chess, uh, really impressive. Of course, like the worst game by Karyakin so far in the bullet portion, I think was the first one. That was the one where we were like, what is going on? He has absolutely nothing. And then he just like gave away um, the initiative in the uh, equal end game. But uh, mm -hmm. last game was pretty impressive. Last two games. Yeah. Agreed. Impressive play all around today from from the reigning World Blitz champion, the number two seed in our uh, in our speech chess championship. So as we take a look at the bracket, 
Uh, we can pretty much call it right now the final score unknown, but we are going to see Sergei Karyakin right here, the two seed in the lower right corner. Moving on in the bracket, he will face the winner of Ian Napomniashi versus Levon Aronian. Uh, that'll be a fun one. So Aronian versus Nepo, the winner there will take on Sergei Karyakin in the second round. So um, that's going to be a ton of fun. I can't wait to hear what these players have to say. Obviously, we will check in, of course, Jan with Meyer on his preparation. We'll check in with him on what happened with those kind of last-minute bullet games there. And we'll check in with him on how he felt about, you know, did, did it start to creep up on him psychologically that he wasn't able to convert on some, some games where he knew he was winning, if that kind of was in the back of his mind. All right, so now do we have a little tricky tactic here? Is bishop d4 on the menu? I guess you can always play... Okay, he, he, he removed all those tactics by sliding his bishop back to b3. Um, and now Sergei played king h8. Oh, bishop d4 did happen. Knight d4 comes in because he's going to get the f3 pawn to go with it. And yeah, that's he's kinda... got to get rid of that knight. And so now we've got an unusual uh, material imbalance where you got the two pieces for the rook. Now, in the middle game, a lot of the time, that actually favors the two pieces. But in addition to the pieces, I mean, in addition to the rook, uh, black has two pawns. Yeah, for me, I, I still I still love the minors in scenarios like this, especially when you have one established on such a dominant square on E5. Um, because that G7 pawn is going to be very difficult to defend. You know, we're going to play right. knight f4 and knight e6 or knight h5. And I, I thought I thought white might even play knight f4 last move, but Meyer being very patient, I guess it's because he sees rook c2 as a chance where he'll have knight e3. A little bit of a trick there, so kind of being patient, inviting the rook to come to c2 if he wants to do it. Um, now brings the knight to e3, which is a fork on the two pawns. Can he can he go for it? Can he gobble the d5 pawn? I think he was worried about maybe rook d8 followed by rook e4. So, but honestly, this is the right approach anyway with the miners, right? He's just getting everybody coordinated, protected, active before he before he gobbles up any of these pawns, and that kind of keeps the rooks at bay. So, again, we like Meyer here. I I, I think he'll win this one, um, and uh, we'll see if he can if he can do that. But it's really hard to predict. We've seen these games before where. Uh, He's had even more of a time advantage and positional advantage, and he wasn't wasn't able to win because of a random time scramble. So, right. uh, rook to g4. It looks like b5 is going to hang, and uh, that's going to be a problem. This rook actually can't defend on uh, b5. Here comes knight d4 check, and and then the knight's going to relocate itself, I think, to go after the the a pawn here soon. Whoa. Karyakin aggressively creating interesting chances, which is what he needs to do. And look at Meyer's time. Look at Meyer's time. No! Oh, my gosh. OMG. Meyer is just not playing fast enough today. Um, and I think he, um, I think he's, you know, in, in some ways it's hard when you, when you just, you're playing a better player. You think psychologically sometimes you're focused on, on uh, playing the best chess you can be instead of the fastest chess you can play. And in that case, he was really trying to find the accurate move, Jen, but he needed to just make a move. Brutal, indeed. And, you know, I of course we expected Karyakin to play wonderful chess, but I didn't expect him to be so good at flagging his opponent. Well, you know, he got aggressive there, which from a practical perspective was brilliant, right? He brought the king up the board and paraded, created just enough to think about to make Meyer flag and um, and Meyer, but Meyer had three seconds to start that last move and and just kind of got lost in lost in translation, right? He got lost in the calculations and uh, and, and and ran out of time. Seven and a half minutes until we move into the chess nine sixty portion, everybody. So uh, we will have one chess nine sixty game before the players join us via interviews, and that'll be a fun thing to catch up with them. So we'll see how these final couple games go. Disappointing for Meyer to see it end this way because we know he's better than that. <clears throat> oh yeah, he's he's played some really exciting chess though. It's it's been for fun sure. to watch. You know, I'm definitely more, um, even more obviously in the pro chess league. Meyer is also an MVP, only behind Wesley So and his result in the pro chess league, the inaugural one. Um, but after this game, I'm even kind of more of a fan because his uh, style is really instructive. You know, watching yeah. his games, you can see you're going to learn a lot. Yep. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> well, uh, not up on time in this one for the first time in a while, but not down really either. Everything's about equal.
not exactly even sure what black's playing. I, I guess I kind of like white here, um, but but black also has this nice extended pawn on h3, which makes the h2 pawn a bit of a of a target if if possible. But also means the h3 pawn's weak. Is he going to play? Maybe Karyakin has a plan of rook g3 and queen f1 and try to gobble up the pawn here. Karyakin's thinking. He's been that much faster or just hasn't flagged in the time scrambles. Kar uh, Meyer's been quicker in bullet, right, Jen? I mean, he's been up on time, but then in the time scramble, he's gotten flagged, surprisingly. Yeah, it's like he's physically having tr troubles with his mouse almost. That is what it feels like. Yeah. Um, but uh, advantage here, it looks like, for uh, Sergey with some weaknesses in Meyer's camp. The C6 pawn, the H3 pawn. Um, he's not going to be able to hold on to everything. Yeah. And I think that, okay, this move, queen e5, trying to centralize the queen, pressuring the e4 pawn. But, you know, in these kind of initiative-type situations, usually the player who starts gobbling first um, has the edge because there's a c7 check intermezzo. Now after queen e4, rook e4, rook takes h3 or rook d3. Yeah, I thought maybe rook d3, but rook takes h3 we also rook, threatens rook h8. Rook he H8 didn't see it. Oh, he had a rook h8. They both missed it. Yeah. That was we trying show. out to be played. We got to show that one to the fans because that would have been really, really fun, everybody. In this position here, Karyakin misses a, a brilliant win with the move Rook. With the move Rook to H8, as I'm trying to play, and the point is that if the Rook takes, then White would Queen. Uh, having a little bit of trouble there, keeping with the extra time, but a lot of people back to playing guess the move after I said that, and Karyakin Karyakin goes on to win anyway, right? Didn't he? No, no, it was actually a draw. I think the, oh. I, I think in the Rook end game, both players realized it was kind of silliness to just see who flagged, so they decided right. to offer a draw. Yeah, yeah, and that's nice. Um, but Karyakin, not that it matters so much for his score, but that's one of the first missed wins we've seen for Sergey, right, Jen? Yeah, that was a really nice move. Great tactic. You know, those tactics around pawn promotion are sometimes overlooked because we spend a lot of time looking at tactics around checkmating the king or right. winning material, but... The tactics based on queening your pawns are very essential to good end game play and good blitz play. Yep. Well, Karyakin uh, lost a whole lot of rating points with that draw. <laughs> He's down to 3106 instead of being, where was he, near 3150. So uh, obviously uh, just kind of joking, but uh, a very, very impressive performance in this entire match by Sergei Karyakin, and he's probably going to end the match above 3,000 at least in bullet. So there's only, uh, there's only a few in that territory. Interesting. Going for the C file. Three minutes left in the match possible this is our last bullet game because some of these bullet games get really weird in the time scrambles where they just go forever but if I had to guess we probably have one more game after this before the chess 960 <clears throat> ooh tactic nice tacticos bishop takes d5 over overloading the knight on c8 everybody but uh, but really I guess it just amounts to a couple of pieces for the rook but so many pawns for white. I thought, oh, I thought maybe we could pick up another one with rook c6. But yeah, I thought, um, he could have defend. He could just defend g6 with the king. But then, but then maybe there was bishop b4. You might have been right there. That was interesting. I, I guess maybe not. Maybe there was knight d5 in some positions. Who knows? Well, I, I like that idea as well. Bayer decides to go for the second rank or seventh rank, excuse me, which makes a ton of sense, and that is where rooks are most happy. G5. G5 now, yeah. And G5 was a strong move. Here comes E4. Got to play E4, right? Uh, I thought E4 might have been the more effective way to dislodge that knight, but but he didn't go for it. I guess he'll swing back to A7? No. A little surprised by Meyer's last couple moves there. I think E4 was stronger and surprised he traded Brooks. Still better for White, though, here. And Karyakin's still down on time. Two pass pawns are better than one. It's like a good Twix commercial. <laughs> yeah, those uh, those pass pawns are going to be uh, mighty difficult. As I said, those tactics. Wait, pass pawns. Wait. Ooh, 
that while was you're a missing. Little old save. Oh no. Oh no. Frustrating there for Meyer to not have converted on this. This is just this one here. The wheels are kind of coming off officially, and um, this might actually even be close to our last game here. One more, right? It looks like this is actually the last game, according, because I actually started the game clock slightly late. Ah, gotcha. Okay. So this will actually be the last game, and it looks like it is. Chess 960. Oh, they rematched. They rematched too quickly. They did not see Pete's message. So, so we get one more bullet game from these guys. Uh, sometimes that happens in these matches where players are just so locked in. Um, oh, of course, they're laser focused. You know, this yep. this that's the thing about bullet and and blitz, like. Your brain is just completely wired to the position. No time for rest. Yeah. Well, we will let them play this last one here anyway, but it is officially over. Sergey Karyakin has won this match. He will be moving on. Uh, we will have Chess 960 either way for kicks and giggles, and it's always fun right after this before the players join us. And, uh, and so that should be fun. So let's, let's enjoy this last game here. Karyakin now with the white pieces and in the 20 wins territory. That's rare territory. That means you really, really won your match, Jen. The 20 wins territory if he gets 20, if he gets 20 points. Well, here this tactic, this, this uh, attack looks like it's pretty, pretty scary. I mean, we've seen a lot of similar tactics and attacks in this match with French defenses, but uh, this looks like a nice one because mm. um, we've got all of our pieces working. This move, knight g4, um, stopping the bishop on f6 from... Uh, participating actually had to, he decided he had to give up an exchange with a knight yep. g8. No, yeah, going to be a, a pretty straightforward conversion here then. Um, and uh, well, now he's up the exchange. The uh, chess knight 60 will happen next. Um, Meyer will actually be black in that chess knight 60 game, even though he has black here. Meyer should actually be black. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the position. Yeah, it, that's always that's one. It's a little bit like Christmas morning. You know, you never know what you're gonna get. <laughs> always fun. Ooh, work c5, nice positional move. I keep looking at bishop takes h7 check and then flip to the h file and do something really fun. Not quite. But he's got A4, taking advantage of that pin. Almost as fun as what you wanted to do. Almost as fun, that's right. <laughs> I, I like positional wins, too, you know. Um, he knows, this is, this is uh, just torture. He knows he's got the pawn, and he's just, like, spending extra moves. Because, by the way, you can play C4 also. Yeah, yeah. So even though we didn't take it, we're going to get it again. I mean, he goes for the, the other pawn on C6, which may be even better. I think one threat is he has to worry about knight c7, knight to a6, maybe? Maybe not. I thought maybe black might try that, but it doesn't work anyway. Yep. Only seven seconds, so Karyakin has been down on time, but he's proven he can scramble. Yeah, that's true. I bet he's happy that he bought that mouse. We'll ask him about that. Pass pawns must be pushed, or so I'm told. Will Sergey do it with just four seconds on the clock and make a statement? You know, with a, I was, I was kind of wondering with Meyer choosing to play Karyakin, if Karyakin would like try to make a statement and like just win as much as, by as many points as possible. Of course. Uh, uh, he's uh, really doing it here. We saw this idea in another game, rook c1 to g1, switch back, try to get a checkmate in. Mm -hmm. And now d5, nice move if takes, there was rook takes d7. But well, Meyer wins a bullet game. That was good, right? Winning is good, yeah. Especially against Sergei Karyakin. And, you know, it's always a... Definitely a morale boost. But let's take a look at this 960 position. 
Yeah, absolutely. We've got a uh, an interesting one I'm again. Back on H1. <laughs> the anti, the anti, what we saw last time, Jen, with the bishops completely separated rather than right next to each other, right? And now in, these, in this position, it's kind of like it feels like all of our pieces are bad. So it's like a struggle to start improving some of our pieces, particularly the the knights on H1 and H8. Mm -hmm. But Bishop takes F3, Queen F3, giving um, Sergey the two bishops. I I gotta like the two bishops in this 960 position, but at the same time, knights in one minute chess. Knights in one minute chess. Well, I think White should play D5 to try to keep the position open. Um, or go for Knight F2 in, in E4. My my only thought was if he does, Black might play D5. Yeah, and now now that's all kind of stopped, and I'm yeah. worried that. Although my prediction that Skaryakin would finish above 3,000 was wrong with that loss. He drops back below 3,000. And he's in so. huge time pressure in this game, by the way. I think he's kind of getting fixated on the the brilliant um, 960 position, how intriguing it is. But yeah. in the end, it's a bullet game. So you got to move. It starts to get closer and closer to looking like a real chess game. Um, I mean, still far from it here, but uh, not quite as crazy as the start. We like black here, so as as we saw white win the first one, then Karyakin won the last chess 960 game with black, and and I kind of like Meyer's position here. I love that knight on e4. Ooh, a nice castling move. That must feel good. Yeah. And Georg says, anything you can do, I can do better. <laughs> he castles as well. Sergey playing for G4 at the right moment, but he could that could get really punishing with the knight coming to F2 and such. Yep. Got to be careful of those little tactics there. Only eight seconds Ooh. for Karyakin, and the H4 plan is coming. Harry to the rescue. Maybe you'll... So after H4, he's going to try to play G4. Yeah, yeah. Trying to react. H4 will be met with G4 and keep things as close as possible. I knew finally we had to get rid of that. Queen A2, Bishop A3 trying to trade off the other bishop. Very resourceful there by Karyak, and I like that. And Black is still kind of up against it. He'd like to play G4, but then there's H4. He'd like to play H4, but then there's G4. So Black's kind of big pawn storm here sort of ran out of steam, and, and now Karyakin is the one opening up the board. And this doesn't look like a chess 960 position at all, actually. Yeah, well, the more trades there are, the more it starts to look like real chess, right? Yeah. And now Meyer might actually get this one. Here comes queen takes g3. I think he might strike. And, Ooh, and this uh, last queen takes a five. Ah, queen takes a five. I thought, yeah. But still, still, I guess black is the one who could potentially win this endgame. But we've seen Georg not quite play fast enough in these scenarios so far. We'll see if he can change his fortunes and not lose on time in this one. Right, we've seen these two seconds to two seconds that yeah. Myers is literally the living off the clock, literally living off the increment here. Unclear what's going to happen. Okay, as soon as you get one free move, you're usually in good shape. So that helped your big time be able to make that safe free move. And uh, and look at that black king. Yeah, well, he's now in a position where he's definitely up on time with five seconds and up on board possibly a good finish and indeed it was there for Mr. Meyer who takes the chess 960 game and uh, with it makes that match a little closer he wins two out of three of the chess 960 games and actually won his black so I guess my theory was all wrong Jen you don't always win in chess 960 yeah as that's white. Right. very nice performance by uh, Sergei Karyakin um, but uh, Meyer uh, with a little bit of morale boost uh, by winning actually the last two games of the match that's right well, are you? Uh, you're both here with us, Sergey and Georg. Can you can you both hear us? Yes, yes. Well, first of all, congratulations to you both. This is this was a really really exciting, a, a surprisingly instructive match. I meant not surprisingly, but you both just played 
a super high, high quality, high level of chess. And um, I know right now, Georg, you're probably feeling like, what is he talking about? Um, but uh, but the truth is, besides some of those blunders, which we know happened in the time scrambles, Jen and I were just super impressed with both of you. So before before any of the harder questions, I just wanted to thank you both for doing this and say that we really, really appreciated watching you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jen, do you want to start first and ask Jorg some of your questions about what happened in those bullet time scrambles? Yes, you seemed like you were really on top in both of those games, both in the clock and in the position, and you were very frustrated towards the end of the game. What was the story there? Well, I, I think in most of the 3-2 and also the bullet, or actually the whole match, I didn't manage to handle my clock at all. Like, I, I never had a feeling for, for the seconds ticking away. And also, Sergei simply played much better when we both had no time left. He used his chances and I gave him plenty. Because there were a lot of winning positions that I, that I simply did not convert because he was defending well and some of them, uh, some of them I lost. And, sorry, uh, go, uh, sorry, go ahead, Jen. And what was it like to play 960 with so little time on the clock? I mean, it, it almost must have been frustrating, like you're trying to get a sense of what the position is. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, although with one minute there is really there is really no time to think at all. Like the, the moves are completely instinctive, so I think bullet is really tough. Chess nine sixty. Sergey, how did you feel about um, about the, the 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 tempo of the match in regards to some of the uh, the, the same kind of question we asked Georg? Uh, Georg got under time pressure and seemed to be just playing down on the clock from the start. Was that was that one of your goals to play fast and just you know make sure you didn't you didn't use a lot of time because you were consistently up on the clock, especially in the first two portions? No, I, actually, I can say that uh, that that, is, that it wasn't my strategy. I mean, I was just trying to play well, but uh, but also I tried to play uh, to play it fast, but uh, but I didn't pay much attention to this. I mean, somehow it happened that I always had uh, more time, but uh, but uh, but again, it wasn't my strategy. I was just playing chess. And uh, and I think I, I was I, I was very fine when, when we played five minutes uh, match, and and then when we had three minutes, it was probably the most difficult uh, for me because somehow somehow George start, uh, started uh, to play uh, uh, really well at some point. I think. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I was lucky in, in some games, and uh, and then when we played one minute, uh, basically, basically I was I, I was fine. I, I mean, yeah. no, I mean, of course I was lucky somewhere, and, but uh, but basically it, it was all all going well for me. George, George, what happened in in those first two bullet games? Was there issues with your mouse, or you just didn't manage your time well, and and just didn't realize you were losing on time? Like I said, uh, I I simply didn't sense the, the one second increment well. So at some point I simply lost on time because uh, I wasn't playing at the right pace. And I agree with Sergei that the, the 3 plus 2, that was the section where I had my chances and where I eventually lost the match. Because in the 5 plus 2 he was dominating, but in the 3 minute part uh, I managed to create my chances, but I didn't use them. Sergey, what was your favorite game of all of your victories? Because we really liked a lot of them. Uh, well, it's now a bit hard to <laughs> to remember because too many things happened, and we played twenty seven games. Yes, and... <laughs> a lot of games. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there were there were some really great ones, uh, uh, George. What happened with um? You know, we talked about heading into this match. Obviously, uh, you chose to play Sergey, which we know you know you had thought that this would go a little differently. But what were your thoughts in terms of preparation? Right, you 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 said you you were putting some time into the kind of positions you wanted to reach against Sergey. Were you did that just not happen, or you feel like you were doing okay on the board? But again, it just all came down to kind of poor time management. Um. I think only once did I get something I really prepared. Um, it was the white right. game, I think, uh, the third game in the match where I took on c6 and Sergei had this uh, double c pawns, where I got a good position, but I played much too slowly, and in the end, there was no way for me to control the position. Okay. 
So the third game of the match was was preparation there. Um, okay, uh, Sergey, did you do any preparation for the match? I mean, I know you and you and uh, Georg, according to databases, have only actually played three games total in your career uh, before this match here. So did you have any kind of idea of what you were getting into, or did you spend any time on any X's and O's? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, I had some ideas to this match, but somehow in uh, almost in every game, my opponent was much better prepared. So I was basically moving from one from one uh, opening to to another, and uh, and, uh, and 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 clearly the the o o opening part of the game was on my opponent's favor. But 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 later on, uh, I had my chances, which I used. George, if you get into another uh, speech as championships like this, um, what would you do differently in terms of preparation? I don't know what to do differently because uh, over the years I've played some of the best players in the world online and part of their strength is that they make good moves faster. <laughs> and it's just, I mean, on a good day, maybe uh, I would... Uh, um, if uh, Sergei a much closer match, but clearly it is it's very difficult against an opponent of this level. But I think, and some games are obviously showed that that I'm able to to create chances. How do you assess his chances of winning the whole thing? Um, there are two players which are much stronger in bullet than, than I think both of us, and it will be very hard to overcome Hikaru and Magnus. What do you think of that assessment? Sergey? Uh, me? Uh, so, sorry, it, it was a question. It was question yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was a question for you. We were wondering uh, I, what you thought of George's thoughts about the bullet. Well, I, I just want to, to go step by step, and uh, probably if I would uh, face Hikaru or Magnus, I, I would prepare some bullet games more seriously because I didn't prepare bu bullets. To this match, but but basically I, I'm looking forward to to, to my next match, uh, uh, and and again yes I would go step by step. You're going to take on the winner between Ian Napomniachtchi and Levon Aronian, uh, and the, both those players obviously you have a lot of experience against. Uh, I don't know how many online games, but certainly over the board. So when you look at those two players, do you have your you have your pick of who you might rather play? Either either Nepo, your your countryman, or uh, or maybe Levon Aroni. And who do you feel you match up with better? Well, I hope that uh, that my friend Nepomniachtchi would win because uh, he, because we are playing for one team and we we have good relationships. But basically, it it, it will be. Uh, Clearly, very interesting match, and uh, it's very hard to say who, who is who is the favorite. But but I think that uh, actually Jan Jan is uh, is a little bit favorite, but uh, not so. Uh, not right. So. Well, last question before we let you guys go: uh, Are you guys going to tune in tomorrow for the match between Wesley So and Anish Giri? Uh, we haven't seen these two players go at it in a match like this, certainly in online chess. But uh, give me give me a pick. Who do you think wins between Wesley and Anish Giri tomorrow? Well, I think that uh, uh, w w Wesley is a clear favorite, but um, but I might be wrong, and Anish can show his fantastic bliss skills. I mean, uh, but. <laughs> Um, but at the moment, I think that uh, Wesley is a clear favorite, but I don't know. What about you, George? I think so, too. I agree. Okay. Interesting. Well, uh, we greatly appreciate this. I did pull up the one game you mentioned where you got preparation to remind the fans of the uh, Bishop takes C6 move on, on, uh, on move 10, and you did get a better position there. Um, just, uh, I don't know, just wanted to show a little bit more chess before we let you go. Um, Jen, any final questions for our two awesome classy champions here and uh obviously we wish sergey the best of luck in the next round and george you were you were quite impressive to watch in april as well during the qualifier um so thank you again for doing this and uh that's really that's really it we appreciate everybody's time yeah it was a real pleasure to watch you guys play um so much strategy that we learned and that's not something you often see in blitz and bullet so thank you guys thank you it was a pleasure thanks
Well, thank you both again. We're going to go ahead and bring the show to a close and uh, remind all the fans to please tune in tomorrow. Anish Geary versus Wesley So. You heard it here. I think I think a lot of people see Wesley So as the favorite. We'll see what happens in this blitz and rapid format online and uh, whether Anish can, as Sergey says, impress us with his incredible secret blitz skills. So uh, thank you both once again, and we will uh, look forward to seeing you another time. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Goodbye.